Uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome. There's still some people coming in, but we'll make a start because we do have presentations to do. Um, so we want to try and keep it as scheduled as we can. So a big welcome to all of you. Thank you for your service and your star rating. I mean, all of you are here because you're a very high star rating, 4.95 five stars. So well done. Give yourselves a pat on the back because it's really good. Um, today's session is all going to be about, or today's seminar is all going to be about growing your business, getting some tips from and uh, ideas from people who have already done it. So they are continually to grow their own business. And we've also got someone from overseas, Mike, who's got to do a couple of sessions today, who's got a very successful business as well. So hopefully you get something out of it. Um, we sh I'm sure you will. Straight away, I'll get Jim to open it up uh, now and have a chat to the group, and then we'll move on through the agenda. There's gonna be a small change to the agenda due to a presenter uh, getting unwell with COVID. So we have to quickly flip that up at the last minute. Um, but hopefully today will be great. We'll do a Q&A. Uh, throughout the day as well and get some feedback. Um, so enjoy today, hope you get something out of it and I'll straight on to Jim. Okay, now I've got a... Oh, yeah. that's, for, that's for that. Yeah. That's, not, that's for that, not for this. You need that as well. What's that? You need that as well. This is for the recording. I need this as well, do I? <laughs> really? This isn't good enough? No, that's for the recording. That's for the ears. So if you can speak loud enough, you don't need Alright. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Oh, I think I've got a pretty loud voice. I don't need that. <laughs> Okay, this is the, the course I would have loved to attend 40 years ago when I started off mowing lawns full-time in 1982, just about December, just before Christmas. I had a part-time business that I decided to go full-time because I was, my academic career was obviously not going to go anywhere. So I started off. And I, and I obviously, like, just about, but like everybody else, I started off by myself. And I, I gave pretty great service, I've got to say. My service was great. I was pretty good at mowing lawns and doing a great job and turning up on time. And then I got to the stage of wanting to employ people. And it got to be very, very different. I had subbies on board. And I have to say, I was pathetic at it. I really, really was bad. I was doing things like building up and then eventually I wanted to put workers on so I could build a business where I, you know, major business. Wasn't that difficult to find clients in those days? And I wanted to build this business and employ people. But the trouble I had was that the workers that I had were not giving great service. They were not turning up. They were not doing a good job. I didn't have any systems of control at all. And I can remember vividly, we used to get a, a, a listing of the, of the messages that came through. It was all very manual in those days through, through the, the, the phones. And for every new lead I get, I get at least one complaint that was about equal in number. Not turning up, not doing a good job. It was absolutely terrible. And to be quite frank, one of the reasons that I wanted to franchise, because I thought, I want to grow this business, and I'm not getting anywhere doing this because my service just isn't good enough, and I couldn't even figure out how to do it. So you can see how useful this would have been. See, what we've found in recent years especially is that we've got some people who are actually building, who are doing really successfully what I could not do back in the early 80s. They're actually, the astonishing thing about people like Dan and Jared, unfortunately, as um, Rocky said, Jared's not gonna be here, but, but others as well, is that they managed to actually build a major business, enough to get them off the road completely into management and also get 5.0 ratings which is infinitely better than anything that I achieved back in those days. And it's just fascinating to talk to them how they're doing it and what they're, and this is where it came from. I had conversations with these guys and said, what are you doing? How are you doing things so much better than me? And I know a lot of franchisees through Jim's group want to employ people. You know, we've got so much unserviced work these days. It's so far this year, 38% of our jobs are unserviced particularly individuals like dog wash and mowing and fencing. There are so much unserviced leads. People are desperate to take them on. We've got the work. We want you to do it. It's embarrassing to us to knock back all these clients. You want to grow your business. The problem I always get is how do you find good people? How do you supervise them? This is the question that gets asked again and again. So this is a really exciting day to learn from people. And not just the people who are talking I know there's people around here who actually successfully employ people, like Mark Ether at the back there, who emails me every second day about some issue or other. So I, I, know, if you, I know some of you very well. I know you, you, you email me, but I don't actually see you. So it's good to see you here. Look, 
So we want to teach these systems. We want to get the successful people who've done this, who built these major businesses. We want to show you how you can do that too. And we're actually developing some new systems ourselves. One of the most exciting things that happened in recent time is the RTO, the Registered Training Organization. I don't know if you know it, but we are, Jim's group is a registered training organization, which we, means we're running government approved courses. So you can get yourself a Cert 2, Cert 3, Cert 4. And one of the plans we have for this, and one of the attractions to draw people in, is say, come to us. You can come to us and we're going to teach you fence building, dog grooming, horticulture. Um, basic idea is they do something like a Cert 2, which is equivalent to what our franchisees need. So they come in, they pay for the course. We look at them, we try them on the road, we screen them, we see how good they are as workers. Now you come to the end of the course, you've got three options. First of all, you could buy a franchise, which is obviously one of our ideas. You've already got somebody who's pretty good. You could potentially run your own business if you thought you can. Or we have franchisees who are desperate for workers. So then we're going to come to you, you're going to put your name down in a list. I'm looking for a worker in this area and we come to you and we say, okay, here's somebody, this is their name. They've been through all the full training. They're equivalent to franchisee level training. They, they, they're groomers, they're, they're horticulturists, they're fences, they're, they're handymen, whatever, whatever they are. And we've also checked them out in the field and they're pretty good workers. Do you want to give them a try? So we're going to be able to introduce people to you. And we can go big scale. The idea is to run a big publicity campaign to say, come to us, because you go to a TAFE, you've got a qualification, that's it. You come to us, you do well, you've not only you've got, you've got your own business or you've got a job, and people are eager to employ you. Can you see the power of that? And that's how it works from both points of view. We give you people pre-trained, pre-screened, and you just gotta get them going. We're even in some situations, we can provide you with the equipment, like the dog wash trailer or maybe even to put somebody on a mowing trailer. We can actually provide that as part of the deal. We'll show you how to do that. There's contracts that we've been doing with um, Jared in particular, Jared Curtis in Dogwash. So we can provide you with the equipment as well. And that's paid off basically out of their subcontract earnings. So anyway, that's all I've got to say. It's, it's exciting to see you here and everybody who's, uh, who's online too, watching this in the future. It, it's a great opportunity. And we, we're still working on this whole idea but, you know, you know, when I started off the franchise, one of the visions I had right from the beginning was that I would have every one of my franchisees building a major business. And many, many franchisees, have, many of you here have in this room. But we reckon we can go a lot further than that too. We can actually help anybody who's got that ambition to build a successful business, to get more income, to get off the road completely in the management if you wish to, but also well, to do that while maintaining excellent customer service. So God bless you all. Have a great day. Good morning. Um, so as um, they mentioned, my name's Donna. I'm from Jim's Bookkeeping, local franchisee. Um, haven't done what you guys are all looking like you want to do, which is grow and employ staff, things like that. So I give you um, credit for doing that. It's, um, it's quite a step in your business. What I'm going to present to you today is some, some of the bookkeeping side of what you might need to know um, in order to hire staff. Um, lots of questions. I see lots of people in their gym's journey um, come and get help after they've already done something. It's not always the best way and it's also always a catch up. So bit of a bit of a trap. So I'm hoping that if I can give you some advice today that um, doesn't answer all your questions, but gets you to think about what's going to be best for you and how you're going to best tackle this next step in your journey. Um, are you in? Oh, I've got it open so you can drive it. Okay. Yeah. Do we have a button to drive it with or? Clicker. Yeah, clicker. Thank you. Um, until he gets the clicker, so obviously this has just been created for this specific day, so build your business. Um, so I, do, I generally present, so I'm not sure if I've met anyone before, but I present at the um, induction training um, and that's about sort of starting off. So I've come in with a different vision today. It's 
um, expecting that you're all got a strong operating business if you've decided you, this is your next step in your journey. All right. Um, I've already said that. Um, all right, so there's three main types of employees. Um, and does anyone want to guess what the three different types of employees that you might look at are? Yes? 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 Yes, perfect. All right. Um, so three main points of um, employees. So permanent, be, be it part-time or full-time, all right? Um, uh, casual, so in the true sense that we've always understood casual, and then contractors, subcontractors. Um, a, lot of, a lot of the gyms bookkeepers have done in contracting is they've actually sourced out the new franchisees coming through and actually contracted out to them. Really safe way of contracting in our environment. Um, no risk of them taking our clients away and it helps um, grow their business, gives them confidence as they learn their trade and come through. So really good opportunity. There you go. Thank you very much. All right. Um, some things about permanent employees, and please stop me if I'm going too quick, ask questions if you want, although I will be here later on to answer any questions and through the break as well. So any personal questions you don't want to discuss in the open forum, I'm happy to answer th through the breaks. So a permanent employee, be it part-time or full-time, they have a set amount of contracted hours. So you are, as an employer, you are obligated to give them that every week. So if you put someone on full time, you're going to pay them for 38 or 40 hours a week. Whether they work it, you've got to pay that. They've got a contract to say that they've, they're entitled to earn that every week. But, and if it's part time, whether it's 16, 20, 25 hours, that's what you've agreed to pay them every week. Sorry. Uh, you're right. Uh, the, the number of hours gets uh, discussed. Prior to, so it could be anything. It doesn't have to be 40 or... No, no. So, so um, when, when you're negotiating or, or offering the contract to a person, they might say, well, look, I can only work six hours. I, I have kids I have to pick up from school. I can work six hours a day. And they still become a permanent part-time employee. Yes, correct. That's, that's a permanent employee. So that, that's when you look at the award, they get um, the lesser amount per hour. Yep. But, as I've said there, they, they're going to get all the leave. They're going to get annual leave on those hours and they're going to get sick leave on those hours. All right? Um, and uh, does it have to be the same, uh, same day, for example, every week? Not necessarily. You can negotiate that with the employee. Um, ideally, the same day, and the example being that if they call in sick on a Wednesday, yeah. you can't then say, well, actually... Wednesday's not your day, so I'm not going to pay you sick pay today. So they have to have some sort of set roster. They can have a roster that changes over, what division are you in? Dog wash. So you might roster a month in advance yep. and they know what days, but if they then call in sick for one of them days, that's their sick day, you have to pay that. They don't have to make the hours up on another day to catch up with your dogs. Okay. Does that make yep. sort of answer your question? Yeah, so um, the thing you can see with here is there's a big obligation to take this person on in your business. Suddenly you're going to have to um, pay them whether they come or not, pay them whether you've got work or not. Um, I don't want to say that we go through another lockdown or, you know, um, you know, any of that sort of thing ever again, but potentially pay them through that, um, things like that. So keep in mind that there's an obligation of taking on that employee, all right? Um, they're covered by work cover, they've got super, all your employees are going to get super now, be casual, part-time, full-time, doesn't matter if they work one hour, they're going to get superannuation on it, all right? As of the 1st of July, that all changed, and no matter, because it used to be you had to earn $450 for the month, then you could get super. If you're over 18, you get in super, all right? Um, work cover, um, as an employee, 
If you're a sole trader, you don't have to have work covered for yourself, but if you're going to take on an employee, you have to have it for them, all right? And depending on what division you're in um, and how much you're paying, how, what the sort of the size of your wage, um, that's how much um, your work cover is going to cost you. So you imagine work cover for someone who is cleaning gutters on a roof is going to be more expensive than somebody who's mowing lawns on the ground. Um, uh, work cover for a bookkeeper, apart from we get sore backs from sitting all the time, is a, a low risk, all right? And then it's multiplied out by how much they're earning for the year. So some of you, like work cover might ne not necessarily be a huge debt, so don't try and avoid it. You're better off, you know, well, you're legally required to have it, but don't be scared to get it. It's not always as dear as it sounds, all right? Um, single touch payroll is something that's come on, and what that's going to mean to you moving forward, is anyone still using a sort of a paper-based bookkeeping, not computerised at all? where they're submitting, they're calculating their BASs, anything like that. Because what single touch payroll has done is it means everyone who has a payroll needs an electronic software to lodge it with the ATO every single payday. There are some exceptions, but nothing, um, we don't have Jim's shearers at the moment. So um, uh, they don't have to lodge single touch payroll on payday because they work on remote properties without um, internet but there's some examples of where that's not required but for us here if we're going to employ someone we need an electronic bookkeeping program that's going to lodge it straight with the ATO every payday all right um, so yeah the biggest take home from this part is you need to make sure that you can afford to ongoing take on this person even for the limited amount of hours per week and if you get someone who's going to have lots of sick leave that's potentially going to cost your business. And I'm a mum, I was a mum with a child, I worked with a child. If you're employing someone with kids, every time they've got runny noses and coughs or something at school now, they're not allowed to go to school until they're clear of COVID. So you're going to cover their sick leave. So even though legally I, I don't knock people hiring someone who's got kids, obviously, because you can't discriminate, but that's, that's an expense on your business. All right, so you need to understand that that expense and making sure your business can cover that. Isn't sick leave only five days a year? It's, it's 10 days a year pro rata. Right. All right, but the other thing is that once they run out of those hours, that they potentially are going to take the time off anyway, and that's not going to get your work done. So it's twofold, but yes, 10, 10 days per year. Um, and you'd have to check the award, but the majority of them we deal with will be 10 days. All right, so that's, that's sort of the take home from there. Award entitlements, uh, that pretty much is um, breaks, uh, their leaves, any allowances, penalties, things like that, when overtime kicks in for each person. So, but every award is getting, you know, got its level of complicity that you need to look into. The next one is casual. Um, obviously, as it, it explains, biggest take home there is the flexibility. So this is a good opportunity for you to potentially take on an employee. You're gonna pay them more per hour, all right? So there's 25% loading on this person, but when you don't have work, you're not paying them. When they don't come in, you're not paying them, all right? They still get entitlements, they still get overtime, so a casual employee gets overtime now. Um, they still get superannuation. They still have a work cover. But there's less, less risk on your business should you have a low cash flow period, low work period, that sort of thing. All right. So potentially this is an opportunity to bring on an employee and cause less risk in your business. All right. Um, now, this is a, a bit of a new one as well. No leave entitlements for, from the employer. Currently, the um, government's trialling something where they can apply to get their, um, they can apply to get sick leave. Now, the trick is they have to apply now to say, I'm a casual employee with no sick leave. Um, they don't apply when the day they're sick. They have to let the government know they're a casual now 
and in the future they might um, they might uh, be sick and need leave that the, their employer is not going to cover. Now, what a lot of my employer, employers are scared of is this is just the step towards them having to give sick leave to their casual staff. So I have some people, some um, employers with like uh, retail or food, fast food outlets have lots of teenagers, lots of casual staff, and they're scared that that's going to come in. And if it does, um, that's going to be an expense on their business. But at this stage, that's offered by the government. All right. The other thing is there is a potential for them, this person to become permanent. And in, that, in doing that, it means that after a period of time, generally 12 months, if you've offered this person every Monday and Tuesday work for 12 months and it's regular, there's a pattern, um, you're obligated to offer them permanent part-time hours. All right? Uh, they are not obligated to accept it. So that's a bonus. They can choose, because if in accepting it, they're going to lose 25% of their hourly rate. So a lot of people will, you know, say, no, that doesn't suit me. I'd rather have more in my pocket, but they could potentially come on net at that point. Um, work cover again, superannuation, exactly the same across them. And single touch payroll again, Yep. Sorry, uh, with the award entitlements, yep. if there is a number specified that they have to get this much per hour, Correct. if you're paying them uh, all the award, none of the other stuff applies? Is that true? No, incorrect. incorrect. So uh, the way an award <coughs> works is uh, the sort you, could, you can get away with it. There's a way to do it. But the award says they have to get X amount per hour. Mm -hmm. All right. So you have to pay them a minimum of that. Yep. Then they have to get a certain amount for any overtime. They might then get allowances for traveling in their own car. They might get allowances for this, this, all the things they might get. Yep. You can, if you can prove that you're paying them enough to cover all those things per hour, you can actually say none of that counts. But then in a contract with this person, it has to specify you do not get an allowance to drive your own car because I am paying you X amount over the award to cover that. Right. So it's, it's, you can do it. It's quite complicated. You have to make sure that they, if they did everything that they're entitled to, they would still be better off on your hourly rate. And there is an award for dog groomers, like for mobile dog groomers? Yeah, you're, you're, lucky. you're lucky you've got like one to choose from. I've got a picture of the awards that anyone in the cleaning division and anyone in the mowing division can have a look at and see if they can figure out what they're going to pay their person. What's a, how many hours does a casual have to work a week? None. None. Is, that, None. is, is there a certain... A minimum of a shift. A minimum of a shift. Um, each award will have how much a minimum shift could be, generally like three hours. And is there, is there a maximum amount of hours? Uh, once they start to go to full-time hours, then they would be getting overtime. Okay. So, no, not a maximum, but you'd have to offer them overtime. The question I've got is when you said if you offer, if someone's working Monday, Tuesday, after 12 months, you've got to offer them a full-time and permanent position. With that, does their holiday pay then become pro-rated? Like, yeah. So, a part-time person gets 10, hour, 10 days of sick leave per year. But if I, or, so equivalent, say, let's say 10 days is two weeks. If I only work two days a week, I'm actually earning two days of sick leave and two days. So I get four days of sick leave. And that would go for holiday pay as well. Exactly. They get four weeks holiday pay, but if I'm only working two days per week, it works out to eight days annual leave because I, I need to get my four weeks off. Yeah. All right. Um, and you generally find most people won't take that on, but um, legally, say in um, two or three years, if they, um, they went and complained to Fair Work about you and Fair Work had found out you didn't offer it, then they, you might be re required to pay them annual and sick leave for the two years where you, you should have, but didn't. If you offer it and the person rejects it, is there an obligation to re-offer it after? No. No, once you've, once you've offered it, and like anything, as soon as you take on staff, document everything, all right? 
absolutely document everything you can when you're managing staff. Um, just keep a diary. It doesn't have to be anything complicated. A diary to say, you know, did this on this day. In that case, I'd have some sort of um, paper or electronic thing to say, here's your offer. Generally, they won't take it because they're going to have to drop their weekly wage and then you, you're covered. Don't have to offer it again. All right, at this stage, unless they change the rules. So there's some guy right at the back. Just with obviously with your full-time employees, you just need to obviously take into account your leave loading as well when you're paying that on top of Not every award has leave loading, so you need to know what award you're dealing with and if it does have leave loading, yes. So every, every award differs. I haven't had leave loading for like, I don't know, it's been a long time since I've been a full-time, like I've been an employee. And it probably was 40 years ago when I got leave loading for the last time. But there are still, I do still do payrolls with um, leave loading. Um, so yeah, just need to know your award and everything they're entitled to in your award. So um, let's just say a casual in 12 months says no, and then 12 months later they decide, oh, well actually I'll pop on to. So are you legally obligated to spend? Yes. Yeah, if they come back to you after like a year later, so you don't have to offer it, but if they come to you and say, I, I need to be permanent part-time now, um, you have to offer it. You have to give it to them. How, how regular does it need to be? Only has to be offered the one time. How regular do, do their work hours need to be for them to be eligible? Doesn't have to be any amount. It has to be, show a systematic regular employment for a, peri a period over that 12 months. So even if they miss, it doesn't say they have to be every single week for the 12 months, but if, if, they, if Fair Work looked at their 12 month history and said, this person's basically always working, apart from a week here, day there, week, you know, looks like a permanent <coughs> role now. So what the, what the, the um, Fair Work's trying to rule out is that you're using a casual to avoid them paying sick and annual um, where realistically it should have been a permanent person who is entitled to those sick and annual hours. So if, the, if um, to give you an example, so I do a, um, a payroll for a gelati store, not good for the diet every time I pick the timesheets up, but um, he doesn't have to because he comes under and says, well, he's a seasonal workforce. So even though they might work nine months, um, come come the winter, yeah. he can drop it away. So he gets away with it that. It's about knowing your award, you know. But yeah, that's these are the things that's good to know. And if, the, if and when this happens to you, remember, reach out for help. There's lots of help. And I've got links here that, I, that I've got for you to reach out for help with, all right? Because every award slightly differs and there are just those little glitches there for you. Again, single touch payroll has to be done every single payday. So again, you need software to do that. You can't avoid it anymore. I can make sure we get a copy out to everyone. Yes, yeah, certainly. Yeah, no problem. Walk hour, it's the same for casual and permanent employees. What was that, sorry? A work cover. Work cover, yes, exactly the same. Um, so remember in work cover, what we're going to tell, when you apply for a work cover, you basically tell them what industry you're in, what the employees are doing as a way of work. And then the next thing it says, how much is your total wage bill for the year? So if you're casual, your total wage bill might be less. The, the, um, risk, the chance of risk of accident is still the same, whether they're permanent or casual but it might be a little bit less because they're not earning as much. You might be having this downtime. You might be somebody who has, you know, a couple of months off every year and they're not working during that time. All right. So here you go, where can you find help? Don't try and write it down. It's a, it's a, it's a website and it's, they're long, but as I'll, I'll make sure everyone gets copies of these if you like. Um, so, business.gov.au has an awesome, um, that's a good idea, you can always take a photo of the page, that might help. But business.gov.au have a tool where you can step through and create a contract for your um, employee. 
even to the point where it draws down the award and it'll attach the award to the, to the contract. It's super easy to use. And you can, you can then present a contract like someone who's hiring people regularly. Very first time you ever use it. All right, so it's really, really helpful. <clears throat> fair work. Um, don't be scared off by fair work. Um, that it's a tool for us as, a, as someone who does payroll and assists my clients all the time with their staffing things. It, um, fair work have, has a lot of information and it has all the awards. All right, I think the next one's the... So this is where, where it's hard when you've got... The one on the left is everything that potentially has a reference to cleaning. So if you've got a cleaning business, you want to hire someone, you have to meet, you have to find out which one of those is relevant to you. And for the mowers, everything on the right is where potentially your staff member might fit in. When you click into the awards, Underneath it, it says that, you know, um, works in direct supervision, you know, always has supervision, you know, that sort of thing, up to works on their own. Every award sort of has something similar to that. So find the right one that sort of suits the person you're going to bring on and then drill down to see what you can and can't do. Is it up to you to pick an award for them? Uh, yes. You need to find the award that best suits the work type you're giving them. Um, it's not hard for a dog wash. You've got one. <laughs> so you, you guys have got it made. Um, I did look to see the fences. Any fences here? They're, they're quite good. They're good. Um, handyman, probably um, potential construction. Uh, so I want to get a question next time. Just repeat it back into your mind. Oh, sorry. That's all right. That's all right. Sorry. Um, I forgot what that one was. That's all right. <laughs> next one. Okay. All right. So just keep in mind lots of awards out there. Don't want to scare anyone off and say they're not going to use fair work because it was too hard because those, I've picked out the two worst that I could find when I was getting this together, all right? So um, a lot to choose from. All right, um, the next thing I want to um, go through is um, some due dates. So as soon as you hire, hire people, there's some due dates that you're going to need to know. Um, keep in mind, they should look familiar because they're exactly the same as your BAS due dates, which makes that a very expensive day of the quarter. And that's what I find. Um, my biggest um, pain point with some clients when they've got transition to hiring or even just increase their workforce <coughs> is suddenly their BAS has multiplied. Um, so to give you an idea, um, does anyone feel comfortable telling me how much their last bass was if they've got no employees? Yeah, yeah we paid $1,000. $1,000. I like that. That's, it's better when it's under 1000 but $1,000. So if you're going to hire someone, their tax that you're going to withhold is going to be around $100 every payday every payday you're going to have to withhold a hundred dollars from their wage and hold it till next bass time we just did ours this week and we got five thousand credit so someone got five thousand dollars credit um unfortunately it doesn't happen too often i can tell from your nice clean um mowing shirt that you haven't been um mowing for long Oh, okay. <laughs> well, maybe my, my other clients don't have a good washer because <laughs> their shirts don't look that good anymore. Um, but yeah, so keep, keep in mind, if you're going to have a full-time employee, generally um, you're going to look at $100 of tax you're going to keep from their wage every single week. All right, so there's 13 weeks. Okay, so you know when you work for an employer... Yeah, and they pay you $1,000 a week, mm -hmm. but they keep $100 of that to give to the tax department. Is that salary tax? Yeah, uh, well, yeah, it's pay as you go with holdings. So when you worked for an employer, how much did you earn per week? No, I'm still working. So. Oh, okay. So you gross, you gross a certain amount, mm -hmm. but you don't take it all home. You have a net amount that you take home. You pay tax, yeah. Pay tax. Yeah. So your employer holds that money and gives it to the ATO every 13 weeks. 
Okay. All right. Yeah. yeah. yeah so straight away, your bass has just gone from 1,000 to 13 times 100. So now we've got a bass of 2,300. All right. So suddenly your bass has over doubled. All right. You can see why um, some people. I haven't got, yeah, yeah, I'll get there. So, so um, out, of, out of that, they're going to have to withhold or give them 10.5% super. So nearly about the same. So suddenly now, that's your, that's your bass bill or your bill on the 28th of every quarter. Sorry, um, You're right. Why, how does it correspond to the bass? What? Why does it correspond? Because the bass has GST paid, GST received, and then tax withheld from your employers. Where, where did you get that $100 from? Did you, did I did some sums to know if you're paying um, a groomer $1,000 a week, you have to withhold. There's a calculator on, on um, the ATO site. No, no, so, okay, so you're assuming that the, the, they're paying $1,000 a week. Yes, okay. exactly. Cool. Right. So that's your wage that you're paying the person every week. That's the tax you have to withhold yeah. from their wage. Sure. There's 13 weeks in a bass. So 13 times 100 is $1,300 worth of tax you've withheld from your employee. Yeah. And that's your GST. And then that's the combination of both. Okay. You have to pay. You have to pay super on that which is 10.5% every, every payday. But again, it's due on the 28th of the quarter or the month after the quarter ends. All right, so there's a question. Oh, okay. So that, it becomes a very expensive yeah, day. I'm sorry, so the, the 1,500 of super doesn't go to the tax. It goes to the, no, it, yeah. to the super, yeah. whatever they do. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So that goes to super. And the rest goes to the ATO, but unfortunately, it's on the same due date. Yeah, so the and that's what I, that's the really the purpose of that is reiterating that this is, so when, when everyone went through franchisee training, um, Nicole would have talked about creating a bank account to, ha, as a reserve and putting the money over there every week, every, you know, however often you did it or don't do it. This is the time to take that advice on board if you haven't already, because on the 28th of every quarter, your bill is potentially tripled because you took on one person. All right, and that's sort of what I, I, and I see a lot of franchisees end up in a lot of pain because they get to this quarter and then realize suddenly my bill's a lot dearer. And trust me, my, like my bass is only small as a bookkeeper, we, we, get, we um, get to a point where we earn sort of, uh, you know, enough and we get to that thing unless we grow like you guys are doing and I haven't been brave enough to do that. So, um, but yeah, so I understand, but if suddenly my bass was triple, I'd be like, oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, that's emptied the bank account. Um, as well as all your other expenses. If, you, if you're um, putting on someone with their own trailer, suddenly, all, all those other expenses double as well. If the mowers are, you know, got extra mowers, extra brush cutters, extra everything. So it's a very expensive time suddenly. And if you've got that reserve account, so every time you run a payroll, you know exactly how much tax was withheld and exactly how much super, you can go and put it in that reserve account. So come bass time, you've got the money there on the 28th of the month and you can pay your super bill and you can pay your tax bill. Okay. So, so say uh, the person gets paid $1,000 a week, they will get less money because of tax. Yep. But this is not your tax, this is their tax. That's their tax, but you have to hold it until but three if, months. But if it's $1,000, it depends on the wage. It depends on the wage. That wasn't an exact amount. 
I was just trying to keep yeah. it so that it, we, we could follow. Okay, I've got, uh, yeah. So the question was, can you get around all that yeah. by using subbies? And it is definitely an option. Um, and we'll move on from that. Oh, all right. Before we do that, there are also some grants that you can look at. All right. So you might want to take a picture of that one. Um, this, again, is always changing. So at the moment, um, the employment, the big employment grant is gone. But there is still um, some wage subsidies depending on who you hire. There's also some apprenticeship. And that, that can go a long way towards covering some of the costs of your employee's wage. Um, but it's a moving thing. It just depends what's available at the point of time when you've decided you're going to hire someone. So um, what's there now, if you go in six months, might be different. All right, so, but certainly look around when you come to the time and see whether or not you can, um, you can afford to hire someone. All right, there we go, subcontractors, all right. So what's important about a subcontractor? Lots more flexibility. And like I mentioned before, a lot of the gym's bookkeepers, what we will do um, is we will um, talk to our franchisor and say, who's new, who needs a bit of work, I need a help at the moment. And we'll utilise another gyms, a new gyms, and um, sort of keeps it in the family. It gives us um, a safety net to know that um, they're working to the same standards that we've been sort of brought to do. Um, in the bookkeeping world, um, there's a lot of fear about someone taking our client's office. Um, making a relationship with our, our client and then they become their bookkeeper and we, we're gone. So it's something that we live with um, and that sort of avoids that by using our gym's counterparts. Now, subcontractors is um, a good one in that they give you a bill and you pay their bill, right? In a true subcontractor terms, that's it. The relationship's done. You, are, you say, look, you know, I want you to do this job. You either say, this is how much I you know, can pay you for it. And they say, yes, no. Or they say, I'll quote you to do this much. Super easy. Um, no single touch payroll. Um, nothing like that. All right? You don't have to have your software set up. Um, you don't have to worry about keeping tax, anything like that. There are some things that the government or the ATOs brought in to try and counteract everyone using contractors as opposed to hiring. So just like they're doing with casual, they're trying to make it so that subcontractors isn't a way for us to, to hire people and avoid paying um, super, work cover, all the rest of it. All right. So real tricky. So yes, they've got no leave. Yes, you're not doing any of that, but they may be entitled to work cover and superannuation. All right, um, a really, really tricky I think environment. They would have to do all their own paperwork. Exactly, they do. They just present you with a bill, you pay it, nice and easy. So the question, sorry, the question was, they have to do their own paperwork. Yes, as a contractor, just like you, they um, bill, raise an invoice, and send a bill to you. You pay it. The relationship's done. Job's done. Relationship's done. Uh, franchise so you can you can potentially contact a new franchisee and ask them to do some work for you so a new so that if you're busy you're really really busy and you want to you need some help even you might be going away and you need someone to help you out for the week you might contact your franchise all and say um, have you got a new dog wash in my around my area anywhere that will do my work for the day the week whatever it is it's a good way to contract out your work and they still have all they've been um, trained to work to the gym standards right. so, you know oh, yeah. it, it does it's not a long-term fix because yeah. eventually they're going to get busy enough to get their own work Okay, I'll show you that. So the question is whether or not they need work cover. All right. So there is, no, there is a um, an ATO site there, and it is is my 
is this person a contractor or an employee? All right. Um, so you basically step through a you know question answer where you go yes to that, no to that. All right. And at the end of it says this potentially is an employee or this person is potentially a contractor. So as yeah, no, you're right. Do you have to meet all of them? No, no. Um, but there's some key ones, but no, you don't have to meet any, all of them. So, sorry, the question was, do I have to, does the person have to meet all of those? Um, and the answer is no, depends on um, which ones they tick yes to, all right? So, as an employee, I can't then go, I'm going to get someone else to do that work for me. So, sorry, what was your name? Gennady. Gennady. Gennady rings me and, uh, I, like, I'm employed as a casual rings me and says, I've got work for you tomorrow. And then I say, oh, I might get my offsider to do it. No, as an employee, you've employed me. I can't delegate it to anyone else. I can't bring another gyms and say, can you do this? I don't want to feel like doing it tomorrow. You've got a contract with me to do that work. All right. Um, I'm paid per hour or item, you know, for a dog, it might be a dog, for a mow, it might be, you know, the lawn um, or a commission. So I might, that's a, a paid rate. Um, you provide me with the, the equipment, be whatever job I'm doing, and I just turn up and do the work. I'm not legal, I have no legal responsibility for that work. If I poison the guy's lawn, um, which one of my clients may have done recently, <laughs> your Yadrin loves to talk about the person who walks the poison over the turf. Um, uh, I'm not, that's not my fault. I don't get sued for it. I'm not expected to replace it, anything like that. It's your business. That's up to you, all right? Um, the business directs the way I'm to work. So the business sort of says, here's your work, there's your start time, there's your finish time, and this is your work effort. Um, and I'm not operating independently. There's nothing to show that I'm independent from you, all right? So that, that's the true sense of an employee if I'm working for you. As a contractor, if you, con if you ring, um, you know, Jim's dog wash this suburb and say, oh, I've got a dog wash I can't get to tomorrow, can you um, do it? She potentially can um, get one of her six employees to go out and service that, that you're contracting. Yeah. Definitely contracting the work. Um, you're paid for the result. You're not paid the hourly rate or anything. So, so you can't pay a contractor an hourly rate? You can negotiate the... So the question, can you pay a contractor an hourly rate? You can, you can say to a contractor, the, um, the job's about two hours. Yeah. What's your rate? And he says, oh, I charge $50 an hour. He goes, so, okay, or I'm happy to charge you $100. If it, costs, if it takes you a bit longer, let me know and we'll up it. You can do that. So you can work it out on an hourly rate, but you can't sort of, you know. And again, if you did that, doesn't mean he's automatically an employee. It's just one of the many questions. Um, as um, a contractor, I may provide some or all of the equipment. Not, maybe not all of it, but some of it. Um, and then I become legally responsible for the work. I'm invoicing you for a job, and then I take on that responsibility for the work, all right? Um, and I'll say, you say, I've got a dog I need washed. I'll say, okay, I can actually fit them in Thursday afternoon at three o'clock. Can you, you know, let them know that's when I'm coming. And I, I operate independent from you, and that would be that invoicing factor. Where they want to stop it is that um, you might schedule this person's whole week for weeks and weeks at a time and um, paying them a set amount, you know, say, okay, I agreed to pay you $1,000 a week. Um, I'll give you a list of who you've got to do each week. They're basically an employee then. So keep in mind that, that calculator tool side on the ATO, um, and remember, every division will be different here and every work type is different. So there's no, you know, not one of them, if you say yes or no to, 
will um, d change the outcome. It's a combination of which ones you answer. All right. So in the question of the, ha if they then become determined to be an employee, then you have to include their figures in your work cover salary and you have to pay 10.5% super for them. So is this uh, website uh, binding? So if I go on this website and I go, oh, yeah, tick, 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 this person is an employee. Is that binding that they have to be an employee? They don't have to be, they can still be a contractor, but then you have to pay super and work cover for them. Based on the answers? Based on the answers, yes. Based on the answers, and if you do this and it comes out with a result, I would seriously consider taking a screenshot or printing your question answers mm -hmm. so that you've got a record of what helped you get to the decision you made. Okay. All right? Uh, if, uh, sorry, I'm probably jumping ahead, but uh, between uh, super and uh, work cover, it also depends just on this just on these answers or is it depend on the amount of time they're working no so question good question um so is um the outcome of this whether you have to pay super or work cover is it only the questions that this um determines or is it um either they do because there used to be a philosophy that if they worked Greater than six months of the year for one supplier, if they worked, you know, seventy-five percent for one supplier, things like that. That's all gone. It's this tool. This tool only is what determines whether or not you pay super and work cover for them. All right. Um, it's not a. It's not a huge drama. You can still operate. You just then have to cover their super and work cover for them. All right. You can still have them invoice you. Um, that's not a problem at all, but you're just in obligated to do that. Can the franchisee provide equipment? Sorry, sorry, I missed. Sorry, I missed that. Can the franchisee provide equipment? Trade up. Trade up. Yeah, of course, of course. Yeah. So as so, if you were to contact another franchisee and they came with their gear and all their equipment, their trailer, that's fine. But even as an employee, I might have some equipment. Um, but as a contractor, um, even if I still use a little bit of your equipment, you'd expect they'd probably use a lot more of their own. And again, it's not that one question that determines it. Yeah. Um, and, and yeah, like if, you, if you're regularly using someone, then you want them to be covered by work cover in that anyway, because if something goes wrong, you want to make sure that they're covered. All right. Sorry. So, so do a lot of people go down the track of employing people as a contractor and then just pay the super pay the tax? And, then, like, and that's a really simple way to, to do that. So you, sorry, you're not paying tax for them. You're paying work cover and super and that's it. Yeah. And it's just a really simple way to do that. So yeah. So the question being, um, do a lot of people go along that line of hi hiring someone through this contractor process and just paying the super and the um, work cover? And the, the easy answer is it is a really safe, easy way to start off. Again, like casual, there's not a lot of uh, expense on the business when you start off this way. And it's not something potentially that might be on the very first time you're doing it too. So, so as a, in the mowing division, for example, you could take somebody out, employ them as a contractor, but they're essentially an employee. They're doing all the things as an employee. You're providing a bit for them. You're doing all that stuff for them under a contract uh, sort of arrangement where you pay their yep. work cover and all that. So it's, it's just really easy. Yeah. Yeah. So if you want to go and get, get someone, you know, outside of the gyms, you know, you find a young guy, you find a young girl who's really keen, they've got their own ABN, so they, they're happy to invoice you. And you just then calculate every week, um, how much did you pay them? Okay, so I need to put this much away for their super. And when you have your work cover insurance, you just add, add what they potentially would earn over a period that you're going to have them work for you and include that in your calculations. So, so Super you, easy. So if you wanted to have an arrangement where you pay them $1,000 a week, for example, you could just tell them to invoice you $1,000 every week, you 
pay them and, and obviously pay their work cover and their um, super on top of that. Uh, that's just how it would work. That would support you a $1,000 every week. Yep. Yep, you can certainly make any arrangement like that you like. And as soon as they then go into that, yeah, they're using all your equipment, you're scheduling it all for them, then yeah, potentially super easy. You just put it away. You don't have to worry about single touch payroll. You don't have to process payrolls. They're going to send you an invoice. Yeah. 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 And, uh, yeah. and you would pay them, so for example, if it's part of $1,000 a week, that $100 would go to super, and then $900 would go to them, yeah? No, so super is on top of what you pay them. So the question was, if you're paying someone $1,000 a week, hang guys, sorry, sorry. Um, if, if you're paying someone $1,000 a week, whether they're an employee or they're a contractor, super is on top of that amount. So it's... A thousand plus ten point five percent. Even if they've got their own ABN, so if if I'm hiring this guy here, I've got mate, I've got a trail, I'm gonna pay you a thousand bucks a week, you've got your own ABN, I'm gonna pay you a thousand dollars with your own ABN, then you're responsible for his own super. Uh not necessarily, no. Um he might be, and this is the thing, there's a, a few other questions. Is he a sole trader or a um a company? That can change it. If he's a company, more than likely he would have to be responsible for his own. But um, no, not necessarily just because he's got his own gear. Um, uh, if you're. I'm, I'm supplying him with the gear, like the sun's yeah. supplying yeah. the trailer. Yep. Yeah. And if he's got his own ABN, I'm paying his ABN as opposed to paying him the direct way as an employer, employer, I should say. I would have thought, mate, there's a thousand bucks, you're on your own, you pay your own tax, you pay your own super. Yeah. No. So as a contractor, so if, you, if you're supplying all his gear, you're paying him $1,000 a week he, and he regularly works for you, um, you schedule his work, more than likely you're going to be responsible for his super and his work cover. It doesn't matter if he's working half a week with you and half a week with someone. Not necessarily, yeah. It doesn't necessarily matter whether he's not working your whole week. Sorry, guys. Sorry. It's a bit and, and you're employing them um, basically come full time. Isn't there some um, rule around that, that if, he, if they can prove he's actually working for you all the time, full time, he's actually an employee, not a contractor? No, he can still be a contractor, but then he's entitled to some employee benefits being super and work cover. Sick Sorry? Sick no, not sick leave. He's still a contractor for that. At this stage. A labour hire, labour hire, yes. Yep, correct. Um, so, Epi has got his own ABN, sole trader, etc. So, he still has to pay super as well? Or is it just what you're paying? No, so if he's a sole trader, and we've done the calculator and it deems that he's an employee to you and you pay his super, he's not obligated to pay any. Okay. All right? No, no. Are you obligated to offer No, no, they don't fall under that casual thing, no. You're right. Uh, if, um, if other franchise is working for me for a day, no, so there's a good good question. So if another franchisee is going to work for you for a day and I see lots and lots of people have franchisees helping them out different times, are they obligated? I think if you followed the the um, the questionnaire, no you wouldn't. Because they're not acting as an employee, they've come in as a contractor to help you out. All right, so it's not like, so if you keep in mind, the ATO is trying to avoid people hiring people without hiring them. So there was a while where people hired all these, or hired people under ways to avoid paying all these extras. I don't, I want to take on an employee, but I don't want to pay 
all those other expenses. I don't want them to pay annual. I don't want them to have sick leave. I don't want to have to do their tax and all that. If I do this, I can get away with that. And that's what the ATO is targeting. So if you think of that, if you're getting a franchisee to come and help you, are you doing it to avoid all the thing of hiring someone or you've just got a big job on for the day or you've got to have the day off and you need someone to come and help? You're not really trying to avoid doing the employment thing. It's, it's in the true sense of a contractor. Sorry. You're right. Sorry. Ask away, because the, the reason is, this is a real sticking point for the whole industry, yeah. that people get confused uh, and lots of contractors are out there not getting what they're entitled to. And that, look, that's, they're obviously happy with what they're getting, but when something goes wrong, that's when you, you will find out that you've got a problem. So keep in mind, if you've got someone who's been a contractor with you for six or 12 months, great guy, you love having beers with him on Friday night, you know, everything's wonderful, he's got a mortgage, he's got six kids, you know, whatever, he hurts himself or, you know, and you know, he can't afford to pay his mortgage. Then people are gonna to say to him, but don't you work for the guy? Doesn't he cover you under work cover? And he says, no. I've, I've, I've worked with him for a year and a half, but you know, I'm a contractor, so someone has to say to him, oh, but you were entitled to that, and suddenly then you're liable. And the work cover's gonna come and audit your books and say, well, he was acting as an employee. You should have been covering all this stuff for this guy. Now, suddenly you're covering his mortgage as well. And that's where you need to protect yourself. Sorry, go on. So ask away, guys, don't worry. Yep. Oh, so, yeah, yeah. so what happens if this guy randomly puts in his um, invoice for 2000 What do I do then? Well, you have to have... So the question is, I've got a contractor who's um, always doing the $1,000 a week and suddenly he comes with this nice $2,000 bill. Um, and just like anything, like how, where's he getting the $2,000 bill from? Like it would be like any um, negotiation with any supplier that you go to. So any of your suppliers, if suddenly their bill doubled, you would have a please explain conversation with them. And um, at that point, you've, you're either your relationship's about to sever and that's not gonna be your subcontractor anymore because he's either decided he's doubling his rates or he's trying to you know, do something or he might have a reasonable explanation why it's suddenly gone up. But if then you accept it and pay it, then you probably are obligated, but then potentially he won't be back anymore. Yeah, I, I guess that's sort of what I was asking. What's my obligation to pay that bill? You could fight that out in VCAT. There's no easy answer for that. Yeah. Um, there's no easy answer to say why he suddenly doubled his, uh, only that it's not something you would generally see. Um, it would happen very potentially very early in the relationship and you would um, probably not have him working for, for you for long. It's highly unlikely that it would happen the long term down the track. Is it, yes, go on. Yep, no, so question with a contractor, is there an obligation to give him a certain amount of work or keep him on for a certain length the time and the answer is no um, which is why it is an easy or a simpler way for you guys to go as a first port of call in your hiring someone so you can just say thank you very much See yep you later. i've got no work for another month or um dog wash i don't know whether you particularly have a downtime but the mowers so you might put your contract say to your contractor come back to me in september october you know off you go and have a nice winter um, September, October, come and call me back and, you know, if you're still looking for work, I'll, I'll bring you back on board. And it works the other way as well, so you can say... Of course. Same, so, yeah. They can, they can say to you, I found some better work, higher paying, things like that. So it is certainly an option for you that they can, they can say goodbye to you as well. Um, all right, I think I might be coming towards the end. Um, we've created a, a, um, an app, or we've 
launched onto this app as a team app, right? Um, and it's got a, a lot of interesting stuff to read as well as due dates and things that you can access free of charge to um, help you understand what's required of you as your business is progressing. So we, we created this for the new franchisees, but you got, and it's really great for them, you guys are about to progress into a part of your business where the liabilities get higher, the risk gets more, um, the money numbers on the zeros on the numbers get higher. So really important that you sort of understand what your obligations are. And there's lots of interesting reads there. Um, I, that, and that's the QR code to find it. So if you take a photo of that, you can um, download it. And once you download, it comes up as stack and type in Jim's bookkeeping, all in capital with an apostrophe. And it will um, take you through any nice bedtime reading. If you have trouble sleeping, it will put you to sleep. But there's lots of interesting stuff in there for you to refer to. But are you just sending us the slide back? I can send you the slide. I can send it to Steph probably, and she maybe can access everybody a copy. Thank you, Steph. All right, so um, really good app to read. You might pick up one or two hints, um, but potentially it'll help you um, understand what's obligated. Did you, did you find it? I can help anyone at lunchtime if you get stuck. I've got some little leaflets you can take it off. All right, um, if there's no last questions, I think are we good to go time-wise? Yeah, awesome. All right, thank you very much for having me and I'll be around to answer any more. I suggest tonight go type in Mike Andes into to Google. Um, we're gonna embarrass him, but he's got such great content. He's got lawn care, business course. He's got Augusta Lawn Care. He's grown from zero to 100 franchisees in the space of around eight years for his own Two, two years. The franchise program. The franchise in two years. He's only 26 years old. So he's actually come out as a guest of Jim to do the training this week. But we're going to, we've been lucky enough to sort of get him to do a speech here. So please ask him as many questions as you want. He'll probably go for 40 minutes and we're going to have him maybe come back again after that for a QA. and a So over to you, Mike. Cool. I got mine. I got my mic up here. Cool. All right. If I don't need this, let me know, but I'll use it until otherwise told. So I wanted to start off because uh, I literally had 20 minutes ago was told I'm supposed to do a presentation. I thought this was going to be Q&A. So if you have questions, definitely raise your hand because I was not really ready for a presentation. But I did go ahead and drop the guys this photo. And uh, I don't think I'll get emotional, but I'll try, I'll, uh, try to get to this story, kind of share what, what's going on here. So it says on the, on the board here, this is a whiteboard back in uh, Washington State. Uh, United States, that's where I'm from. And our local shop was the very first Augusta Lawn Care location that was started eight or nine years ago. And a couple years ago, we started franchising. But on the office uh, wall, right before you walk out the door, the guys a lot of times will put a quote of some sort on the whiteboard. And a few days ago, uh, one of our team members wrote this up on the board. It says, every moment away from fear makes a man immortal. And that was by Alexander the Great, who, who said that quote. And in relation to what we're talking about today, I think when we talk about growing our business, so often the times we are afraid of hiring another person, of scaling up the company beyond just ourselves, we're afraid of getting someone to do the office and do the bookkeeping uh, to really start to market and grow the company, and there's so much fear involved. But what makes this somewhat uh, meaningful to me and the reason I'm, I'm showing this today is actually uh, yesterday morning when I woke up here, it is midday over in the US, and I woke up to an, a message from the general manager from this location stating that uh, the employee who wrote this on the board had taken his life. And so um, I didn't know him super well. He's just one of the, the field crew members, and I have a lot of locations. Um, but the impact it made on the guys was pretty substantial. We had everyone come in early. Uh, well, they did over in the US, and had them all come in early, and just sat them down and explained everything that had happened. And so I think when, I talk, when we talk about you know, mental health and all these things that are so important, I think so often at times, though, fear is sometimes distinguished as something that is a horrible thing. 
But I think regardless of whether it be the individual who wrote this or each of us as business owners, there's things that we are afraid of. But on the other side of that fear is something that is so worth it. And it's literally a feeling of being immortal. And it's one of those things I think of business ownership and growing a company almost very similar to like having a child. Because when you have a child, there's this emotional connection with it because you made it. Without you, that thing would not be possible. That child, that baby, and there's oftentimes a lot of emotion that comes with it because you made this thing. And when the business is the exact same way, without you, without you as the operator, you as the entrepreneur, you as the business owner, getting through certain fears that you have, that business would never be possible. And so I I'd, I'd just encourage you today, when you are afraid of hiring another person, scaling up past two or three trucks, having a manager, starting to outsource other things, have a general contractor come in or, or subcontractor come in, all the things we just heard about, you know, casual workers. If you're afraid of those things, realize that on the other side of that fear is immortality. It's that feeling of, I built something and no one else can take it away from me, and I built this myself. And so when we look at um, building our companies, there's really three different stages that I think so many of us fall into. And how many, just for my sake, how many people who have an employee right now? Just raise your hand. Cool. So that first employee is a big step. And I know a lot of you are afraid or there might be fear around that thing. And that is having your first employee. Once you've done it 20 times, it seems like it's not even a big deal to you, right? Um, in the US, we, uh, we have a slightly different uh, labor economy and our, our franchisees grow very quickly fast. If we tell them if they're not gonna get an employee, they shouldn't even join Augusta Lawn Care because we really are built to scale. Um, our average franchisee is doing over 30,000 a month within their first year. But again, they're starting off with multiple employees and really trying to scale the business. So when we talk about our training, we actually spend most of our training on scaling up and growth. We talk very, very little about the mechanics of how to mow a lawn, a type of mower, blade sharpening. Like it doesn't really matter when it comes to growth. And if you're going to switch from the mindset of being an operator and someone who is mowing the grass, you know, putting up the fences, cleaning the dogs, whatever it might be, and switching into more of a mindset of being a business owner and someone who's now leading a team, there has to be a completely different switch in your brain that goes off. Because no longer is your job how to sharpen the blades or how to make sure that the mowers are gassed up and fueled up or that they, all the tools are ready to go for the next day. They, that is no longer your preoccupation. Your preoccupation needs to be, how do I grow this business? And there's really only two things that will grow your business. The only two things that we tell our franchisees they need to worry about, everything else doesn't matter if you're trying to grow your business. Number one is sales, and number two is hiring. If you can nail those two things in your business and put, a, put aside all the other distractions, you will grow your company. If you're trying to go from 100,000 to 500,000, if you're going to f trying to go from 500,000 to a million, those two things alone will get you there. All, everything else is a distraction. The type of mower you buy, the type of truck you buy, all the tools, the equipment, what type of petrol, you know, should I be, how much should I be charging here? That's all a bunch of distraction if you're trying to grow. Now, making it profitable, you've got to worry about profit margins and route density and making sure you're efficient and all those other things. And we'll talk about that. Those things are important. But if you're really stagnating without and you don't have that growth, those are the two things you have to really think about. And ask yourself, go throughout the day over the course of you know, 12 hours in a day and ask yourself, okay, this hour, was I focused on hiring? Was I focused on marketing and sales? Or was I focused on the 10,000 other things I'm supposed to be doing as an operator? Was I fueling up the trucks? Was I washing the trucks? Was I on the phone with the banker? Was I talking to the guys? Was I, like, there's so many other things we have to do in our, in our business, but they don't actually move the needle to growth and expansion. So there's three different stages of a business that when we, we talk about growing a company that I look at and Stress is obviously something we talk about a lot. It's something we've been talking about internally the last two days a lot with our team. Uh, I'm actually organizing a funeral literally today for him over in, on Monday when I get back. Right when I get back, we'll be putting a service on for him internally inside the company. Um, it's stress. There's a lot of stress in our lives. And a, a big fear that a lot of us will have around growing our company is around the stress that we are going to uh, take on by growth. And you're 100% right. There's going to be stress 
as you grow a company. And don't fall into the notion either, if you talk to someone that wrote a book or someone on YouTube that said, grow your business, just grow your business, and then it gets easier, and like, just let everyone else do the work for you. And like, the only reason you're stressed is because you're working hard outside all, all day long. There's some truth to that, but ultimately, in my opinion, there's three different levels of your business, and every single one's gonna have a different type of stress that's gonna cause you as a business owner to have to change and adapt and grow. And there's gonna be actually some of you, after I talk about these today, that will actually be like, hey, I should not grow my business. And that's fine. The, the concept of growing your business is only if it aligns with the goals that you have for the business. The business should not run you. You should run the business. And so if you're being driven to grow the company, but it's emotionally and psychologically damaging to you, you should stop growing. And there's three different stages of stress that I want to talk about. The first stage of stress is from zero to 200,000 in annual revenue. And I'd say that most of you are in, still in this stage, especially if you don't have employees. So from zero to 200,000 in annual revenue, this is the first stage of growth, and this is the first stage of stress that you're going to see in your business. Typically, the stress that you're going to have in step number, stage number one is going to be physical stress because you are working your butt off especially if you're hitting 150, 170, 180,000 in annual revenue, you are working a lot of hours. You are physically out in the sunshine, out in the rain, the cold, if you're in Melbourne. It, all of these things are physical stress. You are literally working 10, 12, 14 hours a day to get your business off the ground and start ramping up the company, okay? Now, the thing is this. What got you to 200,000 is not going to get you to 500,000. What got you to 500,000 is not going to be what gets you to a million and beyond. You literally have to evolve and change as a business owner into the different types of stress and the different operational roles you'll have to play as an owner. So the first stage is physical. That's your main job, just the physical stress of running your business. You're probably performing 50, 70, 80 percent of the actual billable hours. You're performing them. And that takes a physical strain on you and your body. That's why I call it physical stress. The next stage is typically from 200,000 to about 800,000 in annual revenue. And if those numbers seem massive to you, that's fine. But typically what you're going to see at this stage of growth as the company is in that annual revenue stage is going to be financial stress. The reason is because from 0 to 200, you were physically beat up, but you didn't have a lot of overhead. You didn't have employees to pay for. You didn't have an office you have to pay for. You didn't have all these other people supporting you in terms of bookkeeping. Like You don't even need a bookkeeper if you don't have employees. Now that's an extra, extra overhead cost. Now you got legal things. Now you got someone trying to you know, give you a, a lawsuit because of some employee problem. Now you got customers that are trying to give you problems and you're way more overhead. You gotta buy more trucks. You gotta buy more equipment. You gotta buy more shop space. All that's overhead. And now your margins, your profit margins, start to get compressed. Because when you were working out in the field, working 10, 12 hours a day, you were making 60, 70% profit margins. If you made $100, 60 of that went into your pocket. The other 40 was franchise fees, fuel, insurance, the basics, but you didn't have labor. You didn't have a shop space. You didn't need a bookkeeper. You didn't have all that overhead as part of growing the company. So a lot of times I see from this stage, 200 to 800,000, there is now more financial stress. Now, the reason that some people should actually get to this phase, though, because everyone's like, well, why in the world would I grow my company then? I have all this overhead. That sounds horrible. Well, the thing is, at this stage, you get out of the field. You are no longer working on your truck. You are no longer actually performing billable hours. You are now an operator that is actually managing people that are doing the work. Okay? And so at this stage, again, it sounds great. I don't have to work out in the field. I just drive around my AC truck all day long. I manage my crews. Great. But you're going to have financial problems and a lot more financial stress because your margins just went from 60% down to 20 or 30%. And running that type of a business is going to be more, more difficult financially, especially if you're growing. Growth sucks cash. In every single business, a company that is growing quickly is going to suck cash. There's going to be waste when you grow. You're going to buy a bunch of trucks and, oh my goodness, I didn't use that truck all week long. Oh, I hired too many people. I'm going to have to... There's waste that comes along with growing fast. You're not going to be as efficient when you're growing very fast. You're going to get more stressed out when you're growing really fast. 
So this is the second stage, 200,000 to 800,000 in annual revenue. And then the third stage is usually 800,000 in annual revenue and beyond. And this, again, everyone's like, oh, that would be great if I could just build a million dollar business. Life would be so good. I would be able to just sit back. Everyone's doing the work for me. I'm making hundreds of thousands of dollars in profit. Everything is just perfect. Here's the thing. You still have stress. No longer is it physical. I'm not working out in the field. Likely it's not financial because now I've figured out where my target market is. I know how to price things correctly. I'm accurate on my budget hours when I'm doing my jobs. I'm very, very good at what I do and I'm good at financial. Financially, I am set. But the stress that you now come in contact with at 800,000 plus typically is psychological stress. Because now you're responsible for 8, 10, 12 employees. And those employees have families, and those families have children. And now you, every single day when you wake up, have the pressure of 50 or 60 people relying on you to perform in your business for them to put food on their table. And that's psychological stress. Because now at this size of business, every single day you have an unhappy customer. Every single day an employee calls out, or is unhappy with you, or gets mad at you, or walks off the job. Every single day, you have some sort of compliance issue with the government, an insurance problem, something goes wrong with the bank, something goes wrong, flat tires, equipment breaks down. Every single day, you wake up to fires in your business at this size of, business, at this size of the company. It's like, why in the world do we want to grow our business? This sounds horrible. Here's the thing. At zero to 200000 in revenue, Although you control your own destiny and you are the operator creating all the revenue, there's a lot of physical stress that comes in, into play with that. And guess what? You aren't going to be able to do that your entire life. You aren't going to be able to be there at 70, 80 years old pushing a mower for 10 to 12 hours a day. You cannot stay in this state for very long. And if you do get to the stage where you need to sell because you're at, all, all, your size may be 100000 in revenue, now you have, do not have a sellable asset. No one wants to buy a job where they have to go work 10 to 12 hours outside. It's like, hey, I got this great proposal. I'm going to sell you this thing, and you're going to work outside for 10 to 12 hours a day. Who really wants that? There's not a lot of enterprise value if your business is at zero to 200000 in revenue. So I encourage you, ask yourself and be self-aware enough to realize what type of stress are you willing to work inside of. It's not a matter of if I grow, it gets better. Don't buy into that theology. It's stupid, it's dumb, leads to a lot of burnout. If you look at people online, they'll you know, start growing their company and it's like, yeah, look at me, I got all these trucks, I got these, and all of a sudden, look at a few years later, they go back to being by themselves. You know why? Because they couldn't take this different level of stress once they broke into that second category. And they start, they'll say things like this, I was making, making just as much by myself as I was with four or five guys. You're right. They've entered into the financial stress of that second stage. And so it's a matter of what type of stress do you want? If you have a physical limitation, it does not mean you need to close your business down. It need, might mean you just need to grow so you can hire people and get into a different type of stress instead of physical stress, because you can no longer take the physical stress. And for some people, they'll grow into this and they'll be very happy, and I'll tell them, do not grow here, because psychologically you cannot take people calling in every single day. You cannot take the pressure of having 10, 15, 20, 30 employees. There's a lot of stress that comes with that and has nothing to do with physical stress, nothing to do with financial stress, but guess what? It is stress nonetheless. And so when it comes to growing a company, the biggest question I have for you is, what type of stress do you operate inside of the best? Okay. It's not to say that one is better or one is worse or you should get to this certain size of business. This is a perfect size. That is the perfect size for that person. And you've got to ask only yourself can make the determination of what type of stress and size of company can I operate inside of and be most profitable and hopefully just keep your, just stay alive from all the stress that is going on. It can get overwhelming. So uh, one of the things that happened to me as we were growing our company um, way back, let me really give you a quick story of me, just so you know where I'm coming from. You have, most of you have no idea who I am, and you're like, this child is up there talking to us. It's okay, I understand. I got my booster seat out in the... Okay, so, uh, so I, I, when I was 11 years old, I started mowing lawns, and the reason I did that is because... Here, one second. Uh, still getting used to this Melbourne weather. You're supposed to be like nice over in Australia. My mom's from Western Australia, by the way. She's from Perth. 
She moved over to the U.S., got hitched with my dad. Anyways, so I was 11 years old, started mowing lawns, and I did that because my family didn't have money. Um, my parents and grandparents never really went to college. Uh, there, we were always renting, and we moved something like 25 times by the time I was 18 years old. Uh, my dad was a minister, still is, and so we over the place. We never really had a house, things like that. So anyways, I saw like college and education my, my way out. So I want to become a doctor. So I want to become either a heart surgeon or a brain surgeon. That was like the two things I wanted to do. So I was 11 years old, knew I was going to be in school for a very long time. So I tried to get through uh, my primary school years as fast as possible. So I actually went to college when I was 13. Started college when I was 13. I mowed lawns all throughout college so I could pay for college. Over in the U.S., we have to pay for it, bless their hearts. So I was able to do that. And uh, I was 18 years old, decided I was not going to go into my medical, medical uh, go to medical school. Uh, because I'd gone to Africa for six weeks, done a whole bunch of operations and surgeries. It was the best thing ever. Came back to the U.S., did a bunch of shadowing with a bunch of physicians, and realized I was going to be stuck doing the same four or five operations for the next 40 years of my career, and that did not seem super appealing to me, uh, especially if you do brain surgery or you know heart surgery. It's not, it's not like next day you can do your foot surgery and then go to best someone's back. If you're new one's specialty, you're kind of in it for the long haul, right? So I was like, I can't see myself doing this for the next 40 years of my life. Um, and keep my sanity. So I said, you know what? I'm going to take this lawn care thing. I'm going to scale it up. So that's when I started Augusta Lawn Care. I was about eight years ago when I was 18 years old. I got my master's in business administration at night while I was starting that up the first couple years. And uh, we scaled it up very quickly to this size. Within the first couple years, uh, the third year, we were past 800000 in revenue. And the psychological stress that I was going through, as is expected now that I look back on it, was, was a lot because... When you start getting employees, the worst thing is, like, why don't they just do the job correctly? Like, how hard is it? It's a weed whacker and a mower. Straight lines. Like, how hard is it? Right? It's like, weed whacker, rocks, no touchy, window, no go. Um, how hard is it? Like, how many broken windows do we need to figure out that rocks do not equal well with a weed wh whacker? Anyways, you guys call it, what, a weed whip? Whippersniffer, you guys are crazy. All right, so, uh, so, a trimmer. That's easier. I like that. So, grew it up relatively quickly, and the psychological stress of just like employees, they can't do the job right. They're not efficient enough. It's like, okay, I did 15 jobs in one day, and you did like three or four. Like, what is going on? Oh no, I worked hard all day. Oh yeah, I was just working really hard, you know. And then you tr start tracking their truck, and they stopped at, like four gas stations. There was 30 minutes in between a place that was a, a mile apart from each, uh, sorry, a kilometer apart from each other. And you're like, what in the world? And that creates psychological stress because now every single time you don't see your employees, there's this like thing in your head. Maybe they're not working hard. You see them on their phone, like, oh, what are they doing on Snapchat? What are they doing? On, are they watching a YouTube video? Like, there's that constant stress now of you as the owner being worried about all these people inside your company that are going to tear your company down. And your, your constant thought is like, why can't they just do it like me? Right? You want to have, have the answer to that? Here's the answer. Here's why your employees don't think like an owner. There's two things you need to think like an owner. You need the information of an owner and you need to be compensated like an owner. So until you're going to give the same compensation that you get to your employees, do not expect them to think and operate like you. Everyone's like, oh, they, they should be doing a better job. They should, I do it like so much faster and so much more efficient, so much better. Great, you're getting paid a lot more than they are and you have equity. So if you want your employees to think and operate like owners, we've got to figure out a way and a system to compensate them like an owner. Oh, and by the way, the information like an owner, which means the reason that you do so well every single day is because you aren't just thinking about the 10 jobs in your schedule. You're thinking about the fact that you have all these other uh, uh, customers tomorrow. You have to get them done today. You're thinking about how do I upsell on every single job as you're mowing the grass, you're looking at uh, gutters, uh, mulch, I can trim those bushes. You're constantly thinking like an owner because you have the information. You came here for training for an entire week and yet your employee, you throw them on a truck after one hour and expect to have the information of an owner. We're training for an entire week here just to become a franchisee, and yet our employees, we give them 10 minutes. And, uh, here, here's your uniform. Here's the seat. Sit in the seat. Let's drive. That's, that's your orientation for the day. 
How do we expect them to operate as efficiently as us, as owners, without the information of an owner? And so the two things that we talk a lot about at Augusta, and you know, if you listen to my content, this is like old news to you, but uh, it's okay. Um, so <laughs> I don't know why you guys always spray to like erase, dry erase stuff, but we don't ever do that. Like, and now I understand why, because it doesn't work otherwise. Okay, so anyways. Um, what was I talking about? Did you just the What's that? Did you just permanent marker the whiteboard? I sure hope not. Whoever puts permanent markers around our dry erase mark, they deserve. Oh, you know what's really cool? Okay, if you know this, you gotta let me know. If you put a permanent marker on a whiteboard, do you know how to get it off? Oh, you do? You do? Oh, sick. See, this was new information to me a couple weeks ago, and it blew my mind. You take a dry erase marker, you draw over the permanent marker, and the permanent marker will come off when you wipe it off. Wow. Is that the craziest thing? It blew my mind. <laughs> just saying, I just had to share that wisdom, that pearl of knowledge. Okay, so uh, two things, knowledge, uh, the information of an owner and the compensation of owner. So it's like, obviously we can't give them equity to every single employee. You literally have a big legal issue on your hands. Obviously we can't pay them like owners because you can't pay them $100,000 a year to push a mower. Obviously, we can't give them all the information and tell them every single thing and spend an entire week doing onboarding with them because by the time they left, they would have just got started because the average person now in our industry, at least in the US, is like less than two months. They're staying with an entry-level position like mowing. So two things, information, compensation. How do we do this? So there's two different systems we use, and I highly recommend both of these if you have employees and you're trying to scale up your business and you want to alleviate some of these pressures that come in stages two and three. Number one is what we call pay for performance. This is how you pay them like an owner. Because every single day, this is the strain between you and your employees. The faster the job gets done, you make more money. The faster the job gets done, if they're getting paid by the hour, the less money the employee makes. Think about it. If that job takes five hours, you want it done in three. But if they take five, they make more money. They are literally incentivized to make the job take longer. Isn't that like the most counterintuitive craziness in the whole world? Like, hey guys, go be faster, be faster. But they're being paid more the longer the job takes. Again, you're being compensated like an owner, which is the faster and more efficiently that job gets done to the level of satisfaction to the customer, you get paid more money. How can we do that for an employee? Something we call pay for performance, where they get a percentage of all the labor revenue that they earn for the company every single day. So if the job is $600 and we give them 33% of labor revenue, they're making $200 on that job, regardless of how long it takes them to do it. I don't care if it takes them three hours or 10 hours, they're still getting $200 for that job. Essentially what all of us do as business owners, go ahead. Uh, what the quality degrade if, uh, if they're rushing? Mm -hmm. Yep, so we have what we call yellow slips. So you have two things that you gotta monitor, right? Quality and quantity. P for P, pay for performance, incentivize, incentivizes quantity, like yeah. go faster. The other side of that that has to be balanced is what we call yellow slips, which means they can lose money if there's callbacks, damage cases, right. and things like that. So if someone has a survey and it goes out and it's a complaint, P for P is gone the performance dollars that they get. It's all gone. We have a, what we call base pay, so they can't make less than a certain amount per hour, yeah. but we are constantly trying to make them make 40, 50% above that, because that's where their incentive is at. Anything above base pay is on the table if they're doing poor quality. Okay. By doing this, now you don't have to worry about where they're at. I don't care if they're on their phone. That's up to them. Now it's determining how fast they want to work. They make more money, the faster they work, the more efficiently they work. I don't really care now about uh, new employees taking weeks and weeks and weeks to get trained. You know why? Because the person they're working with wants them trained up as fast as possible and being efficient as possible because now they're on the same route and they're splitting wages for the day. Okay? So how do I create this financial or start to alleviate the financial and psychological stress that comes along with growing a business? You have systems in place. And you have to have a system for how do I get my employees to be compensated like an owner. I also need a system to be able to have my employees start to have the information that I have. It's what we call open book management. It's nothing new or exciting. Basically all it means is you have an open book. The employees can ask for any number in the business and you will give it to them. They know how much we charge. 
We know, they know our hourly rate. They know our markup on materials. They know our profit and loss. We go over every single month. They understand the numbers of the business. They understand how much we spend on insurance, marketing, everything, including my pay. There's nothing they don't know. So when they go to a customer, they have all the information that an owner would have, and I can expect them to perform at that level. All right? So again, having systems in place are going to allow the financial and psychological stresses and fears that you have currently to be circumnavigated using a system. And we use P4P and open book management a lot. I know like a bunch of eyeballs are crossing, which means there's questions. So if you have a question, just raise your hand. Do you want me to go deeper in P4P, pay for performance? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, you mentioned the, um, if there's any callback on quality or compliance, how do you dock the, the casual or the contract? Absolutely. So the uh, question was if there are quality issues. Yeah, thank you, Joel. Yeah, I got you, bro. So if, there, if there's quality issues, how do you dock the pay? So um, you can do this inside of Excel. We have a software called p4psoftware.com. You can try it out for free. Um, but if you, the, the, the gist of it is you bas bas basically make a mark of how much that time was. So for example, you make a mistake on a Friday afternoon, make a big skid mark with a mower. I go back Monday and I spend half an hour fixing your mistake. I'm going to be paid half an hour's wages at base pay. So let's just say we pay someone $20 base pay. They can't make less than that. $10 is going to go to me and that $10 is coming off of your paycheck. Every single day now, you're going to look at how much revenue this person produced. Here's the one third or whatever percentage you're giving them on P for P and then are there any manual uh, adjustments. And that can go negative, yellow slip, damage cases, I broke a sprinkler head, whatever it might be. Or it can be positive for things like sharpening blades or other mechanical stuff that you're having them do that are not producing revenue and you don't want that to penalize them. So that would be a manual adjustment in a positive direction. Yep. Cool. Did you have another question about P for P? Uh, that was, yeah, similar. So you're saying that if I have a staff that might hang back off the books for free, but we sharpen blades and cover up fuel, etc. that you're going to financially reward them essentially and we performance in your books. Is that what you're saying? You're yeah. Yeah, so basically every single day they're going to produce revenue, right? Yeah. I'm going to give them a set percentage of that every single day. At the end of that day, let's say they do sharpening blades. Well, they're not producing any revenue. So it's kind of being held, like they're technically doing it for free unless I manually adjust them. So what we do is we say, hey, look, if you're gonna sharpen the blades for an hour, let us know. We put on a whiteboard or in a, a, a clipboard. They sign off on it, the manager does. That hour at base pay gets tacked on to their P for P, their performance dollars for that day. It's every single day. And then they get a report the next day of what they earned yesterday. You want to get that. You want to get the uh, the compensation as close to the performance as possible. I don't like the whole like, oh, we do quarterly bonuses. Like, I'm sorry, but entry level people are not thinking about two months from now and incentive. They are not thinking about that. They need it now. That's why they go get jobs. If they thought about three months down the road or a year or five years down the road, they'd go start their own business. All right. And so what we do is on P4P, the software sends them an email every single day. Uh, for the day prior and breaks down their what they made on hourly and what they made on P4P. So every single day they get this reinforcement of, oh, I made 60 or $70 extra because I worked harder yesterday. Oh, sick. I made negative P4P dollars because I had a $400 window that I just broke. And I know it's going to hurt me for the next week. I'm not going to be able to make any additional money. Right? Or potentially I crushed a massive project and literally some of our guys make $40, $50 an hour because of P4P. They figure out, okay, instead of going through the, the gate, Let's just remove this fence panel and we'll get through way faster. Like, didn't think of that. Yep, go for it. And now they're going to make a crushing on P4P. Whereas if they're hourly, they'll be like, yeah, we'll just keep going through the gate. It'll take us two extra days. But guess what? I make more money the longer the job takes. So why would I not do that? All, right? All of a sudden, I don't have to manage when they do breaks, when they clock in and out, when, if they're on their phone, if they stop for, for, uh, for gas or for lunch. or I don't care. I don't care about your lunch break. Take as long a lunch break as you want. Just realize that you're not going to make as much money. And that's totally up to you. I'm not going to track your truck anymore. I'm not going to be, hey, how are you doing? I'm not going to roll up on them and see how they're doing at a job site just to see if they're working hard. I don't care. If, they don't, if you don't want to work hard, you're just not going to make as much money. All right. The last, like, uh, in our market, for example, the, the first location, $17, $18 per hour is kind of starting wage for lawn care entry level. 
Our guys last pay period were making 26, 27 average. People making over $30 an hour pushing a lawnmower. And they earned every single dollar of it because they, they start getting really efficient at looking at their schedule the night before, figuring out what equipment needs to go on the truck. Oh, and they start to realize that if I don't put the equipment on the truck and I have to drive back to the shop, that costs me money. And the guy that's sitting next to me in my truck, he better be efficient too. And I'm going to keep on top of him because he's affecting my paycheck. So I don't have to manage anybody anymore because now they're managing each other because now it's affecting their pay. All right? Cool. Yeah. But what happens if you've scheduled that crew for 10 jobs, they get through five because they just can't be bothered working efficiently and quick. What happens to those other five jobs that your clients are waiting to be serviced? How Can do you deal with that? Yeah, so the question is, if you have 10 jobs, they only get done five, the question is, how do I deal with that? Okay, so if you're on hourly, how would you deal with that? If you were paying someone by the hour, what would you do? Just put them off the note tomorrow? Well, I've already got a schedule for tomorrow, so like, it, it, it disrupts my week. Like, yeah. I, I have to move some of these jobs, maybe one or two the next day, mm -hmm maybe one or two the following week. Yeah, in our line of work, there's gonna be always times where you have to move jobs off. Um, the, the difference is now they are incentivized to get as many of those jobs done as possible in the day. Uh, and they're actually, they'll make more money if they get the 10 done versus the five. Whereas right now the frustration is, you know they need to get 10 done and you're like, guys, work harder. And they're like, why? Because I'll just be on overtime tomorrow, right? So with P for P, the incentive is, they would now have an incentive to get the all 10 done and they'd make more money if they did it that way. So there's going to be always times things like weather. There's always things out of our control. Check, check one. It's useless. Quality. Um, so there's always going to be things that we, you know, are out of our control and the guys just have to kind of take that with the, the good. The bad comes with the good. There's always going to be a week where we just have rain the entire week and it's really difficult for them to hit above base pay. Um, but yeah, now there's an incentive for them to get those jobs done. But say they don't care about the incentive today. They, they, if there's one person in your entire crew that does, it'll push everyone else out. Because yeah, yeah. they will not want to work with them. So when you get a larger crew, it's easier, right? So for example, right now, the local shop, they have about 15 to 20 guys working. If there's someone new comes along and is not money motivated and just wants to slack off, I will know about it within two hours and they'll be fired with by, by noon the first day. Because they know we won't tolerate it and none of the guys want to work with them. Like, they will, no one will want to train them. So, it gets pushed out, flushed out really fast. Because in the hourly system, what happens is you get to know that in about two months. Oh yeah, he's the guy who's lazy. You, no one cares because it doesn't affect their paycheck. Have you seen uh, increase in like trying to pay for pay? and individuals going out to start their own thing because they've got more knowledge on how to run the business? Great question. Question is, do you see more people going and starting their own business if, um, with that type of having all the information, being incentivized like an owner? A hundred percent. And I love every single one of them. Because if they're that good of a person, I'm just thrilled to get anything out of them. Because if they're really that good and they're working in an hourly position, they're not going to be with you very long anyways. And so we actually tell our crew day one, we do not want you to work here for more than two to three years. We tell them that. If we, we do not want you to be mowing grass in two to three years. We want you to either become a manager or go oh, become a franchisee. And we're going to give you all the information and the training to get there because I know that if I can keep someone for even two or three years that that is an owner type level of skill, I'm thrilled out of my mind. So we actually waive all our franchise fees for them if they stay with a company for two years. And we have lots of guys, we call it the 3F program, franchise fee forgiveness. They don't have to pay anything if they work somewhere for two years. And we have multiple young guys going through that program. It's really cool. Most like fulfilling thing you'll ever do as an owner. So with your locations that you do, obviously you have some corporate locations and franchise locations. Your franchise locations, how many employees on average would be working for a franchisee? Yeah, the question is average number of employees at our franchisees. I'd uh, say so the average around four, four to five right now. Um, you know, it goes as high as 20, and then there's guys just getting started. But, yeah. Cool. I guess, just sorry. Yeah, he's good. That, with, um, you spoke about the training you give to uh, new franchises to scale. What does that involve? Uh, sort of what structures are you teaching them in terms of like setting up their franchise? It's not about going to my lawns off the bat. It's about how do I structure my business to have uh, team members, managers, office managers. What sort of training does that involve? Yeah. 
Great question. Uh, question is, how do we do training in terms of the, the scaling up side of things? So the, the big thing that all of you uh, have at gyms that's a really big plus is so many people having wanting work. You have a massive amount of unserviced leads. You have a massive amount of brand awareness in Australia. Here's the question. Who here wants to grow, but the, uh, who here wants to grow their business and get more employees, for example? Raise hands. Cool. Keep them up, keep them up, keep them up. Okay, so now lower your hand if you want to grow your business, we established that, but now you don't have enough leads. Put your hand down. Okay, so totally different. Okay, thank you. Put your hands down. So getting more leads is not the issue. For us, we talk a lot about marketing and getting more leads. Lots of Facebook ads, Google ads. We have like a whole training on that. Um, for you here, if leads are not the problem, it's 100% hiring. Remember, we talked about the two things that are going to grow your business, right? Sales and hiring. The only thing you need to figure out is hiring and you'll scale up in gyms, in my opinion. Uh, and so I know, understand that the economic climate here is a little bit different. L cost of labor is different, but systems are pretty much universal. We have multiple gyms owners using uh, P4P, for example, uh, from the software side of things. But the bottom line is if you can figure out hiring, you will scale up very quickly inside the system, in my opinion. And so how we train, though, is a lot more on the marketing side to generate the leads. And then a lot of, you know, how do you do hiring, training, onboarding. Like For example, like I, I mentioned it really quickly, first day of onboarding with your employees, if it is literally, and this happens in larger companies, like your first few employees, you'll probably do a great job of onboarding. Great job of orientation. But when you start having a churn of employees, like they last two or three weeks, they last a month, and now you're getting behind on work, this is what starts to happen when you're behind on work. Okay, great, I hired you, fantastic. Here's a shirt, hop in the truck, I'll show you as we go. Like that starts to get very dangerous. So even having an orientation system, what do I do the first day? We have a four page document where you have to read it line by line with the owner. Things like, how do I ask for time off? What is considered late? Because some people don't know what that is. Like, when is start time? When is late? If, it's, if I, like, it literally says this in our in our in the four page document that we make them sign and read word for word with the manager. It is start time is at 7:30 a.m. This means that 7:31 is late. Like you would think that's kind of intuitive, but it's not necessarily for some people. Um, and so, you know, things like orientation, your hiring systems are, are extremely important. I feel like in, in gyms, that is the number one thing you have to focus on. How do I create a system around my employees and making them as profitable as me? So if there's a fear, if there's a fear from going from here to here, it's almost always around hiring and management of people. Because in my opinion, we'll get a business from zero to 500,000 in annual revenue is just someone who can sell really good. And in my opinion, gyms is taking care of that. You guys don't have to, like your cost per lead, is like nothing. If I was you guys and I wanted to grow, I'm just being perfectly honest after coming through a whole week of training, I would be buying every single lead. Like if you look at the cost, oh man, this is gonna be fun. All right, let's run some math. Who loves math? Oh man, this is horrible. Okay, hold on a second. Okay, so we're gonna run the math of running a, a lead real quick. Um, because like as, as we were talking about it in training, uh, some of the presenters are like, yeah, I haven't taken a lead you know, in, in five years or whatever. I was like, that's great. But for people that want to grow their business, your cost per lead is so small here. I would buy every single one of your leads, every single one. If I could come here and have, I need to be wrapping up right now, don't I? Five? Okay, cool. So um, uh, if, if I came here and I had a million dollars, I'd buy all of your leads every single day without any question. Because let's just say the average in mowing is what, 20 bucks? A lead. Huh? A lead. A lead. Like $12. $12? What's like average though, 15? $15 per lead. Okay, this is gonna be great math, okay. Oh man, this is so fantastic. If you guys run the math in this, you will buy every single lead from gyms from now till eternity, as long as you can hire people. That is the denominator that all you have to focus on because you have this. This is unheard of. Like I'm just saying, I'm just being honest, perfect honest. I am willing to pay $50, five zero, for a lead and I would do that every single day of the week. You guys are getting these for 15. This is, this is crazy, crazy, crazy. I'm just being honest. So let's just run the math on this, okay? $15 per lead. So how you wanna look at um, marketing in general is, if this is like way over your head, just like scream at me. Oh, microphone. This? Whoa. 
You don't like the sound of that? Oh, okay, okay, got it. Cool. Um, so this is how you want to think about marketing, okay? In the top, you have clicks. Typically, if you're spending money on Facebook ads, Google ads, if you're putting out mail drops, whatever it is, you got clicks, people come into your site, people giving the, the phone center a ring, whatever it might be. What that's going to do is you're going to get a cost per click, okay? Now this is, again, remember that over half of your leads are coming from digital. So there is a thing called cost per click. How much do you have to spend in order to get someone to click? If that does not make sense to you, don't worry, because you guys don't even have to worry about clicking and your website at all, okay? So there's cost per click, okay? Then you have what's called, and again, your SEO team here, the web, web guys I talked to yesterday, they probably freak out about this stuff all the time, and that is their conversion ratio, okay? That is how many people come to the website and then convert into a lead, okay? That's a big number they track. They figure out like where the boxes go and where should we put the phone number and all that garbage. Don't have to worry about that either. The other thing you guys have to worry about is you have a cost per lead. So you have a click that comes in, that gives you a cost per click. You have a conversion ratio, a percentage of those clicks become a lead. That gives you your cost per lead. You all have the beautiful, most incredible thing by having a fixed cost per lead of $15. I tell my franchisees if they get that under five zero fifty to pour money on that all day long. Here's the math behind that, all right? So cost per lead is 15. What is your average close ratio? Like 50%? Out of the leads that you get, how many of them do you close? Okay, let's be really conservative. You guys are like too good for me, okay? Let's just assume a, con a close ratio of 50%, okay? So let's just say it's me and I'm super bad at my job, I only get 50% close ratio, okay? Now if you're 80, 90%, guess what you should be doing? Raising your prices or hiring. If you're not doing those, one of those two things, you are in stalemate in your business. You either be raising your prices and making more margin, or you must be hiring and growing. That's why people turn off leads. They're not willing to do one of those two things. Either raise their price or hire. In, in action, either directions, you'll turn off your leads. In my opinion, personal opinion, outside, third party, maybe Jim should never hear this again, you should never turn off your leads. Ever, 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 as long as you don't, as long as you want to keep growing the business. Okay? Close ratio. I'm trying to go as fast as I possibly can. All right. Okay, you want me to just pause? Okay, we'll finish the funnel, then we'll come back. Close ratio, 50%. What that means is we are, our customer acquisition cost is going to equal what? Let's go. All right, $15 divided by 50%, customer acquisition cost of $30. That's nuts. I just want you to all be very clear. $30 customer acquisition cost is incredible. You say, why is that? Because what I can do is I can spend, if I know that this number is fixed at $30, if I know, you guys have this fixed, if you know this number, you can calculate this. Let's just assume a $30 customer acquisition cost. Give me two minutes. $30, $30 for a, a single lead. Let's go get 100 customers. 100 customers, all right? What would I have to spend in marketing to get 100 customers? $3,000, all right? $3,000 I'm going to spend in order to get 100 customers. How much do you spend? How much do you get on average uh, for a cut? 40 bucks? 45? 45, $50 per cut for mowing? Okay, let's just assume that every single year you make about $1,000 per customer on mowing and then another $1,000 per customer on like other services, leaf cleanup, mulch, etc. So now we're going to have $2,000 in annual revenue per customer, okay? Whoops, not take that out. Ah, oh, sick. So we have two thousand. We have two thousand dollars as the annual value per customer. Very clear. If I get a hundred of that, I'm gonna get a two hundred thousand dollar business off of three thousand dollars spend. Oh, and by the way, I'm gonna be able to keep seventy to eighty percent of these next year, and I won't be spending any money on marketing. That's the beautiful thing about recurring services is as long as you do good customer service and everyone in this room does because you have a five star rating, this 200,000 will become 200,000 next year and the year after that and the year after that and it'll keep growing the company. The fact of the matter is you spent $3,000 and in the first year to 200,000 in annual revenue. If you just have a 20% 20 uh, 20 uh, profit margin, that would mean that this is a $40,000 in profit business. You just turn $3,000 into $40,000. Why would you ever turn your leads off if you want to grow your business? And on that note, thank you very much. Back to you.
Don't worry, we'll have Mike back on as well after lunch, so he's got a lot to get through as well. So thank you very much, Mike. We, we put him on the spot when he came out. We actually saw him in the crowd and knew he was really good. But in the lunch break, I recommend you go to YouTube, check out um, mikeandys.com, lawncarebusiness.com.au, sorry, .com. All the stuff that you're learning now, he's got a plethora of YouTube videos. So Mike Andys, Google him, put him into YouTube. So next up, we've got Dan Kale. So we're sticking to a schedule. So Dan Kale will take us through to 12.50. Dan Kale is one of our trainers now. So if you have done the course recently, you will have had seen Dan through training. If not, Dan Kale has gone from franchisee to franchisor and, and trainer in pretty quick succession. And Dan's built a large business as well. So he's going to take us through to lunch at 12.50. Then after 12.50... We're going to have Mike Handys come back on as well. So if you do have questions for Mike, Thanks, maybe Mike. write them down, and then after the lunch break, ask Mike anything you'd like as well. So I hand it over to Dan. Thanks, Dan. Oh, thanks. Thanks, guys. Uh, I don't know about you guys, but that was just like there was just so much to take in there, mate. Uh, there's a lot, a lot of knowledge there. I don't know how I'm going to beat that. I don't think anyone should expect me to come anywhere close to that. Uh, so no, that was that was awesome. You've just you know blown my mind. Um, all right, so I'll give you guys a bit of a rundown. Um, I've been with gyms for coming on five years soon. Um, I started up as a franchisee, um, was getting trained by Mike Davenport back when I was a franchisee. Um, and so when I come on board, I come on board because I was in a terrible financial position uh, when I decided to join gym. So I'd gone out and I'd bought this house um, right across the road from my mum and uh, from, sorry, my wife's mum and dad's house. Um, and the reason I'd done that was because I've seen how unhappy she was. Um, she was always she was always driving to and from our house, which was in Caram Downs. I don't know if many of you guys know that area, to her, to um, to her parents' place. Um, and you know, everything was sort of rocky. We had we had a kid and another one on the way, and I seen that she was happiest when she was around her her family. So I went, well, I've I've got to do something now. Me and her worked at McDonald's at the time, um, which anyone here would know, it's it's not great money. Um, at all. And so I went and bought this house literally right across the street from her mum and dad's place and uh, sort of like Everybody Loves Raymond, if anyone knows that show. Um, and this, this place, uh, it cost me an arm and a leg. It was $1,000 a week, the mortgage repayments on it. And working at McDonald's, both of us, uh, with a kid and another one on the way, uh, well, I didn't really do the math correctly and it just wasn't going to work. Um, so I had, this, I had to make a change. Um, and I was like, all right, well, what can I do to be able to earn me some more money? What am I going to possibly do? Um, and so I started thinking, well, maybe I can do a trade. Uh, but that, very soon after, I realized, well, I'd need to be an apprentice for four years. It's not possible. So I started thinking, all right, well, I've got to make a change. Right now is the time. I've always sort of wanted to run my own business. However, I know nothing at all, zero, about running a business. So I was like, well, it sounds like a good idea to me. Let's give it a crack. Um, so I... Uh, <laughs> So I uh, start looking around for different businesses. Um, you know, all these thoughts going through my head. Do I get a cafe? Do I get a fish and chip shop? Rah, rah, you know, just constantly thinking about it. And I was like, what can I possibly afford? Now, we had about 50 grand sitting aside um, that we, because we'd sold our house. Um, we'd put a deposit on this new house and we had 50 grand spare from it. Um, and so this 50 grand wasn't going to last very long, not with the mortgage that I had and another child on the way. Um, and so I started thinking, well, I really don't know anything about business. What's something simple that I can do? What's something that I, I'm not going to stuff up? And so I come to the idea of, well, I, I, knew, I knew a family member that had a son that was out there mowing lawns and, this, and he was about 12 years old. And I went, well, if a 12 year old can do it, I reckon I can do it. And so <laughs> that was basically the basis behind it. So I went, all right, well, lawn mowing sounds all right. What are the pros to it? And so I went, well, grass always grows. There's always weeds there. So, oh, Everything in nature, there's always going to be something that grows. Trees, hedges, whatever it bloody well is. So there's always, this is a very safe industry. Um, and at the time, I, I think everyone was pretty worried, and people still are, that we're you know, worried we'll go into a recession and industries will just completely fail. Um, so I went, well, this seems like a very safe industry. I mean, it's always going to be there. Um, and so then I went, well, what else, what else do I need to think about? And then I realized that the expenses weren't all that much in it. And so I went, well, this is something I'm probably not going to fail at. Um, so... I'll, I'll, I'll take a look into this a bit more. So I call up gyms, and the reason I called up gyms was quite simply, uh, when I thought of lawn mowing, I thought of gyms mowing. It was just hand in hand. Like when I think of a hamburger, I think of McDonald's, same thing with gyms mowing. Um, so I call up gyms mowing, and I figured, well, it's already gonna be, I reckon this is something I'm not gonna fail at already. Can everyone hear me all right? Yep. Yep. Cool, all right, no worries. Yeah, my wife always says that I've got a very loud voice, so hopefully uh, that's a benefit today. Um, so, I uh, 
yeah, I call them up and I go, well, they, they must have some sort of way to be able to make it easier for me. They're the, the industry leader. They have more work than anyone else. And that was sort of the one thing that was always playing on my mind. How am I going to find the work? I know it's out there. I know it's out there. How am I going to get in front of these people to get that work? Because there's all these different independents driving around nonstop. Dales, mowing, lawn and garden, care, Chelsea, whatever it bloody well is. And so I went, well, I'll call them up and I'll see what they can do for me. So sure enough, I call up Jim's mowing. And I get, on the, uh, I get on the phone to him and they say, franchise, the franchisor is going to call you back within two hours. Cool, cool. No worries. He calls me back within two hours and I have to hit, endure this long spiel, this whole full sales pitch. And I was just like, all right, yep, cool. All, whew, all over my head. Um, but he said one thing to me that really got me going. And he said to me, he goes, we have a guarantee, a paid for work guarantee. So if you don't make at least $1,500, we'll pay it to you. Um, as long as you, as long as you do the pay for work guarantee. And as soon as I heard that, I went, ding, ding, ding. All right, that's sounding good because my mortgage is a thousand dollars. I need something to be able to pay this mortgage. Um, and this is going to be able to help alleviate that pressure. I'm not going to have to go and get a trade and, and wait four years. So sure enough, I sign up. Um, now my first, first week in, I've done the training at national. I've done all that. You know, I've written down everything I possibly can. Uh, first week in, um, I knew nothing about using any lawn mowers, certainly not commercials. I'd gone out for a day with a bloke, uh, another franchisee. Um, I, knew, I didn't know how to brush cut, didn't know how to blow, didn't know anything. Didn't know how to talk to customers, um, didn't know how to quote. And um, yeah, so sure enough, I was like, well, I must be ready, let's go do it. And so first week in, um, I'm working, and I, this is the one thing that I had. This is the one thing I knew I had. I knew I could work hard, and I knew I had to do whatever it took to make it work because I put my family in this position where we were financially stuffed. And so I had, I had no choice. I had to make this work. Um, and so the first week in, I'd work seven days that week, um, nonstop. I'd stuffed up many jobs. I'd got several complaints. Um, I was terrible. Um, and um, I'd ripped myself off several, several quotes and done these jobs that I was spending all these hours at. Um, but still, at the end of the week, by the Sunday, I'd, I'd made $3,600 for that week. And uh, knowing that, I'd gone, yes, like, finally, I've found something that I'm going to be able to see if I can make this work. So anyways, I'd spoken to the franchisees at our meeting. The meeting had come up, told them all, you know, I'd made 3600 in my first week. And I get a lot of, there was a lot of hate from it, actually, believe it or not. They were like, that's not possible. You can't possibly make 3600 in your first week. I've never done that in a week, rah, rah. And so I was like, well, no, it's true. I just worked really, really bloody hard. And so I explained to him, I worked from seven o'clock in the morning till it got dark. And then I went home and then I was stuffed. And then I had to help in a bath and, you know, sleep for 10 hours and go and do it the next day. And so because these guys were like, no, nah, it's not true, rah, rah, won't happen again. Well, that then gave me some sort of motive to be like, hey, screw you guys. <laughs> I'm going to do it again. And so next week I went out there. Now, the, the issue is with the next week is I didn't have any work on because stupid me decided not to do any marketing that first week. I was too busy focusing on doing the work. Um, so I had no, I had no jobs um, for that next week. So I had to learn how to market and I had to learn how to do it quick. Now, I, the word marketing to me, it was like from another planet. I had no idea what it bloody well was. Uh, as I said, I was 24 years old at the time. And uh, at 24, I don't know about what you guys were like, but... Um, yeah, I wasn't all that bright. I had no idea about anything, much less business or marketing. Um, so I spoke with my franchisor and he said, have you got all your leads turned on? Oh, no, I've got them on for local. We'll put them on for all areas. All right, cool. Um, he goes, have you gone through the unserviced report? I go, I don't even know what the bloody hell the unserviced report is. Um, so does everyone in here know what the unserviced report is? Yep. You just know how to find it as well? Yep, cool, good. Okay, cool. Yeah, you were like me. Uh, all right, so unserviced report, you go into Jim's online. Um, there's a few tabs up the top. One of them will say reports. You drop down that tab and you'll have unserviced leads. Go into that and then choose a time frame. So I usually chose three months back. So I'd go from, you know, August till, I don't know, what, June? Um, and then I'd go, all right, my, my division only. Um, and then I'd untick so that it was... Uh, so I'd see every, all the regions, but for my division only, and then update it, and you'll see all the unservice reports, uh, unservice leads come through. And then you can basically cherry pick through them and choose whichever one you want. You'll pay the uh, same fee as a normal lead fee. Um, so sure enough, I went through this unservice report, started cherry picking jobs through there. Um, and then I went out and um, you know, we, had, we had business cards at the time, um, and we had flyers. We had business cards and flyers. So I went and did letterbox drops 
all around my neighborhood, non-stop. So I'd work as many hours as I possibly could throughout the day for as many jobs that I had. I would have kept working if I had more jobs, but I didn't have more jobs. So I'd go on out and I'd do like two hours worth of work for a day or whatever it was. And so I had this thing in my head where I was like, I felt guilty if I wasn't working at least eight hours a day. There was this sort of guilt to it because I wasn't doing as much as I possibly could. Um, so for the next six hours, I'd go out and I'd do letterbox drops um, throughout all the streets. And it sucked. It really did. But uh, me and my wife would do it. We had our pram and, you know, going and doing all the streets. She'd have the car and drive up to the end of the street by the time I'd done that one. Um, and so we're doing all these letterbox drops. And uh, I'd also gone out and I'd spoken with a couple of real estate agents in my area. Um, but I didn't call them up. I, I, my franchisor, um, Jeff, he, he told me um, to, go and, to go and see them face to face. And um, so I went in there face to face, presented well, I've got me business cards, got me flyers, you know, all eager, trying to, trying to win as many jobs as I possibly can and uh, start making relationships with them. And, and sure enough, they actually gave me a few jobs. Um, and so that next week from doing that nonstop, seven days a week again, from seven o'clock in the morning till dark, um, I went out and I made $3,650 that week. So I made $50 more. And it was just this incredible feeling of relief. I can't even explain it. It was kind of like, I've just hit the golden ticket. I know I can work hard. I know I can do this. And now I can take care of my family. I just have to keep doing this. Um, and so I, uh, I realized that from, from doing all this marketing, you know, the business cards, they were all right. They weren't bad. Um, but they weren't as good as what they could have been for doing the, the letterbox drops. And I realized I could do a better job of marketing because I hadn't done any marketing the week before. So I'd only done marketing through the week to be able to build sales for that week, which is how I got the 3,650. Now, the bene benefit of that is the next week, well, I had more jobs coming through for the next week because I'd done marketing. And so I realized, well, if I keep doing this, hopefully, if I keep on continuing to do my local area marketing, finding new ways, um, bringing work on and filling up this week and then trying to fill up the next week as well, well, I'll, I'll make more money. And sure enough, that's what I did. So I went out and every week I was pushing myself hard and I was learning how to use the equipment better. And so after, after about two months, so eight weeks in, I was earning $5,000 a week. Um, this is revenue sales. Um, so um, I was making $5,000 a week, still busting me guts, absolutely busting me guts. Um, but I was becoming better at talking to the customers, better at using the equipment and, and certainly better at marketing. Um, so I'm making $5,000 a week, but I knew that I could still do it better. I, I still knew that I, I wasn't pushing it as hard as I possibly could. I knew there was more room for improvement. So I had, um, I'd, I'd got magnets instead of business cards now. I'd got these little magnets, same size as the business cards, and I'd get a little paper clip and I'd put them on the fly and I'd start putting them in people's letterboxes. Now the issue was, is that I run out of territory space to do letterbox drops. So I call up my franchisor and I say, hey, are you all right if I go and do it in, in other areas that other franchisees don't own? He goes, I don't know, mate. You're going to have to talk to the franchisees at the next meeting about it. Rah, rah. So sure enough, I, at the next meeting, I speak with them and I stand up in front of them and I just say, is anyone okay if I start doing letterbox drops in areas that no one else owns? It's a vacant territory. Sure enough, they were like, yeah, that's fine. It doesn't bother us. Go for it. Um, so beautiful for me. I went out and started doing it with magnets and I had a much better success rate. I was actually earning on average about an extra $1,000 a week for the next 10 weeks from doing these magnet drops instead of the business cards. Um, and then, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm doing better, better marketing. And I've also, what I've done is I've started to consolidate my round. So I've started, what I used to do is I'd just go from, because I needed the work and I was hungry for it, I'd go from suburb to suburb to suburb to suburb. I'd go like five different suburbs in a day just to be able to get this work. Um, and so I started, now that I had more customers coming on, I started consolidating my round and I was sticking to one or two suburbs a day. So I was able to earn more profit because I was traveling less. I figured every time I'm not behind a mower pushing, pushing a mower, I'm not making money. If I'm on the road, I'm not making money. So I had to be behind the mower at all times. Um, so I've started consolidating my round. I've started doing better marketing. And uh, I've also, from that marketing, what happened is I've started creating more demand. Um, and so this is, this is something that I didn't realize at the time how important it was, um, but I certainly know now. Um, and so I've, I've created more demand. Um, and the issue was is that from, get, from that $5,000 a week point, I could get to about $7,000 if I was lucky um, a week, um, but I couldn't really get too far past that. And it really annoyed me because I wanted to get to this $10,000 mark. It was, like, it was now like, it was no longer about the money. I had money now. I knew I could take care of my family. I knew I was gonna be all right. 
Now I wanted to see how far I could push this. I wanted to see what the p potential of a Jim's mowing business was um, and certainly how far, how far I could take it. And so w whether that meant me walking twice as fast while I was using the mower or, you know, taking... Um, finding new procedures and processes to mow a, lawn, mow a lawn faster or get to the next property a couple minutes quicker or get out of the car a little bit faster. I was trying to find the absolute maximum, what I could do. Um, and so I started creating more demand from doing all this marketing. And um, from having more demand, I realised that, well, I'd run out of time, so what if I just took the best paying jobs and I just got the best paying jobs and I filled in my time with these amazing paying jobs? So I put my prices up. Uh, which is what Mike said before, you know, if you, if you can't take on any more leads, if you're not taking on any more leads, you either hire or you put your prices up. So I put my prices up and I put them up to $2 a minute for regular lawn mowing and $3 a minute for once-off jobs, um, which is, you know, 120 an hour for, for regular or half an hour is 60 bucks and for the once-off, you know, 90 for half an hour and 180 for an hour. So I put my prices up because I could no longer fit in these jobs and I wanted to get the best paying jobs and I didn't think I'd win all that many jobs from this, but I didn't want to because I didn't have any time. Um, and so what ended up happening was I still ended up winning about seven out of ten jobs. Still won seven out of ten jobs at three dollars a bloody minute. Like how mental is that? Um, and so I'd started realising how powerful this brand is at, around this point. I'd really started understanding that the customers, they didn't care about Dan, they didn't care about me doing their job, they cared about using Jim's mowing to do their job. They wanted Jim's the same way that I wanted McDonald's for a hamburger. Um, and they're willing to pay for it. And so once I started realising how powerful that brand is and what I can possibly charge and still customers are going to take it, um, well, that's when I went, well, Jesus, there's some serious potential in this. I reckon I can take this further. And so I did. Um, so I'm now at a point where I'm earning about $7,000 a week on average. I'm about four months in. And I've got, as I said, I've got un this unique problem where um, I can't fit any more work in. And, this, and the reason I can't fit any more work in is because I, uh, I've got all these regular customers. Now, about six months in, I had about 80 regular customers on my books. Um, and I, it was from bringing on three new regular customers a week. Um, and by this time, I'd already removed all the existing customers that I bought the business with because they all got the price rise for the regular mowing. And sure enough, they weren't going to take it because beforehand, they were at a dollar a minute. So they're sure, sure as hell not going to go up to $2 a minute. So they just, see you later. Um, anyways, and so... I, uh, I brought on my first employee. Now, I had no idea how to bring on an employee. Um, and so I didn't want to do anything wrong because I didn't want to lose my house. But I also knew I wasn't experienced enough to be able to do it. So what did I do? I brought on my younger brother because I figured, well, <laughs> I'm going to stuff it up somehow. I knew I was, but at least if I stuff it up with my younger brother, he's not going to take my house from me. So, um, so I bring him on, and now that was, that was actually quite easy to bring him on as an employee because he's my younger brother. He had a job at McDonald's that I got him. And so I just said, Alex, you're coming to work for me. And he was like, oh, I don't know about that. Alex, you're coming to work for me. Bang, done. So sure enough, he's working for me now. He's taking care of my regular customers. I had these, uh, these regular customers that I was getting paid $2 a minute from when I wanted to be doing the $3 a minute jobs. I was focusing on these once-off jobs that I wanted to do. So he takes care of this, this huge problem I have, which is where I don't want to earn $120 an hour. I mean, what a problem to have. Um, and so he starts doing these customers for me. Um, and he, sure enough, he loves it. He really loves doing this job, um, which was fantastic for me because it meant that he, he put a lot of effort and in, in care into it, and, and probably more so than what I did with the customers. He knew them like the back of his hand. He knew this week on Monday, I'm going to be down at Sue and Lily's house. And on Thursday next week, I'm going to be at David's place. So we knew the customers like the back of his hand. I'd, I'd probably gone out there with him for about a month nonstop teaching him all these customers and it didn't take him long to, to be able to pick it up. And so now he's making me about $3,500 a week in sales from doing these 80 regular customers for me. Um, and I'd gone, well, that's brilliant. That takes care of that problem. Now I can focus on these $3 a minute jobs because I've got the demand because I'm doing the marketing to be able to bring these jobs in. Um, so I'm now focused on these $3 minute jobs. So I'm now at the point where I'm earning minimum seven grand a week by myself, uh, not including what Alex was making for me. But there's a lot of weeks where I'm out, actually out there making 10 grand a week by myself doing these $3 minute jobs. Now I was busting me guts. I was working bloody hard. I think anyone here, uh, you guys are all obviously experienced. You guys know what it's like to be busting your guts all day out in the hot weather or you might get stuck in the rain and you just got to get the job finished because you want to make the customer satisfied. You want to try and keep taking on work. So I'm, I'm out there busting me guts doing it and uh, 
it was very, very tiring. It was, it was uh, exhausting actually doing all these once-off jobs and going through the whole process. And, um, and so I went, well, this is, I'm not going to be able to do this forever. I've got to come up with some sort of idea on how I can continue to make money but not have to put myself through absolute torture every day. And so sure enough, um, another six months went by and we're doing fantastic and I bring on my second employee because I'd got another 80 regular customers. And when I brought on my second employee, it's then that I realised, hey, I've actually got a proper business here. I've now got two employees, both doing 80 customers a week for, uh, 80 customers, uh, regular customers for me. So usually about 40 a week that would do on a fortnightly schedule. Um, and they're both making me three and a half grand a week and they, and they, and they love it. And I'm still able to go out there and do my once off, once off work. So these guys are making me seven grand every week. Um, and so I went, well, I'm going to stick to this. I don't, you know, I, don't, I don't know business very well, but I know this because I've gone and done it twice. Um, and so sure enough, that's what I did. So after three years, I had six employees working for me, one every six months, each of them making me three and a half grand a week. Um, and sure enough, I was making over $20,000 a week in sales from having these guys do my work for me. Um, it, was, it was fantastic, but it's also it's quite a bit to manage, as you, can, as you can imagine. So at this point, I've got myself off the tools, completely off the tools, um, and I'm now doing uh, quoting, scheduling, invoicing, and just making sure, keeping up with the day-to-day, -day, making sure the equip equipment's running right. So I do little things like a pre-shift every morning with the employees. So every morning before we start work, so we'd get there, they'd get to my property at 6.30, would go through the schedule for them. Um, I'd have descriptions written out on every single uh, customer's job. So you've got your daily job schedule that you guys would obviously all know about. So you've got a description section, which I never really used, but then obviously once you've got all these employees, you need to use it because otherwise all these jobs get stuffed up and you end up having to go back to them all. Um, so they'd go through the description. We'd, we'd, uh, the night before, I would do the travel plan. So I'd go um, and figure out what the quickest route is for all these jobs before they would go out and do the jobs. Um, and it worked really well. And then post-shift, I would, I would do much of the same. I'd communicate with them and ask them, it was after they finished work, I'd ask them how it all went. Was there any problems with any customers, any, any add-on sale that the customer might need that I might need to go and quote for? And the big reason for these, these pre-shifts and post-shifts for me was really about creating more of a culture uh, within within my business. And it's because the guys like getting together every morning and talking with each other and having a few darts and talking about, they used to play Pokemon Go together. Um, they, they really loved it, the Pikachu and all the rest of it. So they'd, they'd catch all these Pokemon every night and talk about it with each other every day. Um, and then uh, when they'd get, when they'd get uh, back for the post shift, well, of course, the person that's in the passenger seat of the car was sitting there playing bloody Pokemon Go while the car was driving. So I'd be catching Pokemon. And so what ended up happening was they loved doing it so much that, well, they worked really bloody hard when they were on the job and got it done as quickly as possible with fantastic quality because they didn't want to go back there just so they could get back in the car to play Pokemon. You know, it drives me crazy how that worked, but it was fantastic. It made me great sales. <laughs> Anywho, and so that was the culture I had. These guys are now best friends with each other. Um, and have, have you ever worked in a workplace where... Everything, like your boss treats you terribly, you've got no appreciation, you hate the bloke that works with you, he's a pain in the ass, um, and you just go, oh, stuff this place, and all of a sudden you realise that, you know, you're not, every day you go there, it's just the same thing, you're in airplane mode, and it's like, you're just doing 50% efficient, you're doing the bare minimum to just get through the day, till you can go home, sit on the couch, have a few beers. Do you, does any, has anyone been through that? Yeah. Yep, cool. Now, has anyone here been through the situation which is the exact opposite, where your boss really respects you, appreciates you a lot? When you go to work, it doesn't feel like work because you, you're, uh, you're catching up with your best friends and you love being there and you talk with them nonstop and you just, while you're working, you're talking and you love it and efficiency is great. You're probably working 200% what you should. Anyone been through that? Yeah. Cool. That's what I created in my own business and I did it because of what I was doing while I was at McDonald's. Um, and I'd learned it from McDonald's, the different cultures. Um, from, from being in a store where the Shake and Sunday machine doesn't work every single day. Thanks to McDonald's, thank you. Um, <laughs> where, there's, uh, where there's stores that obviously everything runs perfectly because everyone loves working there, so they put extra effort in to make sure that everything is always perfect. Um, so I'd done this and also it just felt right. And as, as I said, it made, me, it made the job much easier. It made my role much easier because these guys, was, guys were taking on more responsibility. So I'd got, I'd got these employees. Um, now, what I was paying them, um, often, often a lot of people say, well, what did you pay your employees? 
Um, so I started them off uh, on the lawnmower first. So I didn't get them to use the brush cutter. I got them, started them off on the lawnmower because I figured, well, you can't, you can't really stuff that up too much. Yeah, go on. Backup equipment. Yeah, okay, so what I did uh, for backup equipment, so during that pre-shift, I would always load up into each vehicle two mowers, two brush cutters, two blowers. No matter what, every single shift they always had, and, and they didn't need two mowers in there because there was one guy brush cutting, one guy mowing. And so the guy would jump out and he'd do the brush cutting first um, and then uh, he, he would brush cut the nature strip as soon as possible. The guy would then mow it. Um, he would go to the backyard, brush cut that. The guy would mow eventually the backyard and the, the guy that's brush cutting would do the blowing at the end. And then if, if there was any extra time, he would start filling up petrol in the blower or the brush cutter or the extra mower or whatever it was. So it always worked out pretty well. But the reason that we had the extra equipment was because if anything broke down, if anything wasn't working, um, well, you had the extra mower sitting there or the extra brush cutter over it, whatever it was, so you were saving time. You didn't have to come back to the yard and come get it because that's, uh, that's obviously costing money because you've got then two people that aren't, aren't um, you know, making money. So I had, with that said, I had two people in a team. So what I did was I had them first doing their own 80 regular customers every fortnight or whatnot, but then I realised they enjoyed working with each other more when they, were with together, with, when they were together and they got more done. So if I put two people together, I had people that were motivated to work because they were with their friend all day and they didn't want to let their friend down. And so they would work just as hard as their friend to be able to get all these jobs done. Um, and it, Yeah, so they could have done them by themselves or they could do them together. So they just did them together. But they, they, so what, they, they spent half the time on each job? Yeah, because there was two of them. absolutely, yeah. So, and then I tried, I was like, oh, geez, this works fantastic. So I tried to put three people together in the same vehicle. Well, that didn't work at all. That was terrible. Um, and so I don't know if anyone's had that happen before, but uh, what happens when you've got three people doing a job, if they're at a mowing job, is you have got one guy mowing, one guy brush cutting, and the other guy blowing, or he'll try and do whatever he can in between. He might grab the other brush cutter. And you always, for whatever reason, you always have the, there's the third person that always takes it a bit easier on that job. And then they get together, and at the next job, they'll go, all right, I took it a bit easy this job. I did these tasks. How about this time? You take it easy. And, uh, you know, and so you lose complete productivity. So um, from, from having, but motivation is very high. I mean, they're very happy. They're sitting there having laughs and talking nonstop. And so they're very, very happy with what they're doing. It's just that, you know, I'm, I'm losing money from it. So the perfect balance for me was definitely having two people together. Um, so if that, if that helps clear anything up. Um, now, I, I would bring them on and they would start mowing lawns at $25 an hour. Um, casual, and uh, I, would, I would bring on, I wasn't so much looking for anyone experienced because people that were experienced didn't tend to really want to listen to the way that I mow lawns because I mow lawns tend to be a bit different to most people. I have procedures and processes for everything and formulas on how I do things. Um, and you know, one of those things is I want my, my employees to walk twice as fast. Well, someone that's experienced, they have their own set way. So you might tell them to do it, they might do it for the first week, and then after that, they'll go back to their own ways. So I tended to bring on just new people that were completely new to the industry. So they get paid $25 an hour mowing lawns, and then once they become an expert at, at lawn mowing, which would take usually about three months, four months, um, every now and then you get one that would take six months. Um, and then they would start brush cutting. And once they started brush cutting, I'd put their prices up to $27.50 an hour casual. Um, and so they'd be brush cutting now, and there'd be another person doing the lawn mowing, and they'd learn how to do that. And once they become, become an expert at that, which again would take probably about three to four months, then I'd put them onto $27.50 an hour part time. So they got, the, um, they got the extra expenses. Now, they also had the option of going to $30 an hour casually if they liked, but everyone just went part time. Um, and then the, when they were at that point, they, could, they would start managing the team of two. So they'd be in the vehicle and they'd have the, uh, the offsider with them or the person that's less experienced than what they are. And so they'd start managing that team. They'd make sure they could get through the day efficiently. And once they, would be, uh, once they become good at doing that, then I'd put them onto $30 an hour part time. Um, and then from there, then they would help starting to manage my whole team. So they'd start helping manage the six employees and the daily schedule and doing the travel plan and dealing with fixing the equipment. And so then they would go on to salary and, and I usually pay them. Well, Tristan, he was my, he was my 2AC. He was on about $75,000 a year salary plus the benefits and overtime. And, and it was definitely overtime. Um, 
and, and we had Mike, he was on 65,000 an hour salary and he would, he would uh, fix the equipment for me on the side and, and, and make sure that everything was running and operating effectively. Um, and so that's how I set up my, my business system. Um, and so um, one of my things was, it's, I, can teach, I, I, I can teach most people how to run a lawn mowing business. I can't teach them how to stay motivated. I can tell you how I am motivated, but I don't know what motivates you. And so what motivated me at the start was definitely money. I needed money coming into my account. Um, and then it got to a point where I had money. I was making $5,000 a week at, at one point. Um, and now the motivation became I wanted to see if I could break my own records. I wanted to see how far I could push this thing. When I brought on employees, my new motivation, and they were all still my motivation the whole way through. It was not like a, one dropped off. Uh, my, my new motivation was... I, uh, I wanted to make sure that every single employee that worked in my business, no matter what, had at least 35 hours a week, minimum, no matter what. Because if I was bringing on someone that was going to work in my business, I was going to look after them because I'd said, hey, join my business, help me out, grow this business. Um, I'm, I'm going to do whatever I possibly can because they put their faith into me to be able to, obviously, I've employed them, so I want to make sure that I can look after them so they can put food, food on the table, keep a roof over their head, do whatever they possibly need to do. Um, and so it did become a little bit challenging because it's such a seasonal business, especially when you're coming into the winter months and you know, your frequency starts to drop off. Well, you know, how, do you, how do you find the hours to be able to make sure they minimum have 35 hours a week, which is where I started, um, started doing, learning a lot more about local area marketing and doing much more local area marketing. Is this permanent on here as well? No. <laughs> I, 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 just so you know, in Australia, not all markers are like this, I swear to God. Like, we actually have proper markers that just come straight off. I don't want you to go back to America and be like, yeah, the one thing about Australia. And have you tried Vegemite yet? <laughs> Oh my god, this is the worst marker. Here we go. I'm going to flip it the other side. Yeah. Let's see if this one comes off easy. Oh my god. This is a serious problem. Joel, in the next budget, can we get a... <laughs> what a nightmare. Thanks, mate. All right. Flip chart marker. Yeah, we're safe. All right, cool. All right, I've just fixed the, uh, the problem for all the new presenters coming on so they can thank me later. Um, all right, so I started doing more marketing. Now I need to create demand. Um, and so um, what I'd done was... I had all these ideas for marketing that I'd done, and so I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you, my, you guys my top 10 tips for what worked in my business. They may not necessarily work in yours, but this is what I did mostly in mine. So um, the first one um, was add-on sales. Now, when I did add-on sales, I didn't do add-on sales like most, every, uh, most other people do add-on sales. Um, the way that I did that on sales is, well, most people wait for the customer to come to them and say, hey, can I get a quote for this? What I did was I would create a list. When I was looking for work, I'd create a list of every single client that I had. And I'd go through the list one by one, and I'd think of a specific add-on sale for each customer's property, something specific to their property that they needed. They might have needed their right-hand garden bed weed hand-weeded or they might have needed their gutters cleaned, or they might have needed cobwebs removed from the eaves, or whatever it bloody was. I, they might have needed something, and I would sit there and I would think of something specific that they needed, because if I knew I could think of something specific that they actually needed, my, uh, well, the, the possibility of me winning that job was, well, I had a much greater chance. So I would uh, email through the quote to the customer. They didn't even ask for it. I would email through the quote to the customer, my specific add on sale with the price already done, it already emailed, quote given, boom, haven't even asked for it, didn't even know about it. And then I would call that customer and let them know, hey, I just thought I'd let you know, I've sent you through a quote, 
um, for this sort of this work that I noticed that you need done at your property. Just letting so you know, I am looking for work at the moment. I'd love to be able to help you out. If I can't help you out with this service, is there any other service that you might need done? And so that's how I would do my add-on sales, and it worked beautifully. I had uh, I had a fantastic um, amount of amount of sales coming through, which would help me continue to give my employees 35 hours a week. So that was my first one. I always did, and as I said, the way that I did my add on sales was different to what most people do. So I would email, then I would call. Not, not so much a text message. Text messages weren't personal enough for me. If anyone knows me, they know that I don't text message very well. Everything's got to be a call. Um, or if I, if I was going out to that customer's property, I would go see them face to face. That's even better. Um, so that's the first one. Uh, the next one is, uh, have any, most of you guys in here, this room would have heard of NDIS by now. Yep, cool. So, I had NDIS. Now, the NDIS, I figured this out um, a little while back. The way that it works is you have, you obviously have your plan managers and they're like the sort of the middleman that have, has the client's budget and they send it through to the, um, the, uh, the, the actual NDIS through the portal. Um, and so for that, you need to be registered. Now, if you're doing plan managed or self-managed work, obviously you don't need to be registered as most of you would know. Um, and so, each uh, client uh, with NDIS or um, participant, uh, they can either choose to have a support coordinator or maybe they manage it themselves. So a lot of them have support coordinators. Now the average support coordinator tends to look after between 20 to like 50 clients each. Um, so I figured, well, I need, I want work through the NDIS and if I can get onto one support coordinator and uh, build a relationship with them, well maybe I've just opened up the door to like 50 clients and I've, I've just won 50 clients in one big hit. Um, so I'd go out, out of my way to be able to get in contact with these support coordinators. I would, I would talk to them and then I'd say, do you know any other support coordinators that I can talk to? So sure enough, I was able to win quite a fair bit of work from that. Um, I'll just make that a bit more clear, support coordinators. Um, so um, there's a few big companies out there. Usually what I would do is I'd call the plan managers and then I'd ask them if they had any list of support coordinators that might work for them or they might do jobs for them um, and, and you know, subcontract to them. Um, and so they'll give you, you know, a few different su uh, support coordinators and then you go and ask from there on. Uh, or you speak with random clients and they, they might have a support coordinator that they're using now and they might have an old one that they used to have. Yeah, you had a question? Um, I do have a question. Um, doing actual NDIS work, like not through planning or anything, yep. how did you get around with like the $43 dollars 39 $39.30 or whatever it is? Yeah. Yeah, okay, so I would explain to the support coordinators or the plan managers or whoever it was that I quote per job. And I'd make sure I got it in writing. I quote per job, I do not quote per hour. Just because someone says, says to me, this is the hourly rate that you're gonna charge us, it's my own business. I choose what I charge my, my jobs at. I'm not gonna sit there and let someone else dictate to me exactly what I'm gonna charge. Because yeah. I've actually found that if the customer calls up gyms and or does, or does a uh, inquiry online, I found that they will only do the $49 or whatever it is. Now. Yeah, yeah, so you, you, you can charge whatever. Go on, yep. Down there, with the same case that the support coordinators that yep. you approach, I said, look, the customer really obviously wants me to do the work, but Jim's pricing is this, so I'm not working for life. They said, look, Scott, we really want you to do the job. They like you, they keep you happy. $49.30 times the 53, you've got your quote price. It's actually slightly higher. That's exactly it. Yeah. Sorry. And I, I would always get it. Now with the NDIS inquiry about people overcharging, whether there's going to be a fight back. I get it in writing. I get it in writing. So that's how I do it. And that's how pretty much I reckon most people in this room would probably do it. Uh, if I, am I wrong on that or not? Nearly every single contractor out there would do it like that. So I keep that in mind. Um, and that's the same with like TAC or Gallagher Bassett or whoever it is that you're going through. So that's how I dealt with that. Um, third one is, this is something that uh, some people don't really enjoy doing. Um, it takes a bit of guts because you, you deal with a lot of rejection. Um, cold calls. So I would do cold calls to random businesses in my territory. I would also do cold calls to previous clients or previous leads that I might have taken on. Um, so even if they didn't convert, and I would call these customers up, all these businesses up in my territory, all my all vacant territories, and I'd just explain to them the same thing that I'd say every time. I'm looking for work. 
Um, is there anything I can help you out with? Any service at all? And then I'd explain to them what sort of services I can help them out with. Uh, maybe, it's, uh, maybe it's a previous customer that I've done work for two years ago. Hey, do you need this done again? Whatever it is. So you go out there and you do specific cold calls. Uh, does take up a bit of time. Um, you have to be very, very good re with rejection. Um, it's a good thing that uh, I wasn't all that beautiful in primary school, so I dealt with a lot of uh, rejection anyways. <laughs> Um, all right, next one is uh, letterbox drops. So, as I said, I started using business cards first. Um, and, you know, it, it was all right. It wasn't fantastic. Uh, but magnets was really where it was at. Um, and so I would do 3,000 uh, magnet drops a year. Every single year I'd do 3,000. I still do them. I still do them in my business. I think they're fantastic. Um, and... You always have customers coming back to you years later. As you explained before, Mike, um, when you get these customers, you find that they usually convert to the next year and the next year and the next year after that. So these magnets that I was spending money on, I would continue having them come, come back for every single year after that. Um, brilliant. Uh, the next one is... Yeah, yeah, I did. So yeah, so I would do... So what I would do is I'd, I'd do it usually throughout winter. So as soon as it hit winter months, then I'd go and start doing my leg, uh, letterbox drops. Um, and then I'd do vacant territories around me. And then um, uh, my third year in, I went and did the same territory again that I'd done at the start. So if that helps you out. Um, because you don't know, some people might throw it out. Some people, people might lose it. So like, yeah, how would you success With the... Letterbox drops? Oh, it wasn't great. Like, I would do a lot of letterbox drops. Um, I'm not going to sit here and say it was like one in ten or something because it definitely wasn't. It might have been like one in a street. So it might have been like one in a street, but I would still somehow, uh, it would always be around on average about an extra thousand dollars a week in sales from it. Yeah, absolutely. People still call after that. So it, it might be 30 weeks into the year and people will still call. So. And the reason is, is because when you put a business card in someone's letterbox, uh, you've got the flyer on it, they see it and they go, junk mail, I'm not going to use that for anything. In the bin, done. You put a magnet in someone's letterbox. Now, I get really excited when I see magnets in the letterbox because I go, this is brilliant. I, I don't know about you guys, but when I see a magnet in a letterbox, they stay on my fridge because I use them to be able to put my daughter's photos on the fridge or RSVPs or wedding invites or whatever it is. Is that the same as everyone here? Exactly. So that's I love seeing magnets in my letterbox. So because I'm I like seeing them, I figured everyone else does. Uh, Jack, a question on Mike and Marissa. Yep. Can you please ask them what he does with the no junk mail sign on the letterbox? Yeah, okay. Oh simple, just chuck it in anyways. No. <laughs> <laughs> so obviously if there's a uh, if there's a no junk mail, then yeah, no, I don't I don't put it in. I'm not you know. I, it's probably not going to convert anyway, so I'll, I'm not gonna go out of my way to piss someone off because they're just gonna get on the phone to me and be like, How did you not see the sign? Um, all right, uh, next one is um, follow, up on pre follow up on previous quotes. Now, um, a lot of people don't really do this all that often. So you'll send a quote through and then you don't hear anything back from the customer, but then they don't follow up. They don't go, oh, well, why did that customer not give me a yes or a no or what happened there? You know, you just go, you assume it's a no. So what I used to do is I'd follow up with them. So I'd send a quote through. And if I hadn't heard back from that customer within like a week, then I'd call them up and I'd say, hey, I, I sent through a quote. Did you see it? Are you happy to go ahead with it? Whatever it is. Now, they might say, oh, well, look, no, I'm, I, wasn't, I wasn't actually all that happy with the quote. I thought it was too expensive or what, whatever, whatever it may be. Now, if you're looking for work and you need work on, um, depends on how much demand you have, obviously. But you might be willing to negotiate on that price. You might be able to chuck it down by 10%. You might be able to chuck it down by maybe 20%. Um, so you would follow up on that, and it's not even just a week after. Like you might follow up on previous quotes that you sent through like six months ago, and say, "Hey, I sent you through a quote for gutter cleaning or whatever it bloody well is cleaning your oven." Just thought I'd just check. Have you? Did you end up getting it done, or would you like? Would you like to um, book it in? So that's what I would do, um, and it worked out really, really well. Um, and I would also, just on that as well, when I would get once-off jobs, and this is something I didn't learn until a little bit later, so you'd get your regular customers, and when you get a lead for a regular client, you go, yes, like this is amazing. Everyone gets really excited about it. But when you get a lead for a once-off job, you go out and do the job, but after you do the job, try and see if you convert them to a regular. Actually say to them, hey, face-to-face, -face, hey, would you like me to continue doing your property regularly for $75 a visit? 
Um, you might get a no, no worries. But then call them up again two weeks later. Oh, have you found anyone to be able to do your property regularly for $75 a visit? If you like, I, I can actually do it. And what I found was well, I was actually converting about one in three once-off jobs to, to regulars from doing that because I would stay on top of them. Um, so hopefully that helps out anyone in here. Um, um, in my region, um, as I said, I'm, as you guys would know, I'm, I'm a franchisor now. But everything I do is based around having a good culture. I like the idea of having a good culture. If you've got, if you've got people that are happy and positive and you know, have good work ethic and they love what they do, everything else seems to fall into place. Um, and my job becomes much easier. Um, where if, if you've got negative people um, that you've got um, in, your, in your region or even in your business as an employee or whatever it is, it sort of becomes infectious and it puts other people into you know, a, a worse mood. You don't want those sort of toxic people in your, uh, or, or, I suppose, definitely not in your business and definitely not you know, uh, around you. So um, I, would, uh, I do whatever I can to make sure that I only bring on... There's two things I look for when I'm bringing on uh, employees, by the way, and this is the same thing with franchisees, always these two things. I look for someone that's got a positive attitude and I look for someone that's got good work ethic, so someone that's going to care. Um, and well, the reason for that is, is because they're the two things that I can't train. I can't fix those problems in people. Um, if, you've, um, if you've got someone toxic, um, it doesn't matter how hard you push and tell them, you know, hey, this is what we need to do moving forward, it's never gonna work. And to be able to f find the proof in that is just go and call my ex-girlfriend, you'll find out that for sure. Uh, <laughs> but um, no, but that, so yeah, when you've got positive franchisees, what happens is, you get to this point where these franchisees, most franchisees get to about 100 regulars or so, maybe 120 regulars in mowing. I don't know what it would be in cleaning. Um, and they, they're maxed out. They can no longer take on any more work. And so they might not want to build their business. They might not want to take on leads um, and they might not want to uh, you know, charge high prices or put on employees, sorry. Um, and, they, and they're not taking on leads for it. And, but they've got great service. And all these customers still want to be able to use their service, but they've got no time to book them in. Well, what happens is if you've got a, a franchisee that you're friends with or that you're close with, and they know that you're still building your business, for all those customers that they want to use their services and they can't fit them in, they'll pass them over to you and say, well, I can't do it, but Dan certainly can. He can help you out with that sort of work. I'll send you his number. And so you end up with this, with this position where you've, you uh, have multiple friends of, that are franchisees and multiple people that keep on sending you through all this work from all these clients that wanted their service that now gets sent on to you. And so that's the whole thing about gyms being one big family. We shouldn't be looked at each, uh, looking at each other as competition. We should be looking at each other as, as uh, you know, family or you know, um, definitely allies because we can really, really help each other build each other's businesses. Does anyone in here have a franchisee that you're super close with that sends on work to you? Yep, cool. Most of you, awesome, that's awesome. Um, and so, you know, a lot of people when they join up, they go, oh, well, I don't want you to put another person in my area because, you know, that'll take more work away from me. Well, maybe for the first three, six months, whatever it is, while that person's building up their business, maybe, yeah, they're, they're probably going to get a bit more work and whatever, what have you. But six months after, when they're at that point where they can no longer build anymore and they don't want to build anymore, they're going to be your ally. They're going to be the one actually helping you build your business even more. So, yeah, we are, we're, we're a team in this, I suppose, is, is what I'm getting at with that. So I would always network with franchisees and get work from them. Yep. In case from being the individual worker and you started putting team members in the field, did you get much pushback from the regulars changing over to service report and not getting Dan turned up to the job? Yeah, so you, you certainly uh, at the start, I certainly did get probably a little bit, little bit of pushback with it. Um, and so I would just explain to them that I've trained them my way. If, they, if they're unhappy with the quality of the service, I had, a, I had my own guarantee that I put in place. If they weren't happy with the quality of the service that that employee had given, I would go out and fix that job for them. And, uh, and then, you know, obviously, I would, you know, they would get another chance and, and move on from there and would put the, uh, add to the description that customer wasn't happy, this wasn't done, make sure it gets done next time on the job, uh, job schedule. So, but every customer knew that if anything went wrong, I would always come back to fix it. And my employees knew if I had to come back to fix the job, well, they all, they all had a lot of respect for me, they knew how hard I worked, and so that would take more time out of my day, and they never wanted that to happen. Um, so, if that, if that makes sense. Um, but then every now and then, you do get problem customers that are just an absolute pain. Um, and so those sorts of customers, um, 
those sorts of customers, I would uh, I would uh, do whatever I could to obviously stop them being, from being a pain. But if ultimately, if they're not going to, I would just explain to them, I'm sorry, I can no longer do your service anymore. Um, here's another number for another gardener that you might want to use, and he, he'd be able to give you a quote, and that would move them along. And I could do that because I was always bringing on three new regular customers a week. So, yeah. Um, so... I suppose that's sort of that's sort of how I was uh, how I was building my business, and and one thing that I've as always I, I suppose it's part of me and, and who I am. Now I'll, I'll, I'll go through this, but I just want to add this one thing. A lot of people say, well, what's what's really important about building your business? And I hear the answer, well, never give up. I, I hear that quite a lot, and it's 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 great. It's a it's a great quote to never give up. But for me, I, I take it one step further because you know never give up's one thing, and if you never give up, maybe you'll do all right. But for me, I focus on, I want to be the best. I want to be whatever it is that I do. It doesn't matter what task it is. I want to be the best at whatever it is I do. The idea of never give, giving up isn't even in my head. It's not even a thought process there. The idea of, uh, of um, being the best is, you know, you will, never giving up isn't even a possibility. Failure, failure isn't even a possibility. And then when you become the best, you go, all right, well, how can I push it even further? I don't want to be the best, but I want to be 10 times better than the next person. So I, sort, I, I don't know about you guys, if you guys can understand that. But that sort of mentality, if you, if, you, if you have that mentality, you'll do whatever it takes to be able to, to obviously um, build your business and succeed in it. Um, and it's, I, I suppose it's a bit more of a mental game. Now, I'll write down a few, few more of these. Um, so um, the next one is email your database. So you'll have, um, especially you guys being experienced, um, you'll have a database of clients that you've, you know, leads that have come through. And... You'll send through, uh, what I do is I send through an email to them. Um, and I do it probably every six months or so. Um, and so in Jim's Jobs, there's a, there's a section in there where you can put bulk email. And so you'll send that through to your clients. And what I do is I actually offer little specials as well to these customers. So I, first of all, I'll let them know I'm looking for work. And then after that, I'll, um, I'll also say, hey, I've got a discount on gutter cleaning or whatever it may be. Um, or if you refer a friend and they become a regular customer, I'll give you a free service or whatever, whatever have you. So that's, that's another way that I do a bit more marketing, and I tend to do that about every six months. Uh, we've got real estates, which is what I touched on before. Go in there and meet them face-to-face. -face. Actually talk to the property manager one-on-one, -on -one. Um, and you'll find that you get... If you, if you go out there, talk to them face-to-face, um, I give them like muffins uh, for Easter and for Christmas or yo-yo biscuits or, um, you know, maybe I'll give them Jack Daniels, depends on what they like, but you'll end up finding much more work from coming from, uh, coming from that as well. And that's the same with like my local steel shops and my, uh, my lawnmower suppliers, even the local ladies at the tip, you end up getting much more work from that if you build a relationship with them. Um, we've got uh, number nine. Now... I always recommend that everyone get registered with these, these few um, agencies that I'm about to list up. So the first one is we've got uh, DVA. Uh, many of you guys registered with DVA? Take on quite a, yep, we've got one over there. So I registered with DVA, get work coming through from them. We've got TAC if you're in Victoria, TAC. Uh, yeah, no TAC. <laughs> but yeah, get registered with TAC. Uh, if you're in another state, it might be some, called something else like MAIC for Queensland. Um, so I get registered as preferred provider for them. Um, and then you've got a few others. So you've got work cover jobs. Um, now you've got a few different work cover agencies out there. Uh, you've got like Allianz. Anyone done work for Allianz before? Yep. Uh, Gallagher Bassett. Anyone done? Yep. Cool. A few more hands. Awesome. So you, there's a few different agencies for work cover. And then it's the same thing uh, for aged care. So aged care. There's not just one, there's, there's several different ones. So there's like R Care, Home Care, Bieta Home Care, Let's Get Home Care. Like there's a whole bunch of different ones. So you get, get signed up with them as well. And um, some of them will make you pay um, to be able to become registered with them. Uh, like NDIS, if you get registered with NDIS, I believe it's about two and a half grand or so to get registered with them. Where, you know, a few aged care ones are probably a couple of hundred bucks. A lot of them will let you just get in, for, uh, become registered for free as well. Um, and then 10. Now, if I didn't put on this on the board, I'd get an uproar. So it's the big one. Uh, word of mouth. So always talk to people. You go out and do a job, speak with a neighbour, speak with their friends, speak with your family, speak with your friends. 
Um, do whatever it is that you can to get in front of people. So that's a, that's a big one, and that's probably something that most of you guys use daily anyways, and it's just it's something that naturally happens. I'll say, oh, can you do this service? Yeah, absolutely, I can. So those are my top 10 tips. There are other tips out there. You can go and do door knocking, you can go and do body corporate work, whatever it bloody well is. Um, but those are my 10. Um, so I'll leave it there for now because I think we're probably running out of, out of time a little bit. But uh, if anyone wants to talk to me about any of the other processes that I have in place as well, um, I'll be around and we'll do a group, well, we have a group forum on later on, don't we? Yep. So I can answer any of those questions as well. Yep. Uh, so friends and family, or it's actually more than that. It's for people just go, oh, well, I don't have that many friends. So what, what I do is I find friends that possibly have friends that possibly have family, and then I go and ask them. So I'll find out if there's anyone throughout those two avenues. So friends of friends of friends, or family of family of friends, and that's how I find that's how I find my people. I've, I've tried to do Facebook advertising. I've tried to do Seek, all the rest of it. I'd never really had that much luck, and I didn't have people that cared about my business. When you use friends and family in avenues through that, they tend to care care much more. I don't know if, if you have ever had the same experience, or have you have you brought on any staff or not? Not in this, no. No, okay, no worries. But yeah, for me, it's friends and family. Yeah, you never used to, but you do now. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, um, any other questions? No? Cool. No worries. Thank you very much for that, guys. <laughs> Thanks, Joel. Thanks, man, for the love, yeah. So, back again, we've got Mike's. This is Mike's original slot. So, Mike's kind of, he's done us a big solid by um, feeling for a presenter who dropped out early on today. But this will be Mike's talk now. So, Mike, please welcome up again. Thanks, brother. Thanks, Mike. Cool. All right. Check one. All right. Cool. So I thought we'd just jump into some questions and answers. That'd probably be easiest. Um, I know I talked to a few people at lunch, so I can go into more talking, but I'd rather do Q and A. So any questions right off the bat from what we talked about already? Going once. I know everyone's just like, oh, in food coma. Yeah, go for it. P for P. Yeah, I'll write it up. Everyone just, because about five different variations of that word came out through lunch. So it's P as in like pay for performance. Yeah, so P for P. Software you use. Yeah, P for P software.com. Okay. Yep, so if you just do software.com and then if you do slash training, it's free training. So we train you how to do everything. You don't have to buy it from us. So you can literally rip me off. That's fine. I don't care. I think it's easier just to use the software, but if you really wanted to, you could. So so you've created a few software as a services, basically? Yep, it's basically software as a service. It's a per monthly subscription based upon how many employees you have. Yep. So p4psoftware.com slash training. I think there's like four gyms owners already using it. A couple in cleaning, a couple in mowing, a couple in New Zealand. Does, does it integrate? Uh, so no integrations yet. But the, when, when you're saying um, about the customer complaints. Oh, yeah. How do, they, how do they complain? Do they complain into the software? Do they call... Uh... They'd be calling you probably, right? And then you'd go in there. So basically what our goal is is that you can run P4P one minute per day per employee. Because you, you will need to go in there and say, okay, how much revenue do they earn? Boom. Are there any yellow slips or uh, callbacks or deductions? You can enter those in. So our goal is one minute per day per employee to run it. Because you do need to do it every single day. But... Uh... So you have to manually input the revenue and you have to manually... Correct. Yeah, you do. Yeah, and the reason we do that, um, we were talking about it at lunch a little bit. <clears throat> in theory, if you earn $600 in total revenue and you're giving 33% of revenue, they'd be getting 200 right? The problem is in landscaping or fencing or other industries where you have material costs, okay? You do not want to give them a third of the total revenue. You want to give them a third of the total labor revenue. Okay. So what this means is if I'm going to have a, a project and it's $900, but 300 of that is debris, uh, rubbish, uh, it is plant material, bark mulch, whatever it might be, they don't get a piece of this. They only get a piece of the labor revenue. Okay. So in p4psoftware.com, we have two different versions. One's simple mode and one's advanced mode. It's just a setting. The simple mode is just going to take your revenue and give them a third of it. This is great for cleaning. It's great for mowing. But as soon as you start going to project-based work where there's material costs, debris, estimate fees, whatever you're throwing in there, 
you will need to use how much of it is labor revenue. Okay? And so what we've done to simplify that is actually break it down into budgeted hours. So instead of saying how much labor revenue you earn for the day, what we will say is how many budgeted hours of work did they perform? Let's just say that's seven budgeted hours in a day. And then what do you charge per budgeted hour? Well, it's $80. Okay, great. That means I'm going to have $560 in labor revenue for that day, and the software will do that on the back end and then give them a third or whatever percentage you're giving here. So it's all customizable inside the software in terms of what percentage you give them, what their base pay is. I know here you have that very scripted uh, levels of apprenticeship, and so that would be their base pay on P4P. But yeah, there's way more training on there. It's totally free. Uh, a lot more videos of myself explaining it, etc. cetera. Uh, the question from online from Angela. Angela. Yeah, question from Mike. When you're describing the three stages of growth slash stress, what advice would you give to any business owners that may have gone back to stage one from stage two, for example? Good question. <clears throat> First and foremost, you've got to ask yourself, do you, okay, do you want me to repeat the question or can they hear you? Uh, you go, you go. Okay, so uh, the question is if you, Went out of the first stage of growth into like the second or third and then retreat back to the first one, would you recommend trying again to grow beyond that? I think the first thing is you gotta ask yourself, um, are you meant to be in the second stage or third stage? Like having that financial stress, having employees, having all of that, is that so, is that what you are, are you not cut out for it? And it's okay. It's not a bad thing just to be self-aware enough. Otherwise just to keep like, why are you doing this to yourself? Just beating yourself up. Like, just keep hitting yourself up against the head, you know, head of, of, on a wall. It's like, just stop. Just stay small and that's fine. Um, that would be my first thing is make sure you're actually capable mentally of doing that and, and you can take that kind of stress and that level of uh, pressure. And then secondarily, it would be like, what didn't work the first time? Were you not hiring people correctly? Was there some sort of error in the way that you're paying people? Were they just super inefficient? So a, a really quick way to uh, mark efficiency that I think everyone in the home improvement industry should be uh, marking uh, and tracking. Sorry, I'm really into numbers. I know like I did training here, I didn't do a whole lot of numbers, so I apologize if numbers you don't enjoy. But I love numbers, okay? The only thing that matters in, in, in when it comes to uh, uh, the labor industry is your efficiency score. Um, because ultimately, <clears throat> All of us in the industry of cleaning, lawn care, fencing, whatever it is, all we're doing is selling time. That's all we're doing. That's why you don't ever hear me talk about, if you listen to my channel, about mowers or trucks or trailers. It, it honestly, in my mind, doesn't matter. It does not matter. The type of truck you buy, flip a coin. The type of mower you're going to use, flip a coin. It doesn't matter. It's a tool that simply allows me to sell labor at a higher rate than what I pay for it. Okay, your truck, your equipment, all those things is what allows you to pay, charge the customer $100 an hour when you're paying the employee 25. That arbitrage of going from 25 to 100 is made by you having the equipment, you having the tools, you having a business license and having insurance. All those things though is not what the customer is buying. The customer is buying the labor. Okay, so all I care about is how efficient is that labor? Because all we're doing is selling time to a customer. That's all we're doing. And so what we do if, in terms of efficiency score is we look at how many budget hours were completed in a day divided by how many clocked hours were on that day. Okay? So we do everything in terms of budget hours. So if you're doing um, a lawn, you say it's $50 uh, per uh, cut. Okay? Well, if your uh, if your hourly rate is $100 per hour, $100 per man hour, then that would mean that that lawn has 0.5 budgeted hours. Make sense? I'm going to add up all my budgeted hours at the end of the day, see how, many, how much was completed, of jobs that were completed, how many budgeted hours. I'm going to divide that by how many hours I actually clocked from the time I started the day to the time that I ended. That is going to track your efficiency score. What you're typically going to see, let's just use lawn care for an example, is somewhere in the realm of about six budgeted hours to every eight clocked hours. That imputes a 75% efficiency score. That also implies a 25% waste factor. Okay? Because if you were 100%, it would mean that you were on the job all day long. And this is the, the arch nemesis of every unprofitable 
uh, labor industry type of uh, business is this number. They don't know what it is, and it's usually under 75%. Almost every single lawn care and landscaping business that I see, under 70% is usually unprofitable and, and bound to not be able to grow or scale. This is the only number you should be tracking if you're trying to figure out profitability. The only other number you need to know if you're trying to grow your business is close ratio. If you can just close the majority of your jobs and you guys are very consistent at 70, 80%, then if you're still not growing, you need more leads. And that's what we talked about before lunch, get more leads, buy more leads, it's a great deal. <clears throat> so efficiency score, you gotta know these things. Uh, number one reason I think that most labor industry, lawn care, landscaping, et cetera, don't hire is because they have no idea whether or not that employee is making you any money. This number, track that every day and you'll know exactly who's good employee and who's bad. You just have that number there. P for P will smoke them out really fast too. Um, within a paycheck, you'll know whether or not someone's a high performer or not. But this number here, it should be tracked every single day. We track inside the software for each um, week, month, et cetera. Cool. Any other questions? Just on that there. Yeah. You've got six budget hours, but they've clocked eight. Mm -hmm. So that job wouldn't have been profitable. It, would, it, can, it can be profitable. This doesn't really doesn't have anything to do with being profitable or not. Um, this is simply a measure of how much of my clock day is actually spent doing work. Right? Because the other 25% of this day was spent driving, unloading equipment, doing whatever, besides actually completing budgeted hours. Yeah. So, so, so like your wage to sales, goes through the same thing, so. Yes, exactly, yeah, I know what you're talking about, yep. Yeah, what, he, what you're talking about is you take your total wages of the, of a, are you talking about like what I talk about my podcast? Yeah. Okay, okay, so wages, the total wages, if you take this number at the end of the month, divide that by your total revenue, this is another number you want to be tracking all the time, to be determining what percentage of your total revenue is going out the door to wages. The problem with this number, and it, the reason it's not as accurate when it comes to efficiency as this number, is because this revenue has labor uh, materials and other fees inside of it. So it can be messed up. Whereas this is strictly based upon the efficiency of labor. And the reason labor is so important is because not only if you look at profit and loss statement, of any home improvement in, uh, industry business, uh, labor makes up the biggest expense, especially you scale, right? Like if you're a solo operator right now, if you do all the work, you don't see wages as a big expense. Once you get above five employees, it is your number one expense. It's the determining factor of whether or not you're profitable. It's also a massive variable expense. Does everyone know variable versus fixed expense? Cool. So variable expenses are bad news in this industry because that means if it rains and everyone goes slower that day, you just didn't make any money, okay? So that's why with P for P, we fix that expense of labor at a certain threshold of 33% or whatever you're using inside the software because then regardless of what the weather is, regardless of whether they get a flat tire, regardless if they're having a bad day, I know that I'm getting, getting a certain percentage of my revenue to labor. Joel. Uh, questions on mics. I'll read out the first one. Uh, Matt Wilson, the dog, like, the push mic by incentivizing speed. Do you find that there is a drop of quality? How do you avoid that? Yeah, so uh, quality versus quantity kind of thing when it comes to P for P. If, our, if I incentivize speed, am I going to have a drop off in quality? We had 60% less complaints after we implemented P for P compared to hourly. The reason for that is twofold. We have what we call the yellow slip system. It's not only is it a deduction on their paycheck, but also that yellow slip, when there, a call comes in and or an email or whatever complaint comes in, we do not address that at, from the office level. As a manager, as an owner, it's one thing that I personally hear a lot in gyms is like if an employee does a mistake, I'll fix it. I think that's the worst thing you could ever do. Uh, it dis, it, it, it dis, uh, disarms the, the employee from taking ownership of their job. And if they make a mistake, they're going back and fixing it. Okay, so with a yellow slip system, what we do, not only is it a deduction on P for P, but also when the, a complaint comes in, we do not talk about it with the employee, we do not communicate with the, the customer, besides to tell them that that employee will be back within 24 to 48 hours, that becomes a yellow slip. What we do is we write out on a square piece of paper, customer's name, what their complaint was, and who was there last. That goes on the, on the desk, we do not talk to the employee about it, but it's right underneath where they put, hang up the keys at the end of the day. They know if, if there's a yellow slip with their name on it and it's not resolved within 24 hours, they can have all their P4P taken away on a paycheck. 
So they, when they see that yellow slip, they are immediately grabbing it and immediately going back to the customer's house. When they go back to the customer's house, they have to resolve the issue, have, to, have, it, have it signed off on. They bring that yellow slip back to the office and at the next team meeting, they have to tell everyone in the room, the entire team, what happened. So for some guys, they're more afraid of that experience, talking in front of all their colleagues about what they did wrong, than they are about you know, $20 or $15 for the 30 minutes it takes to go back to the property. What that does is it pushes that little bit of social pressure along with financial pressure on them that when they're finished the lawn, they take the extra five seconds to be like, okay, did I get everything? Yes, okay, great. That's all you need for your quality to be at a higher level. Oh, this is so good. This is the capacity-based growth question. Okay, so there's this thing called capacity-based growth. Give me a second. Much better. Thank you for this whiteboard. Okay, so this is what everyone always wonders, like, should I buy a truck or should I get an employee? Should I get an employee or should I get a truck when I'm trying to grow? Here's my opinion. The most profitable way to grow your business when it comes to buying assets like a truck, equipment, trailers, etc., is what I call capacity based growth. Okay. So I think the most profitable way to grow a business is to be at capacity. In other words, using your assets every single day. Your truck should be out on the road every single day. If it's not, there's no reason to buy another one. If all your equipment's not being used every single day, there's no reason to buy more of it. So what I'm gonna be looking at is, what is your capacity? So let's say you have one truck, okay? One truck, boom. Now if there's one employee, i.e. you in that truck, let's just assume you can make about $10,000, $10,000 in monthly revenue, okay? Now, this is not full capacity because what can I do before I buy another truck? I can hire an employee. So if I get, another, get an employee, so myself and one employee, now this is not gonna go to 20,000, you're not gonna get 100% or a doubling of efficiency, but it might go to 18. 18,000 in, in monthly revenue, myself and one employee. Again, this is max capacity. This is you working all day long and then doing estimates in the evening, probably on the weekends too, okay? That's full capacity. So what I would personally do if you're strictly, if you're restricted on cash, and you have restricted capital, I would be growing 18,000 and then buying another truck. I would do the exact same thing over and over and over again, but I would not buy another truck until I have full capacity. Unless you're growing so fast, and I'm talking about, like for us, we will only buy multiple trucks when we get started if we're going from zero to 50,000 in three months. And that's what I'll do at my personal locations that I own. I'll immediately buy two to three trucks, three to four employees, but I expect within three months we're doing 40 to 50,000 a month in revenue. So if you're not growing that fast, I'd recommend using capacity-based growth, which is what can I get, a, what's my total max amount of revenue I can get by getting variable cost, which is labor, and not buying fixed expenses in the form of assets. So asset utilization is something you wanna be tracking as well, especially when you have expensive trucks, twenty, thirty thousand dollars for trucks, you better make sure you are tracking how often that vehicle is moving. If it's, when I come to my shop, I'm only there once a week for about 30 minutes. When I go there, the one thing I'm looking at, and the managers know it, is every truck out on the road, is every trailer on the road. I only wanna have one or two out of 15 or 16 trucks at the one location that is stationary and at the shop. If not, we are not at our capacity. Okay, that's where your max profit's going to be. Obviously, you would have redundancy, especially if you have 15 trucks, you've got to have one or two backups, but I still want those on the road. Because guess what you can do if a truck goes down and you have 15 trucks? You throw an employee or two into another truck, and you have just less trucks that day. So I want my trucks, my assets working for me all day long, okay? There's this thing in, when, you, when you start talking about like uh, larger companies, you'll hear this ROE, return on equity, and return on assets. These are things that we always talk about return on investment because we look at capital into our business. But another way to track return is how much do I have an equity in the business? And what's my return on that? And also what, what do I have an asset sitting in my truck, sitting in my equipment, sitting in all the stuff that you buy every single day, okay? That's why I think it's, um, I, would, I would much rather someone, instead of go buy a second truck here with one, like if you're thinking about getting your first employee, I do not believe you need a second truck right off the bat. Go get an employee, fill to capacity, and then go get another truck. 
unless you're going to grow like doubling over the next few months. You expect to need it right away. On that, given the seasonality of like mowing, mm -hmm. you take, discard that. Like in winter, you're going to have trucks sit, and that's just the way it is, and you understand that. Is that your logic with it? And then also, um, given like coming into summer period, would you consider, say, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, you might have like three trucks on the road, but Thursday, Friday, there's always an increase in like leads because people want things done by the weekend. Having those trucks spare early in the week will give you the capacity to service those clients at the end of the week. Is that what? How does that play into it when you look at like your return on assets, or is that more just about growth? Yeah, because you're considering the growth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, that's really personal preference. Like some of our locations, they like to do the same thing. Like end of the week, we do we let our projects roll into the end of the week. We get all our mowing done at the beginning of the week. I'm not so concerned about that. Um, but what I don't like to see, what I'll tell a franchisee off for is they have one truck for mowing and they use it Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday and then Thursday, Friday they have another truck and another trailer for their projects and they're literally using one of the trucks for two days a week. It's like, okay, we've got to figure out, to gr you need to grow so that this other truck can get a different trailer or whatever you need so it can be moving five days a week. Um, and so I just want to see trucks moving. Like this, are, it's an expensive asset. If we're not using them, sell the thing. Get get your variable cost into one truck if needs be. Would you say the same thing between going as well, um, a ride on versus a push mower? If you went, I've only got two jobs across my eighty clients, or well, however many clients I've got right now, that could be ride on jobs. Yep. But the rest of them are push mower, and I do that one, and it takes me an hour and a half to do as a push mower. Mm -hmm. But if I had a ride on it, it would take me 20 minutes, but then I've got this asset that I'm not currently using. Yeah, exactly. So, question is should I get a riding lawnmower if I have a few larger properties um, versus just using my push mower all the time? We have what we call the 80th percentile rule. That means you're going to look at 80% of your properties and make sure you can service those. I'm happy to go with 50% in a location if I'm not trying to grow really fast. And that is, What's the minimum size of truck and trailer and equipment I can get away with and still service 50% of the population? Okay, for some of our markets in the US, they have to have a 52 inch, a 60 inch zero turn. It is because everyone's house is an acre or two acres. Like you're not doing a push mower. But in our market, for example, 80% of the properties can be done with a 21 inch push mower. Therefore, we're gonna stick to that. Now, will we bid on large jobs? Yes. And we have one job that I'm thinking of specifically is $1,600 and it's done with a push mower and it's like two and a half or three acres, which is, what's that in like your common speak? That's 5,000, that's nine, 12, 1,200 square meters? 12,000 square meters, it's just a lot, okay. Um, but the bottom line is if you're doing an estimate based upon budgeted hours, hang with me for a second, okay? If you're doing a job based upon budgeted hours, and you're looking at a job and say, how long will that take? And you say, one hour. Okay, great. We're going to charge $80 per hour. How much is that long going to cost? $80. $80. Now let's assume I go buy a really nice, big, flashy mower. Now I can do that job in 30 minutes. And you know what a lot of people will do? Great. I'll charge 40 bucks. You know what you just did, right? You just handed all of the, the cost savings to the customer. Okay? So that's why you've got to remember, too, on P for P, I'm getting the percentage of the labor revenue, which means when I give them bi bigger and better equipment, if I upgrade equipment, I'm giving the guys a favor because ultimately the amount of money I'm making on the job stays the same. Okay. So um, when it comes to your question though, I would be looking at what's 80% of your population, get away with that, and then realize that you're, you can bid on the other 20%. You're just going to probably be very high in price, but that's fine. You're bidding based upon budgeted hours not based on you know, other factors. Yeah. We personally, we do our bids over the phone. So when people call into our, command, our call center, we call it command center, um, they do square footage live and then we'll give a quote over the phone, get a credit card, and then our franchisee just, it pops up as a job scheduled. We don't have an estimate process or anything. How do you, on that, like things like access, overgrown lawns, yeah. how do you play into all that? Oh, we're gonna go over, over the phone estimates. All right, here we go. So, um, yeah, for years I didn't do over the phone estimates. I thought, hey, I can't do it because I don't know how long the grass is. I don't know if there's obstacles. I don't know if there's a chessboard in the middle of the lawn. Um, I'm looking at a satellite image from four years ago. For all I know, they have a swing set and four cars that are junk out in the back. That's true. It's 100% true. Here's what you're not thinking about. 
How long does it take you to drive 30 minutes to their house and 30 minutes back at the end of the day? That's an hour. You say, oh, it's just like at the end of the day, I'll just throw in a couple of those, no problem. No, that, that hour is you could have otherwise been on a property making $80 an hour. That estimate cost you $80. Five times as much as what you paid in lead fees. The fact that someone would cry about a lead fee and then drive an hour is absolutely ludicrous. So, um, first and foremost, the drive time saving the estimator. We can do um, drive by estimates. So, we have three ty different types of estimates we have over the phone, we have drive by, and then we have in person. This one I hate. I hate meeting the customer. Not because I hate the people, but because I can only do about eight to 10 of these in a day if I'm full time estimator. If I'm doing drive-bys, I can do about 20 of those in a day. If I'm doing over-the-phone estimates, theoretically, I can do hundreds, okay? So again, if you're trying to scale, I don't think this is a big issue with gyms, but if you're trying to scale very quickly, you need to try to get this direction because you cannot scale meeting eight to 10 people a day um, and driving all the day long and you have vehicle and insurance and all the rest of it. So how we do it in terms of square footage for mowing is number one, I did not do it because of all those variables. The thing is you've got to realize that if you just took, how you do this, if you actually want to figure this out, is just do a chart, do square footage versus price on an Excel spreadsheet. And what will end up happening, you have like this, just, just mark where all your customers are at and you'll find a pretty good regression that you can follow then for your pricing matrix. So um, yeah, you're going to be slightly inaccurate, but all you're going to do, um, I don't know if Jim Jobs does this or not, run a report. You can run budgeted hours versus how long it actually takes you on every single job that you're doing, and then just determine which ones need to be increased in price after a few months. So I'd just rather get them as a customer, and the worst case scenario, like worst case scenario is, Mr. Jones, we got charged $10 extra. We did this over satellite, and uh, we were wrong. And we've never had lost a customer over that. So. A question from Marissa. Wait, I don't think we answered it fully though. Give me a second, all right? So back to over the phone estimates. First one reason was the variables, right? I thought for sure we could not handle that. The next thing is the, the, the length of the, pro, of the lawn, okay? You might have the square footage nailed. So what we do is we charge a per minute price for the first cut to get it up to spec. So we tell the customer, hey, Mr. Jones, it's gonna cost you $60 for weekly service. Um, yeah, great, fantastic, get your car and file. The first visit, is $1 per minute per man hour or $1.33 per minute per man hour or $2, $2, whatever you want to charge. And that way we can get the, the property up to specification, get your edges established, get the lawn down, and then from then on, it's going to be that price in perpetuity. And we did never had an issue with that. The only time you're going to have an issue with that is if it, they all of a sudden are like, oh, well, actually it's really long. And that's why you do it. Because what people will try to do with over the phone estimates is get you for the $50 cut. You show up and it takes eight hours to mow. You do not want to fall in that category. You can't fall in that trap. So you've got to make sure that first cut is per minute. Let's go. <laughs> Good to see. Yeah. The biggest mistakes you made while you were scaling. Oh, mercy. Um, yeah, so you know this morning I said, did I say that this morning? Oh man, I'm just, it's all mixing together, sorry. I think I said it before lunch. Uh, the two, no, I didn't say this. I said this on another video, I apologize. Uh, the two worst ways to grow your business, two least profitable ways to grow your business. Mercy, gotta get more whiteboards for me, Joel. Uh. Budgets. What's that? Apparently, dude. Okay, so um, two worst ways, least profitable ways to grow your business is one, geographically. Geo, yeah, see, we're just gonna go with geographic. Okay, cool. And then second way is adding services. Okay. So yesterday when I was in training, they have on, I think it's FSM, FMS. Is it FMS or Jim's Jobs where you choose what services you want? FMS. FMS. Let's go. I'm learning the lingo. Oh, you guys are all wrong. Shame on you. All right, Jim's online. That's when you choose which services you want. I saw this long list of services, and I was like, oh boy. I, I would not choose every single one. Um, it's very tempting to do these two things to grow your business, and these are the least profitable ways to do it. These are the easiest and least profitable ways to grow your business. 
Geographically, just servicing more and more customers further and further away from home base, least profitable way. More and more drive time, this number gets smaller and smaller because more and more of your time is being in a, in a truck. Okay? The second way, adding services. Oh yeah, I can do bush trimming. Oh yeah, I can do fertilization. Oh yeah, I can do sod. I, do you know what sod is? Install, installing sod and soil. Okay, yeah. uh, I can do seeding. I can do gutters. I can do pressure washing. I can do this and that. You can add all these services, and now what you've built is 10 different types of companies inside of under one entity. I would much rather have a business, I tell my franchisees all the time, I'd much rather have a business that has 500,000 in annual revenue doing just mowing, now we'd have a 1.5 or $2 million business doing 10 different services. You know why? It takes 10 times longer to train somebody if I'm having all these other services. And I know for you it's easy, and this is a reason back to your question, Joel, about someone that went big and then started, had to withdraw. A lot of times it's because you started adding services. And so what happens when you start trying to train people, it takes you way too long to train them for them to actually become profitable in the business. And they have way more mistakes and they're way less efficient because you're trying to train them on 10 different things. And so it is very seductive to fall in this. And this is the trap that I fell into. Who, did you ask the question? Mistakes I made? Who made? Oh, you said, yeah. These are the mistakes I made. I started servicing properties that were 30 minutes to drive away from me. Bad move. Should have stayed within the one mile radius, uh, two kilometer radius around me. That's where all the money was at. I could keep that number really nice and high, the efficiency number. Again, when you're solo, you can hide these. Because guess what? You do the driving. It doesn't cost you any more overhead. So a lot of bad businesses are hid by the fact that the owner just works crazy hours. I make seventy, eighty thousand dollars profit. Great. But if you took away someone else's wages, how much are you making? I challenge everyone, including solo operators, to take away how much you work every single day in terms of hourly, multiply that by what you'd have to pay someone per hour, take that off of your profit and see how profitable your business really is. That's what your business is actually making. Otherwise, you just have a really fancy job that you get to work 14 hours a day, you get calls in the middle of the night, and you have to do leads and all this other garbage. Bad job. So I did this at the beginning, started servicing way too far away, started doing adding services. We did artificial turf. We had skid, sto skid loaders, track loaders, massive dump trucks. I got injured underneath a dump truck, got sucked up within the PTO around my neck, had to go to the hospital. Um, all of that, I attribute to adding services. Over the past you know, five years, since well, if I say, six years since that time, um, we just slowly, every single year at our locations, just take away more and more services. I consistently see people who grow their company. I could grow a million dollar business in less than 12 months every single day of the week. I could do that, but I'd be doing big services. I'd be doing a bunch of services like big projects, patios, retaining walls, water features. I can do all those things, but good luck trying to find anyone in this labor market that can do it as good as you and then be able to get them time and time and time again, or more or less, or, or, or worse yet, get someone who doesn't have the skills and train them up in any sort of given time frame at a profitable level. Because if your average churn is two or three months that people stay with you, and it takes you two or three months to get them to a level of profitability, good luck trying to grow a business. You'll always just say, oh, employees aren't worth it. I'm going back to being solo. Yeah, because you added so many services that you can't train them up in two or three days. So what we try to do is try to reduce it back to where someone could be fully autonomous, what we call a solo, solo route. They can go out and use their own truck within two weeks. If they can't do that, they're fired. We have to get them up fast enough because the churn is so high in all of our labor markets now that we only expect someone to stick around for an average of three months. So if they're not going to make a company profit within two weeks, you're out. So what's the average uh, time the person stays in your company is three months? It's common. It, that's the industry average in the U.S. And honestly, if you actually look, everyone, everyone always is shocked by that. But take, take all the people who stay with you for a year and then take the person who just stay with you for one day. Okay, now your average tenor is six months. Right? So three months is very normal. It's actually lower than that now. A question from online is, do I be on stage one? Um, sounds like also critical for the franchisee to delegate outsource, allow others to take care of their non-critical tasks, i.e. admin, bookkeeping, etc. How do you convince the franchisee people let go of their non-critical tasks? And this is what book people online. <laughs> they, they want business. So you, first of all, what you have to do is you call Jim's book of keeping and uh, okay. no. Um, yeah, like I think it, as you grow, like I talked about this morning, the only two things that really matter in growing your business is sales and hiring. So anything besides that, if your goal is to grow, should be delegated. Uh, and the faster you do that, the faster your business will grow. 
So um, that's why, like at Augusta, we have them take we have them take we take everything off their plate besides those two things. So we do all phone calls, emails, payroll, scheduling, invoicing, billing. We do everything for them because I expect them to go grow a business within a few months, very very quickly. So if you want to do that, you're going to have to go get a bookkeeper. You're going to have to you know, hire, like why in the world would you have your guys that you're paying 25 bucks an hour and now over time at the end of a week, why would you have them fuel up the trucks? Get some kid, wants to make a little extra money on the weekend out of high school, have them fill up all the trucks and clean them out on the weekend. All right, so it's just a matter of thinking about every single hour and then thinking about just more efficient ways of doing things. Um, when you hit capacity, that would be the first step. Uh, and when I talk about capacity, I mean you would have excess capacity because you could hire someone and go get an extra eight thousand a month in revenue, right? So, did I erase that? Oh man. So I was at ten thousand a month in revenue. I could go to eighteen thousand, right? That's a delta, a difference of eight thousand in revenue. Let's assume that cost me three thousand in labor. Now I have a five thousand dollar extra profit if I go hire somebody. The question is, can you go from 10,000, 18,000, do you have enough leads? And based upon what I hear in gyms, that's not a problem. All right, so um, I, I really don't see any sort of excuse as to why you cannot make that jump very quickly. Based upon what I keep hearing, everyone's like, there's no problem finding work. I'm like, why aren't you growing if you wanna grow? Like there is no excuse for anyone in this room that everyone raised their hand this morning, we wanna grow their businesses. If, the, if, if you don't have a problem with sales, the only issue you have is hiring people. That's the only one. And that's the big issue. Yeah. And so why would I be doing my bookkeeping when that's my only issue? Why would I be you know, figuring out the type of hubcaps on my truck and how much PSI is in my tires? Who gives a care? Go hire people. And you're like, oh man, they're so bad. Get five of them. Maybe one of them will work. Try P for P out for a day. See what happens when you give them a percentage of the revenue instead of just an hourly wage. Oh my word, they got two extra lawns done. That's an extra $150 in your pocket. Yeah. I have a question on Mark from Brad. Does Mark have a method or formula for finding your price ceiling aside from lead conversion percentage or a growth plan based on your business cost with a profit target to set what you need? Whoa, there's too, there's too many questions. First one. Okay, first one. In terms of re reaching your uh, price penetration. Uh, Yeah, raise your prices by 10% until you lose 20% of your customers. Once, once you hit that, you're probably at profit maximization. Can I expound? All right, give me a second. All good things start on the whiteboard. Okay, is this making sense or is this like stupid? It's good? Okay, all right. You know, these idiot US people come over here and start talking gibberish, so don't wanna be one of those. All right, back to what we were talking about at lunch. We got price and value. You know, I don't even need a whiteboard. I can do this with my hands. Um, price and value is an important thing. Uh, ever, all, when someone asks you what the price is, the immediate thing is like, you have a dollar amount, right? How do you quantify value? It's very different than price. Here's how I like to explain it. Sorry for everyone online, give me one second. <clears throat> so, you have price and you have value, okay? As long as value is slightly higher than price, the transaction will take place. What I mean by that is this, this bottle of water, this is the most annoying thing in the world. Okay, this bottle of water to me right now is probably worth $3. That's the value I impute on it. Which means if I walked over there right now and it was for, for sale for $5, guess what? Transaction doesn't take place. Now if it's $2 and my value is $3, I will buy this. Now my value changes based upon what? Mostly, how thirsty I am. Because my value on this water will probably be $100 if I'm in the middle of the Sahara Desert and I'm, I'm just dying for water, about to die. Whereas if I am literally just drank a gallon of water for a competition, the value of this is probably less than a penny that I would pay for this water bottle. So value is very fluid, no pun intended, okay? And so what that means is to our customers, we're so, we're so worried about the price when the only thing we need to concern ourselves is, is our price slightly lower than value? Because at this level, the transaction will take place. If you're charging $80 per hour 
and the customers, sorry, if you're charging $80 per hour and the customer's value is $95 per hour, the transaction will take place. Make sense? If you're charging $80 per hour, but the customer only sees a value of $70, the transaction will not take place. Here's the problem. There's the delta between the value that you're seeing and what you're charging is wasted opportunity. Because your customers right now are seeing a, a value on you of a $90 an hour and you're charging 70, which means you left $20 an hour on the table. So the only way to know how close can I get to value and maximize my profit, because the perfect scenario is that they value at me at 90 and I am charging 89. That's the perfect profit equation. How do you find that equilibrium is what I just said to him. You raise your prices by 10% until you lose 20% of your customers. That's why I freak out when people say, I have 80, 90% close ratio. You have a massive difference between value and price and you're leaving money on the table. Raise your prices or go hire people and grow. Because if you're not doing one of those two things, you are literally insane. The only reason you have that large of a discrepancy between value and price is so you have a high close ratio. The only reason you should have a high close ratio is so you grow your business and you get more jobs and more customers and hire more people. So if you're not trying to do that, like I just, I just, why, this is why I just do not get why people turn off their leads here. It just makes no sense to me and then they tell me they wanna grow their business. The only problem is hiring. And if that's the problem, that's the only thing you do. So bookkeeping, legal, every other possible thing, cleaning the trucks, sharpening the blades, doing your mechanics, like if you're fixing the mower, forget it. You're not doing that anymore. Tie your hands, pretend you don't know mechanics like me. I don't have a clue how to do a carburetor. I don't even know what a carburetor is. I've never done that stuff. And it's been my biggest benefit because I've, I've had to let other people do those things and focus on the things that actually grow the company. How often would you raise prices? I would raise my prices until I lose 20% of customers. We've raised our prices to existing customers three times in the past 12 months. Okay, so every, every I wouldn't do that often usually, but with inflation, that's how fast things are going up. And we've lost less than 5% of customers, so we'll keep raising prices. You have to remember that the, there's a lot of pain in transferring a vendor. You're concerned, like, oh man, $5 more per cut, oh man. You know what the customer's thinking? Oh, five bucks, thank goodness. I don't have to go find another vendor that I don't trust, don't know if they're gonna do a good job, don't know the, how they do billing, don't know if they're a friendly face, don't know if they come with a uniform. That's a lot of risk for someone who has a high value property. You gotta remember, if you're servicing a, a, an affluent retiree, most of their net worth is tied up in their real estate. You are servicing their net worth. You're making sure their most valuable asset, the thing that they literally have their retirement wrapped up in, is maintained. Oh no, I'm just a lawn care guy. Forget it, you're maintaining their best asset, their net worth, everything is hinging on you doing a good job. If you think about it like that, you'll raise your prices. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, with Augusta, what's your targeted close rate to get to that um, maximum profit? Yeah, so, if you're trying to max a very different, right? Two, this is why people get confused. But hear me say one thing, and that is like, grow your business, grow your business, all about close ratio. And the next words out of my mouth are, we have a 30 to 40% close ratio. Because that's where I see the money, the profit maximization being. So we raised our prices, raised our prices, raised our prices to the point where I only want, I don't want to keep growing. So I'll be at 30 to 40% close ratio. If someone's trying to grow in our company, I tell them over 70% is what you need. That's why if you're over 70, 80, I just don't understand why you're not growing. Right? You should be growing at that size, and then you get to a stage, okay, I'm, I'm fine here. Like, I'm in stage two. I don't need to go to stage three. I want more employees. Great. Raise your prices. Keep your leads on. Why would you not, think about it like this, why would you not pay $15 to take a customer that's willing to pay a higher price and then remove one of your lowest paying customers by raising their price and then you lose them, kick them out, and bring in for 15 bucks, put a brand new one that's willing to pay your premium price. So keep your leads on. At the very worst, you're gonna keep upgrading your client list. At the very best, you're gonna keep growing. <laughs> yeah, so um, what Dan had said there is really important in terms of hiring friends, family, and then looking for like the friends of the friends of the friends. That's great. The problem that runs into is when you're really scaling, right? So if you're getting four or five employees, that is the route to go. People you know and who, they, who know them and so on and so forth. We give our guys $500 if they can get someone else to join the team, $250 at the day of signing, $250 after six weeks, okay? That's a great incentive. 
As you grow past that though, you know, the one location has 20, we have other locations that have more than that, you, you just tap out of people that know the company. And so that's when you have to go advertise Indeed, Facebook, etc. And then you just gotta get really good at uh, doing interviews. So again, like we talked about this morning, if the only thing you need to, need to grow your business is hiring, you need to figure out how do I create a system around getting good people into my organization, right from interviewing, or sorry, right from applicant, right at the front. All right, so let's think about it like this. We all get trained at, at you know, training here about taking a, a lead into doing a quote, into doing a proposal to them in person, and then sending that quote to them, and then doing the job, and then doing follow-up. We all get that, right? Makes perfect sense. The same thing, because the only bottleneck, that's not the bottleneck for anyone here. We all just admitted that this morning. We don't have any problem finding work. Great. We need to think about the same way when it comes to hiring. Instead of thinking about a lead, I want you to think about an applicant. And now the applicant, when they come and apply for you, like the same way a lead comes to you, they're like, I want service. Do you just let them, like, you, you give them an estimate and then just like hope and cross your fingers and hope they, they uh, come back? No, you call them, hey, did you get my estimate? Do you have any questions about your estimate? Do you want me to go over it? Do you have any objections about the price? Anything like that? Why aren't we doing that with applicants? Why do we just get an application, send them an interview request, and then just never hear back? Why don't we follow up? Why do we, why do, we do an interview and then never follow up with them? Never follow up. Hey, do you have any questions? Do you have any questions about how we do P4P? Do you have any questions about how we do our, uh, our incentive program here? Why aren't we following up the same way that we would with an, a, a lead out in the field? Why, when we sell a customer, we make sure we send them you know, nice gifts, we say thank you to them, we put little treats underneath their, their uh, map for them, we give them a birthday card or a Christmas card or thank you gift card. But yet our employees, once we hire them, it's like, yeah, get in the truck, let's go. Like, why aren't we doing the same thing to them? Why don't we constantly resell ourselves to them? We talk about upselling all the time, looking for areas in your customer's property where you can make more money on. Why aren't we thinking about that when it comes to hiring? Taking your existing employees and trying to make them make more money. Hey, if you did this in a little bit different with your edging, you'd be able to make a little more on P for P. Oh, you know what, here, here's a, a gift card. I heard you, know, you and your uh, girlfriend are going out this evening. I like this restaurant, Take, check this out. Why aren't we doing that to them? We do that for customers all the time, but if the only bottleneck you have in your business is hiring, why are we not focused on that? Right? What resources do you recommend? Like, they want to learn, well, obviously, you have your content, but what, what stuff? Of course, not joking. What stuff, what stuff, <laughs> what stuff do you listen to, or where did you get your knowledge from? You yeah, like, I think um, the day you stop learning the day is the day you start dying, right? So every single day I'm listening to podcasts, books, sermons, you know, audio, who has Audible? Anyone know this? Everyone should download Audible. We have 400 books for our team that they can listen to. Everything about leadership, making money, business, real estate, investing, entrepreneurship. Uh, we have uh, book, uh, books from like audio autobiographies from the war. We have all sorts of stuff that they can listen to all day long. And I listen to the, the, the books I read. The stuff I listen to, they have free access to. Uh, I recommend everybody just listening all day long, especially if you're mowing. This is like eight hours a day where you're like, Like, why would you not plug into something that's going to give you a little more value than just a all day long? And it's better than like, just listen to something good, like an audible program, there's podcasts, you can literally learn from like the smartest people in the world. This morning, I was running up and down the road, um, listening to Joe Rogan interview Mark Zuckerberg, guy who started Facebook. Like, that's nuts! For free! Didn't pay a single dollar! I'm flying across the entire earth to come over here to Australia to learn for the week. And I'm talking, and here I'm listening while I'm running to the, like a billionaire, like, a, like one in a billion guy for free. Why in the world are we not tapping into that every single day? So I'm just constantly trying to learn. I'm going to talk one more question. One more question. Cool. Going once, going twice. Yeah. Um, yeah, like, uh, man, that's tough. So I don't do a ton of interviewing anymore, but if you want to see a really controversial video, about two weeks ago, I interviewed someone and I recorded it. And I got a ton of flack online. If you go on Facebook, it has like 600,000 views already, and people just demolished me. Like, just, I'm like the worst human in the world, potentially. So, um, yeah, like, so I actually broke down his body language in the video of how he sat when I asked certain questions what he did to be able to kind of read what was happening. If they talk bad about a previous employer, they're gonna talk bad about you. Like, people don't change. Um, and when I said that on a video, people just like freaked out. If they're late to the interview, no go. 
People freaked out about that. If they, um, you know, say, you know, say they only do drugs occasionally, I, I don't believe them. I'm sorry. Like, I'm just skeptical. So uh, the thing is, though, hire fast and fire fast, right? So especially if you're having a trouble finding people, just hire them. Give them a shot. Especially if you're solo, you can let them work with you for a day, right? Uh, make sure you sign off on the thing that we heard on training. Like, sign off that from a liability standpoint. Like, we can't do that anymore because we don't have. The, I'm not out in the field with the guys. Um, but if you are a solo operator, especially your first employee, I'd hire everyone with a pulse and try them out for a day. Because like, who knows? Maybe they're good. I can't do that when you have 20 guys and then you're putting them into a truck and equipment and all the rest of it without my direct eyeballs on them all day long. But that's what I would do. If you're trying, to, if you're struggling to find your first person, like I'm sorry, I don't have any sympathy. I just don't. You can hire anyone that's willing to apply, try them out for a day, you have eyes on them all day long, and you don't even need P for P because the only reason you need P for P is to, uh, is to manage unmanaged labor. When you are the owner on the property with eyes on them every single day, like you're working with them all day, you don't need P for P because you are actively managing them. You only need P for P when they go drive out the, the, the driveway every morning and you're not with them. So I hire everybody if you're a solo operator. I just be, hey, you want to try out for it? Make, let, this is how you sell it. Let's make sure it's a good fit for you. And if you like it after the first day, I'll give you a job. Right? And then you go with them for a day. If you don't like them, you don't give them the job. So, cool. Epic? Great. Thank you all. I appreciate it. Thanks, Mike. Can I take this? Yeah, go. Ours is empty. No worries. Thanks, Mike. And as I said, we were very lucky. We just dumb luck that we had Mike over here doing the training and we sort of forced him up to you to do that. So we hopefully got a lot of value off it. This will be all recorded as well. So all the recordings we're going to make available as a YouTube video if you want to watch it. MikeAndys.com to find out about all this stuff as well. We did do an interview with him the other day, which goes into a bit more detail as well about all the stuff you're hearing. So don't worry about jotting it down. We do have it as a video as well. So John is a franchisee, now a franchisor. He's just become a franchisor recently. And you've got a crew of six or seven people. You got, you got a factory, utes, all that sort of stuff, so it's probably very applicable for everyone here. John has built his business, so we'll hand it over to you, John. All right? Big round of applause for John. I tried to get all. So, how are you? It's going to be hard because. Jesus, Mike. Where'd you go? Aren't you up and about? No, I got one. Oh, you got one? I got one. This bike never said anything when I was in training, it was very quiet. Then he gets up here and he comes to life. It's amazing how people come to life. And he was talking about employing staff. So um, it is. So you decide when you're going to employ someone, and you talk when you're at full capacity. So if you're at full capacity now in spring, are you going to become more efficient really quickly? Probably not, because it's going to take time to train them. Mike says a couple of weeks. Sometimes it can take longer. Are you better in the middle of winter when it's a bit quiet and you want to get up to that full capacity? So it's the first time you've employed someone. We're talking, you're not employing new staff. So do you go, okay, I'm going to take a small hit on profit, but I'm going to get them up and training. And when we're fully up and running and leads are at a million miles an hour, we've got the capacity to take on the extra work. Because they will drain you even for a couple of weeks if you get them up to speed, if they've got no skills. Okay, so that's how you sort of, you've got to think about that when you want to grow your business. When am I going to do it? You're not necessarily going to sometimes employ someone, like you said, it's not, you're doing 10,000, you're not going to double your profit because they're never going to work as hard as you. Or it's going to take time to get them to the 8,000, it might be 6,000 for the first month, 7,000, 8,000, and you finally get them there. Okay, now you've got them at capacity and where do you want, where you want them. So it's, it's, it's something you've got to think about when you're going to do it. For me, when I go to employ people, I'm trying always thinking, like when I started to, so if I employed my first person, okay, my next person, I started to think in March, we're going to struggle when spring hits. So I need to start thinking about employing now. Six months out and start to get them trained up for the next time. So I'm starting to forward plan where all our work is, okay? Um, Mike talks about not turning on leads, okay, about work. I hardly turn, I don't turn on leads. Our, growth, our business has grown by itself. So you can see the planning in, we can see the business just growing on its own by itself. So think about when you're going to employ, because it can be hard and what capacity you're going to get. Um, now, who do you employ? If you're a single person in the truck, I'm an old man, 
okay? You're going to put an 18-year-old kid in there with you in that truck. What are the dynamics in that truck going to be? Are you going to go, Jesus, all they want to listen to is Nova 100 or something or talk about, I don't know what they're talking about. So you've got to think. So then you go, but the 18-year-old kid's really good, so I've got to get my brain around their conversation, okay? So what their conversation is. So you're thinking about what sort of person am I looking for? Am I looking for a more mature person that I can have a conversation in the truck? It's even if you've got a second truck, the person in that truck's a really good employee and you're going to stick some niff-naff that's going to bore them to tears that they want to jump out the door. So they're becoming less efficient. So it's really important about the dynamics of the, tru of the truck and also the dynamics of what's going on inside that truck. Okay, we'll talk a bit more about that. So that, yeah, so whether you're a young person, a mature person, so what do you want to do? Um, do you want full-time or casual? I'm actually a big time for full-time employees because you know what that does? It gives them security. You know, that's what I reckon the problem is out in the labour force now. We, we don't want to pay them all their, um, right, their, uh, priv their um, sick pay holiday, entitlements, that's the word I was looking for, all their entitlements. So we pay them casually. Okay, well, that's really good, but I want a day off today and they're a casual employee. Well, what can you do? Nothing. The person then, if they're a good employee and you give them security, do you reckon they're going to reward you then? They're more rewarded to you. You're giving them security. They can go on holidays. They get paid. They can get sick. They get paid. Their children get sick. They're going to get a day's pay. You're rewarding the person for working for you. You're treating them like a really good human being. I honestly believe that's half the problem with the why people chop and change now. There's too much casual and not enough invested in and giving them security and making them feel wanted and loved in your organisation. We, we treat people a bit like numbers. So you sort of got to think about that. I just employ full time. That's the odd casual person because that's they come to me from a friend or something and that's what they want and they're good, you know, they just that's what they need. Um, then you've got to think, you want a skilled person so you don't have to train them much. God, in this labour force, good luck finding one. And it's really tricky. It's hard. Cause, and I give, so you get skills. Be a bit careful with skills. We had a recent employee, and I'm just giving you a tip when you come to employ. Had all the tickets, TAFE tickets in the world. Made me look like I knew nothing. And they were bloody hopeless. They had no skill at all. All they had was pieces of paper where they'd sat in there and been told, you can do this. Okay, so be a little bit careful when they say their skills. Try and find out what their skills actually are. I actually like, I don't mind not a lot of experience at all. You can train them your way. It's not, it's not rocket science what we're doing. It's not difficult. Push a mower, cut a hedge, cut it, mow straight lines. It's pretty quick to try and teach that. Well, I'm talking about mowing because I'm in mowing. Sorry, there's other people. But the skills we're doing, it's not as difficult as we make it out to be. And you can train people. We've all probably come into this industry with no skill and taught ourselves with very little skill and upskilled ourselves very good. So you can do the same thing with your staff. It's quite a good way to try and train people. And then you get them to your system and to your business and the way we do work. Does that make any sense? Apprenticeships are another good one. You know, you give person a skill. They get a qualification at the end. Young people, everyone, you know, so at the end of the day, especially in our, like in my industry, an apprenticeship, um, you can get a skill and then it can take you other ways if you leave. Okay? So think about that. And there are some good benefits. The government do pay you some good, um, some, some good benefits with apprentices at the moment. So it's good, but it's hard to find them. You've just got to go through. When you come to look for staff, everyone goes how hard it is. Try and take that out of your mind. Because you've got a negative thought in your head that this is going to be difficult. You've got to really go how, you know, it's not that difficult. People will come along, try and have a positive attitude towards it. You know, you've got to find, you know, you've got to have that positive attitude. So at least that way when someone comes in, you're up and about about who's coming in. You're up and about, okay? Um, and, you know, like I said, what that brings to your team. Okay, where do you find them? Employment, so employment sites are good. 
Anyone ever use the employment sites? Yeah. You get some good laughs off the employment sites too. So some great applications. I had one who applied and said he wasn't a psycho and he didn't want to kill me, he just wanted a job. <laughs> I kid you not. That was, that was worth the $385 I paid for that month for that ad boy because it gave me the greatest laugh. I actually wanted to interview him to see what the hell happened. But anyway, I didn't. My wife wouldn't let me. She said, you can't do that to someone. Apprenticeship groups, they're, always diffi they're still difficult because they struggle like anyone to find them. Um, now, when you get older, ask your friends because there's always kids or people or someone hasn't got a job. There's other people out there and they're normally really good because they'll come with good personalities, good skills, good work ethics. They come from that same sort of group of people that you're hanging around with. So friends and stuff from anyone. People walked up to you in the street. TAFEs are another place. We do a lot of TAFE courses now. Governments are paying for all these TAFE courses. The kids get all these TAFE certificates and they're looking for jobs. Ring the TAFE. Say, I've got a job. Who wants a job? And there'll be TAFE guys in there that'll go, yeah, here you go, mate, here's a job. Because remember, those TAFE teachers also get marked. Am I supposed to stand there or am I allowed to walk around, Joel? I just saw that cry. <laughs> I walk around everywhere and wave my hands around. Um, so, yeah, those are TAFE TAFE places, the good TAFE teachers will find those kids jobs as well and they'll probably give you the good kids that are at the TAFE. Okay, ring TAFEs. Find out where the jobs are coming. Um, interview, you talked about an interview, Mike. I interview someone, talk, to you. find out about the person. Don't worry about their skills. You want to find out who they are, what sort of person they are. Well, you know, families they come from is good. You know, do they, what sort of family do they come from? What are their hobbies? Good look, look on Facebook, you'll soon find out stuff because idiots put everything on Facebook. You know, drugs, whatever they're doing. You'll soon find out what they're going on. They put everything on Facebook. But when you come to the interview, you know, find out who they are as a person. You know, what they do, their interests, you know, their family life. A lot of people come from hard family lives and they really want to go. And, and you can encourage them. So just talk to the person, find out. I like putting them in the truck with me. I love it. Put them in the truck for a day. I might put them in the truck with me or someone else at work. And they come around and they wander around and we find out who they are. And we pay them for the day. And if they're happy, they stay. If they're not, if we're not happy, we just get rid of them. We part off and they've got a day's labour. And we move on to the next person. Because you can't really tell what's going on. And then sometimes they know what goes on in the job. So, um, and you know what, one of the rewarding things I find from employing people, it's not just about monetary value, okay, yeah, we've got to make a monetary return, but it's also you develop these great human beings. Um, we've been really lucky, you know, we've got, we've trained up people, we've, people come with a lot of issues now, there's a lot of issues out in society. And work is one of the best things we ever do for people. It gives them purpose in their life. Their whole demeanor changes. You'll see these people come in like this for a job interview. And after about two weeks, they stand up straight. Their life is in their face. They feel like they belong in society. And you, you start, I go to work and look at them and go, how much fun is this? The person's come to life. So you've got to think about what else is coming out of this for you. It's monetary, yep. But there's also the reward of you now getting a human being, and that human being, when you develop them up, all of a sudden can be running another truck, running another staff member, and they bring so much to you. So, you know, we've got that. We've trained up apprentices at one apprentice that won two apprenticeships of the year. So that becomes really rewarding when we see that apprenticeship of the year twice in a row. Never happened at TAFE, never happened with a gyms bloke. I'm really proud of that fact. We have a guy who has really bad mental health issues, right? And he, he quit. He quit after two days. He said, I'm effing shit at this, I quit. And I took him aside and I brought him back in. And Tom has some issues, he does some things and he runs off. But we look after him and he's come to life and he's got purpose and he's really good. And I feel really good about myself because if he wasn't for us and the culture we bring into our work and how we treat everybody, and we, we give them the bonuses, the little things. We pay, you know, yesterday we paid for everyone's lunches at work and so everyone was happy and they do those little bits and they're all happy to come to work. But Tommy's probably the greatest thing I ever have done. 
all monetary values aside, to see Tom flourish as a human being, he come out of the army with all these issues, is the proudest thing I reckon I've ever done. So employing people, apart from monetary value, brings you a lot of things. Growing your business. So have a crack, but you've got to have that positive attitude about when you're employing people. Just keep churning through, be happy. Someone will turn up eventually. And the other thing is you do get people who leave. I've had two apprentices leave. Then they ring me back and say, I completed my apprenticeship and thank you very much, John, for the opportunities you gave us for the couple of years we were here to start with. Just didn't work out for one reason or another. I reckon that's a good... That's a good thing if you can do that. That's the culture you bring to your thing. That's what I say about full-time employment. It engage them in their family. Bring them into your, you know, make it like it's a big family. They are your family. There's big rewards in employing people. No questions? He's taken all the questions. Have you tried, um, have you tried to go to like a local high school or something to do like detail and stuff? Or what about, let's say, disability providers? You have, let's say, young adults who come to the job and they physically look I probably haven't tried them. I do use someone who has some disability. He doesn't have disability. He's got uh, he's slight learning issues. He lives around the corner from home. Lovely kid. We use him a bit. And we don't expect much from him, but we put him out there and he picks up a bit of rubbish and he carries on and he helps us. High schools I haven't tried. We do have one kid working from VCAL for us for work experience, which is supposed to be for $5 a day. We don't give him $5 a day. I can't do that to the poor kid. <laughs> Can't. Well, we probably all did work experience. Said most of you do work experience to get the five to three dollars a day. I think back when I did it. Um, yeah. So that human development thing. You know, the other thing is reward. So employing people, you know, helps you to grow your business. Okay. Also, don't forget, like Mike said, you're it. If you're an only person in that truck, and you're driving around working like a madman. Okay, and you're earning, you probably are earning good money, but you go on holidays, guess what? You're earning jack. You're earning nothing. Not a cent. Your business is stopped. Is it a business? No, I just reckon it's a hard working job. That's what I classify it as. Now, if I've employed somebody or I've got a couple of employees that go on holidays, guess what's happening? They're generating income while I'm away. They're keeping the business ticking over. So your business is still running. The business is just not dependent on you. It's now a business. You're not the face of the business. You're not the number one man. So you sort of got to then, when, if you put another truck on, you've got to let those reins go out and trust the people to do what they do. Send them out with all the tools and all the information and the schedules and everything and trust they're going to do it. And look at what's going on and what they're bringing in. Um... Yeah, and development of people, that's what I always said. Now, and Mike touched on this, don't expect them to work like you. They're never going to work that hard. You're not going to double revenue. They're not, it's not their business. And sometimes they're not going to come to work and they're, not, and they're, not all, they're, going to get, they're not always going to be motivated to work that hard. You've got to try and keep them upbeat and try and push them along, but they're not always motivated. One of the big downfalls is, I always say, as long as my phone doesn't ring before 6.15 in the morning, I know they're all coming to work and that's when I'm in the sweet spot of the day that all my planning is work because they ain't ringing at 6 o'clock going, I woke up early today, John, can I come to work? <laughs> no one's doing that. They're going to be sick. And if you get these issues, I got one guy who'd worked for another guy. He had so many days off sick. So you know what I did? I put, and he was a good worker. I put him aside and I said, this can't go on. I can't work like this. You've had this many days off. I know you don't get paid. Stiff. I need you to come to work because we rely on you. Every time you don't come to work, you let down the rest of us because someone else has to pick up the slack. Not necessarily me, someone else in the, in the organisation. So you put, put the pressure back on them. Guess what? Steps up. He, another guy at work, he worked with him for 10 years. So I can't believe how much he turns up for work now because we put the pressure back on him. We didn't mean that he had to come to work, but he was failing all his workmates. So we made him accountable for just taking stupid sick days off because he couldn't be fagged coming to work or something. So you make him accountable and then he has, he's picked up his act. To his credit, he's picked up his act and you know what? Then you go and tell him, mate, I'm so proud of the way you've developed. You've stopped taking those stupid days off. You're here at work. And when he rings up sick, he's just about crying because he doesn't, he doesn't want to ring up sick. So we've encouraged him to come. Uh, any questions? That's all I've got.
But when you go out with employing people, take that positive attitude. Don't take a negative attitude. And keep churning and burning a few of them. You'll get through it. Remember, we're not employing future leaders of the country in some of our jobs, especially in mowing. I'm talking about mowing. So, when we're not. No, no, no. One of my mates said this, and it made a lot of sense. It was, a, I know it sounds a bit disrespectful, but it makes a lot of sense because then you get your brain around it and you go, they're not necessarily going to be stimulating conversation or whatever, but you get your brain around it, then you, you know what you're going to employ. So then that person actually becomes more valuable to you because you understand that person. Does that make sense? Yeah, you understand that person. So then you start to think and have that conversation with them about what they do in their lives, okay? The things they do and the things that makes them happy. And then you know what happens? They keep turning up to work. They keep turning up to work. And even like, if you have different trucks, find the dynamics of, I don't know, do you do it trying to find the dynamics of two people in a truck? We don't really know. No. You're sort of more friend, yeah. So you're trying to find, when we put out there, trying to find two people who fit well together in the truck. Because then you know what? Each of them want to come to work because they want to have that social conversation while they're moving around in the truck or they're at work. So that's really important. Same as they don't want some old man boring about how his wife's nagging the hell out of him to do whatever or whatever. I do that the dynamic thing in the truck. Yeah, it works. There's two guys in my truck who love punting and they're texting each other all day and night and they work really well together. I put another bloke in there that, with him once and he only talks about his sport and racing this is one of my really good mates too. I put another bloke in there and he said to me, well, he doesn't talk about anything. He's got, you've got to get him out of the truck. I'm going to throw him out of the truck. He's not going to leave me, but I've gone, okay, no worries. I'll sort it out for you. I was trying to get him to train him up. But yeah, that dynamics in the truck, it's important. So you can then, those people want to come to work and that's what you've got to do. You've got to encourage people to come to work. So full-time staff, rewards like you said, whether it's monetary, buying them lunch, a slab of beer, you know, chocolates and drinks in the fridge when they get back, um, whatever it is, letting them, you know, whatever it is, it, it makes them feel like they're a part of us and they're part of my family. A question on life that mate that's gone, do you have a probation period? If they are no good, how do you say it's not working and moving on? Um, <laughs> well, sometimes it can be a week. Sometimes, it, yeah, it's normally three months, we'll say. We give them a probation of three months, but normally you'll pick it up within probably a week and say, look, you don't fit us. You've got to remember in Jim's mowing, okay, we go bang, 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 bang. It's not for everybody because it's a lot of moving around. Those people probably want to cancel a job where they're just sitting in, on their butt and a ride on or whatever and not doing much. So, yeah, I give them about three months, but normally within, I reckon, two weeks you can tell. Oh, yeah, there's a standard. You can get that off Fair Work Australia. There's a standard contract you can download off Fair Work Australia. And you just fill in your yeah, yeah, just fill in your details. Okay. Hmm. And that specifies all your... Well, you can put stuff in there as well. But, yeah, it gives you the three months probation. Okay. But you talk to... When they first start, keep communicating with people. No, yeah, you know... If it's not really done, then if the expectations are not clear on both sides... Yeah, don't be too fearful about everything. Don't be too fearful that the world's going to come crashing down on you. You know, I had someone quit the other week, Monday morning. They ring up in tears, oh, I'm sick, I can't come to work, I quit. And I go, yeah, good on you, whatever, don't come back, we'll pay you out for the end of the week, see you later. And get rid of them. I don't want that virus inside my workplace. Because I reckon if they're there, they'll start bitching. And they start, it's a virus is inside, so then they might create some negativity somewhere out. So I just throw them out. I did have an apprentice who wanted to move closer to home and she was in tears thinking I was going to throw her out the door in two weeks, but she was a different staff member. But that sort of, you, you create, sometimes people go, okay, it's all good, but yeah, get rid of that virus out of your place. Get it out. Pay it out. Don't worry about it. Get it out. You don't want the virus there. They're not happy there, then too bad. We're a good place. You create that culture in that place where you want to be. Think about... I hate that word culture, but footy clubs bring that in very well. And they develop this big family where they're all in together and all unity. You watch sporting clubs when they're playing really well. Do you reckon it's because they're more skilled than other sides? I don't reckon it is. I reckon it's because they all want to be together and they're all for the greater cause of, each, of the, the goal. 
whatever the goal, the goal is. So the goal is for us to get our work done. So they're all for that cause. So we all pull together in one direction. I reckon footy clubs get their culture or the sporting clubs get their culture right and the people, they come for the ride. You get them for the ride. Get them for the ride. But you know what? And it just digressed fractionally. He talked about why don't you turn your leads on, employ people. You're all here to want to grow your businesses, aren't you? You're all brave human beings before you were here. You bought a Jim's Man franchise and you stepped out of the school. You stepped out of being a normal person and made change. Most of you aren't young people, okay? It's not like you were 19 and decided, I didn't like mowing lawns, so now I'm going to go and become an accountant. You had done something and you made a change. So you're really brave human beings. So be brave in the next step in your business. You've already done the bravest thing. The rest of it's really easy. You've taken the big step. You know, encourage yourself and go for it. Make that step. You've, you've made the step today. You've, wasted, you've spent a good day, a Saturday, a weekend in here to try and learn. And listen to me bang on and Joel bang on and Dan bang on and Jim and Rocky and all of us. So let's make something out of it. Take the step. It's not that scary. What's the worst that happens? You fail? Oh, Jesus. Give me a break. You know what? I'd sooner have failed a million times than never have tried to fail. So come on, have a crack. You'll be right, I promise you. If you've got any questions when you have a crack, ring me up. I'm happy. I'll talk you through it. I'll help you as much as you can. Have a crack. I do it at training. No, you can ring me and you can contact me from 5 a.m. in the morning till 8 p.m. at night, six days a week, and I will answer my phone. If I don't answer my phone at, six, at 5 a.m., um, there'll either be two reasons. I can't hear it or I died. Can you see that? Now, that's my number. All right. Yeah, I'm happy to help. Really, I am. I'm happy to help everyone. I love this. This is a big family. It's a big family. We're all here to help each other and grow and make ourselves better, and our lives great. All right. All good? Thank you. <laughs> all right. You guys thought you got rid of me. Not that easy. Um, I'm back. And uh, the whiteboard, it's working this time. Um, I wanted to chuck something out there to you guys, um, which is when we're winning jobs. Now, I was able to charge some high prices, as I told you before, you know, $3 a minute. We have this guy here, magic man on our shirt. That is the reason, I'm, I'm gonna use this again because it still sucks. Um, and I got to a point where I had that much demand in my business where I was even, now Jim told me when I went to training, uh, he told me, well, he told everyone, uh, if you're winning more than, I think it was eight out of 10 jobs, your prices are too cheap. And I took that very literally. And so I, uh, I went out there and I was creating demand and charging $3 a minute for once off jobs. And sure enough, I was still winning more than eight out of 10 jobs. Uh, especially when I was on the tools. Um, this is, this is, you guys can see I'm really struggling with this whiteboard. <laughs> anyway, so that's good enough. Um, I started charging even more. I got to the point where I was over $200 an hour for my once-off jobs um, to try and see if I could bring the, bring the uh, success rate back down. Um, and so one of the things that I realized while I, was, while I was out there quoting, and I quoted a lot of jobs, as Mike said before, um, when you're out there driving and meeting up with customers, you can only really do like eight to 10 quotes a day, which is very true, because um, that's what I was doing. Uh, when I had six employees on, I was going out quoting 10 jobs a day, every day. Um, and then I would you know, find time to do all the other little stuff that is involved with running a business. Um, and I assume, yeah, you, de you could definitely quote a lot more if you're doing the other two options that you've got. I thought that was great. I, I really enjoyed what you said there. but. Um, Anyways, I, 
I realized that um, I, I created a process for how to do a quote. Um, and I realized that the most important part of the process is actually your time to get to respond to the customer. Definitely the most important part. So the, the, the customer will drive past the gym's mowing trailer. So they know they need their, their lawns done and they usually think, oh geez, who am I gonna call? Now when they think of mowing, they usually think of gyms like I do. Um, but when they pass one of the gym's mowing trailers or see an ad on their Facebook or they Google or whatever it is, they go, yep, all right, cool. I remember that's right. I've got to get my gardening done. We'll get gyms. So they call our number 131546. They get on the phone to one of our call center operators. And then that call center operator sends the lead out to us um, and tells us, tells the customer they'll call us back, that we'll call back within two hours. Now, when that happens, now, while I was out on the job, I realized that I couldn't feel my phone in my pocket all the time, or for whatever reason, when you're really sweaty and, you, and you're working hard, your phone will naturally unlock itself or go into like disabled mode or whatever it is. I don't know if that's happened to many of you guys while you're out working. So I got a, I got a smartwatch, um, and the smartwatch would help me uh, be able to know when my phone was calling so I could get onto the customer straight away. Um, and as I said, the most, thing, the most important thing is to, uh, to not de uh, delay. You need to get onto that customer straight away. So when a lead would come through, I would call up within the first five minutes of that lead coming through, but always within the first five minutes. Now, most of the time, I was actually probably within 30 seconds. Um, so I come up with this, uh, I don't know what you would call, like an acronym almost, uh, for a process that I used for quoting jobs. I figured out exactly what it was for the reason that I was always winning jobs and also why I was always getting five-star reviews. And uh, what I did was I come up with a word for it and it was just so happened to be a word that fit this. So I wanted to share this with you guys and hopefully this will be something that can help you guys out to win more jobs as well. Um, so the word is droplets. Now it's a, it's a weird word, but trust me that the process makes sense. Um, as I said, I, I didn't pick the, the word for the process. Like I could have gone and said, oh, Let's do a quote and come up with some random stuff to put on there to make it make sense, but no. Um, so the most important thing with, with when, you've, uh, when you're trying to convert a job, and especially if you, um, if you want to get paid a good amount for it as well, and have a happy, satisfied customer, is uh, don't delay. Um, so uh, as I said, I would, you know, I would call that customer within five minutes, often within 30 seconds. When I was speaking to the customer on the phone, I was finding out exactly what it is that that customer wanted. So if they wanted a catch mode, if they wanted their front back nature strip done, if they, maybe they wanted hand weeding, maybe they wanted their gutters clean, whatever it was, I was figuring out exactly what that customer wanted, uh, create some sort of a relationship with them while I was on the, uh, on the call to them, and then I'd organize a time to go out there. Now, the time that I organized to go out there, I would always, nearly every single quote, nine times out of 10, I'd be able to quote it on that day. Um, and the reason I was able to do that was because I realized that my capacity for, for doing lawn mowing jobs uh, on the average day would be anywhere between 12 to 14, depending on the day. So what I would do is I'd only put on between eight to 10 jobs for the day so that I had spare time for myself so I could do more quotes and put on uh, more jobs throughout the day if I needed to. So uh, I, I wouldn't delay and then I would do a quote that day. And it's, let's say it's 9 a.m. in the morning, I would tell that customer I'll be out there between 10 and 12. And as soon as possible, like the second that I, the fastest possible time I can get there, I was there. So I'd get out there between um, between 10 and 12, but it wasn't between 10 and 12. I was actually getting out there. My target was, I'd tell the customer between 10 and 12, my target was between 10 and 10.05. Um, now, if you tell a customer 10 o'clock on the dot, obviously, if you rock up there at 10.05, you're late. So we all know that we do two-hour time periods. But I'd get there between 10 and 10.05. And the customer was always very impressed from my reaction time or my response time to be able to get there, my punctuality. Um, so I wouldn't delay. I would respond to the customer um, and you know, obviously figure out what, exactly what it is they need, try and build that relationship while I'm on the phone. I'd organize the quote. Um, so I'd obviously organize the time. Um, and then I also, as you guys heard before, I have formulas that I have in place to be able to figure out what a job should be worth. Similar to what Mike has when he does something on the phone and he says, oh, we have the area square meter, the property is $60 for whatever reason. I have something very similar that I use as a formula to be able to figure out what a, a lawn mowing job should be worth. Um, and so I have that for, for hedging, for weeding, for everything. Um, so I'd organize, I'd already know roughly how much the job should be before I go there. Um, and then I'd make sure that I'm punctual. I'd make sure that I want to be there within the first five minutes, as I said. Now, 
when I get there, um, I'm going to be taking a look around the property and I'm going to try and see if I can notice anything that something that that customer cares about or something that means something to that customer. Maybe they have a German Shepherd, uh, that they, they, a dog that they like, or they've got a really nice car, or they've got something that they care about. It could be anything. Or maybe it's an extra service that needs to be done that they haven't even noticed it needs to be done. Um, and that would go towards building that relationship with that customer. Now, what I want to do next is I'm going to walk around the whole property with the customer, and I'm going to listen to them. Um, about exactly what their expectations are. Because I, I can look at the property and I can go, this is what I would do, but I want to find out what they want exactly. So I listen to exactly what the customer wants, and then to get even more information out of them, I ask them questions about it as well. So if they haven't given me the exact idea of what they want done, I ask them questions as well. So I listen and ask. So I know I now know exactly what their idea of the perfect job is here. Now, nine times out of oh, as you guys would know, the reason the customers use our services, now, we're not the cheapest, we're actually the most expensive, probably by far as well, and so we should be. Um, but the reason the customer uses us is because they know we're the best person for the job. Um, every time, we're very convenient, and we're the best person for the job. You know you're going to get a good job when you go to gyms. We have a guarantee. Um, so, you know, I've, get, I've found out exactly what their expectations are. I'm now, this is the, re the big reason why they use us we're the experts, the local experts. I'm going to give them expert advice. I'm going to give them my opinion of what I think needs to be done at this property. So they've already told me what they want done. I'll then put in whatever it is I think that needs to be done. So maybe they'll say, I want it catch mode. I want vertical edge, whatever it bloody well is. I might say, oh, well, looking at this property, it probably looks like you actually need to have it mulch mode because you need more nutrition in the ground. It looks like you might need to have a bit of a fertilizer too. Whatever it possibly is, we want to give them the best advice. That's why they're using us. We are the best of what we do. Afterwards, we're going to thank the customer. Now, uh, when you're thanking the customer, this is going back to building that relationship with the customer. If the customer loves you, like really loves you and really likes who you are, they know you're the best person for the job, you've already pretty much got the, one, the job won. Like, we know that we could probably charge an extra 50% in another company, but if that customer absolutely loves you, they will use you. So when you're thanking a customer, you need to adjust the way that you're speaking with a, with a customer depending on what, the, what it is that their idea of a perfect contractor is. So when I'm talking to... Little old lady, Margaret, she's 80 years old um, and she's got a little Maltese Shih Tzu or whatever it is, it's a little yap yap, um, even though I might sit there doing my head in. <laughs> I mean, um, what I'm doing is when I'm talking to Margaret, you know, I'm, my body language is I have my hands behind my back, I'm being really, really polite to her, really nice. I'm talking about my kids with her, I'm talking about my wife, I'm talking about the fact that I have a house right across the road from my wife's mum and dad. All that sort of stuff and I'm building that sort of relationship. I'm, I'm coming across as the most perfect gentleman in her eyes. And that's, and that's the whole idea. I want this customer to almost, you know how Jim always says, make every customer a fan? Well, that's what I'm trying to do. And then when I'm speaking with uh, bloke who's, uh, a bloke whose name is Bob and he drives trucks and watches the footy, I'm not going to be sitting there going, hey, Bob, how are you today? You know, absolutely not. I'm going to say, hey, mate, are you going to have a few beers on the weekend, watch the game, you know, what's been going on? This is exactly what I can do for you. So that's the sort of body language that I'm using for those people. And it's all part of... Um, as I said, you're going to do it at the start and also at the end, um, or all the way through, obviously. But you're going to thank the customer. And then ultimately, this is something that most people forget. It's very, very important. Send the quote. Even if you've said it in person to the customer, always send it through. Send it through as a text message. Send it through as an email. I don't care. As long as it's in writing, send through the quote so that the customer knows exactly what it is, dot, point, dot by dot, of exactly what it is that you're uh, completing at the property so that when you go to do, the job's been completed, you've already, uh, you've walked through it, you've, you've done the job, you've accepted the quote, you've done the job, then when you go back through and do another walkthrough, which is what I did with every single once-off job and uh, regular visit for the first visit, I would always do a follow-up walkthrough with the customer and I'd go through the quote and I'd go through the dot points of exactly what it is that customer accepted and make sure that they're 100% happy with everything. If there is anything that they were, if there's something that they might not have been all that happy with, I then have the opportunity to be able to fix it on the spot. It leads to being able to create a better impression with that customer. They'll have a lot more trust in me and I guarantee they'll use me again in the future. And you won't run into any problems where they say this wasn't done because it's all on that quote as well. So if you remember this droplets thing, hopefully that'll help you out to being able to convert more work and also getting it at a better price too. So hopefully that helps you guys out. I just wanted to chuck that out there.
Yeah, okay. You're not talking about maybe that emotional... Because you don't have any emotions with your... None, none, none at all. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, a lot of people say I'm probably a little bit ruthless. Um, so, no, I don't, I don't really have that, that sort of emotional side of it. So, if, if sometimes, you know, you have your, your customers that want to sit there and have a talk with you because they might be the only person that you're talking to for the whole week. Um, I'm very business-orientated, business-minded. So I will explain to that customer, I'll say, you, I'm, so, I'm sorry, I can't hit, stay here to talk. I do have to get on and, and do some more jobs for the day. Um, thank you very much. And, you know, if you need anything, please let us know. Um, but if you've, you've, you'll have, you'll come across customers that are quite simply, I call them problem customers, that just give you a hard time. Maybe they don't pay uh, when they should be paying. Maybe they take over a month to pay or whatever it is. Uh, maybe you've gone out there and there's dog poo on the ground and you've asked them if they can pick up the dog poo on the ground and they don't do it. And you've told them that it'll be an extra cost to pick up the dog poo each visit and they refuse to pay that price and they still want the same service done. So with those sorts of customers, I pick and choose in my own business exactly the sort of clients that I want and exactly the sort of prices that I want as well. So if it doesn't match up to exactly what I'm wanting in my business, then they're, they're not a fit. So I'd bring on around three new regular customers a week, which isn't all that difficult to do, as most of you would probably know, especially if you are taking on plenty of leads and doing all the marketing that I was talking about before. It's not, not very difficult at all. Um, but because I'm able to take on so many regular customers a week, I also, um, any customers that are at my lowest price per minute point, now price per minute, the reason I say that um, is because I, the, the way that I quote is probably a little bit different to most people, but um, whoever's at the lowest price per minute point, I will give them a call, let them know that their price is going to go up by at least 20%. So I'll tell them what their price is going to be moving forward, and then they have the option to be able to accept it or not. Um, and if there are problem customers, then I, I will quite simply just move them along. And I might just say to them, look, I've consolidated my, my working area. No, I'm no longer servicing your area. You'll need to find another gardener and I'll, you know, either send them back to Jim's mowing or, or, or what have you. Um, so I don't really deal with customers that, um, there's some customers that just treat you really poorly. And I'm sure you guys have dealt with it. And maybe they pay well, but they treat you poorly. It's not worth having them. It's not worth having them. It's not worth the headache. You've, you've got a question? Um, if you send them back to Jim's mowing, yep. would it just come back to you? Uh, so you, obviously you put a note on the system and you call up Jim's first, put a note on the system, let them know that you're not going to be servicing that client. Now it depends if that customer needs to be red flagged. Maybe that customer does need to be red flagged. Maybe they're not worth sending them back to Jim's mowing at all. Um, but you know, if, if, it's, if the problem is um, that it, they just don't suit your sort of business, maybe they're a client that someone else might, might be able to take on. You know, one person's trash is another person's treasure. So if they're often a customer that someone else might fit in with their sort of uh, what they're wanting, then I'll send them back. And I'll always just put a note on the system. Um, so if that answers that question there. Um, but yeah, as I said, in, in my business, I, I, I was uh, very picky with the sorts of customers that I was bringing on, but I could be because I was bringing on so many. So I would usually, once a, one, uh, once a week, we would remove a customer from my business. We'd always do. The lowest price per minute customer would uh, give them a call every week and let them know that their price is going to be going up. So. Um, just a question. You spoke about your formula. You know, yeah, okay. form you had for so square meters to say lawns, but hedging and those <coughs> things that Absolutely. Well, what I'll do is I'll do the one for you for, for lawns. Now, obviously, not everyone's doing lawns here, but this will, this will uh, act as a, a guide, hopefully, for other people in other divisions as well. Um, but what I do is it won't work for anything under 450 square metres, and it won't work for anything over an acre. But uh, for mulch mowing, I do $11 uh, per, per minute. So um, I live in an area called Frankston. I don't know if you, many of you guys are familiar with Frankston. It's got quite the reputation. Um, so Frankston's an interesting area. We have Frankston North, which is, uh, people call it the Pines. It's where all the commission housing is. Uh, commission housing is, it's where you'll see all your VT Commodores. So pretty much every VT Commodore ever is there. Um, you know, and they've, they've all got the stock wheels on the back as well. Um, so, and they've got the cyclone fencing out the front. So that's Frankston North of Pines. Uh, lovely place, you should definitely go there. Um, and then you've got uh, Frankston, which is sort of middle class, almost, you know, middle class as middle class as can be in Frankston. Um, and so, you know, you've got houses there that are generally worth around, I don't know, six hundred to $800,000. You've got people that drive the average car, maybe they'll have, um, I don't know, what's something decent, just a Mitsubishi Triton or something like that. Um, and then, you know, they're just the average, average couple um, with, you know, a couple kids that are usually living in Frankston. 
And then you've also got Frankston South. Now Frankston South up on Oliver's Hill, close to Mount Eliza. You've got people who literally have like Lamborghinis and Ferraris in the areas. Um, they're driving Mercedes AMGs, most of them BMWs, whatever. Um, and the houses up there are, you know, millions of dollars, you know, mega, these, these people are mega rich. So it's a very interesting area, Frankston. And I had to grow my business around this area and try and figure out how to have some sort of idea how to quote all these jobs because you're dealing with three different types of people, very different. Um, so price per minute is what I come up with because the people in Frankston North, they have a certain budget they want to stick to. Um, and maybe for their lawn mowing, they won't go over $60 for, for a lawn mow. Um, the people in Frankston, you know, they've got a, um, they're a bit easier to deal with. Maybe they'll do $80 for a lawn mow or for an average property or whatever, whatever it may be. And then in the people in Frankston South, you know, the real toffee noses, um, really they don't care what the price is. They just, um, they just want it done perfectly. But they still, even though, you know, they act like they don't know what the price is, but they still somehow always try and knock you down anyways. But um, um, anyways, and so you've got these three different types of people. So what I would do is I'd realise that the people in Franks and North don't actually really care about if you're catch mowing it, doing vertical edges, making sure the property looks absolutely perfect. Um, they just want it cut. And so I realised that. The cut, they just want it cut. They just want it mulched. Like if you do bevel edges, they're happy with that. Um, so I... I if I would go out there and quote $80 for a lawn there for an average size lawn, most of the time they'd be like, no, I'm not paying it. And so I was sick of always constantly getting rejected for it, but I also wanted to help these people out because they literally just need their lawn cut. So I would give them the option of doing a mulch mow, um, and so which would be a, a cheaper price, which is $11 per 100 square meters. Um, and so you know, you'd know, you mulch it, bevel edges, blow it, cool, no worries, move along. If they needed weeding done, you're probably just gonna poison the weeds. They don't want anything special. Uh, bit of, give it a bit of a brush cut. And so um, if you, let's say the average size property is 600 square meters. So you've got a customer that's uh, at $66 there for $11 for, for mulch mowing. And then you've got your customers who want a catch mode and they want you to, they're happy if you use their green bin. Um, and then, so those sorts of customers, if you're using their green bin, you've got $12 per 100 square meters. Um, and you're able to do catch mowing. Remove that, uh, catch. And, so, and then you've got the customers who don't want you to use their green bin and they want you to take away the clippings, uh, which is at $14 per 100 square meters. And quite simply, if the, if the lawn is twice the length, it's gonna take twice the time to be able to mow it because you've got twice the amount of catches. I mean, you, can, you cannot, there's no way. If you've got twice the amount of catches, of course it's gonna take twice the amount of time. Um, so. Quite simply, if it's twice the length, you just double the price. It's triple, the, triple the length, you triple the price. I mean, it doesn't get much more simple than that. It will not work for anything over an acre, um, and it won't work for anything under you know, 450 square meters that you're gonna have to have, to have different prices for that. But ultimately, I mean, this, this works, uh, works pretty bloody well. And so you have, it's not perfect, but you have a guide um, for, for what the property should be. So as I said, mulch is 66. Uh, you know, uh, catch using their green bin would be 72, and what would that be? That would be 84, $14 for the 100, uh, 100 square meters. Um, and so when I'm going there, I already have some sort of a guide in my head of exactly what that property should be worth. So when I go out there, I feel a little more comfortable and knowing I'm not sitting there winging it and hoping that, you know, I come up with a number in my head while I'm out there. I've already sort of got it. Hey, Steve, can I ask a question? When you say per 100, like 500 square meter block, yep. is it the block or the turf size? Uh, so the actual full block. So what you do is you go into, because the issue is, is if you're out on the road like I was doing 10 quotes a day, there's no way in hell you're going to sit there and try and come up with the idea of how many, how much turf there is. It's not going to happen. You, you put the address into the top of your Google, and it doesn't matter what pops up, you put the address in, there'll be, you know, six different listings, and it'll say what the block size is. So you go, all right, that's the block size. Booyah, put it in. Now, it's not going to be perfect every time because there are going to be variables. There's going to be variances. There's, it might be times where it's a corner block, so you've got an extra nature strip to do. If it's a corner block, I usually put the price up by 20%. Um, so you take those variances into account. But ultimately, I mean, it's a pretty bloody good guide to go off if you're, if you're not sure what you should be quoting the job for. So that's how I do, that's the lawn mowing one, if that helps everyone out. No worries. Any questions? Yeah, there's one for hedging as well. I can send that through to you if you like. Make us, make you different to everybody else. So there's people who do care about their footprint. You know, they want um, eco-friendly, well, eco-friendly herbicides and pesticides, so organics 
and your battery power. So there is a marketplace there. It's trying to find that marketplace. Yes, you could probably charge a little bit more for it, but there is a market there, and it makes you stand out and different. You want to put a few different things on saying what you do. But, yeah, I, moving forward, battery, we're using a little bit high, very high-end battery, expensive, but it works great. To build equity? Yeah, that's the I need more information. What, um, what does it mean by build equity? Because yeah, yeah, maybe not put in there, Brad. What do you mean by more equity? But, um, yeah. Yeah, because technically, technically, cash on a balance sheet is is piece of equity. So you can you can either do retained earnings on a balance sheet and keep the money inside the company, or you're going to use that and deploy that capital to probably grow more, in terms of marketing or hiring or equipment, etc. So, so read the question again. Sorry. Got it. Zero. So, what I would do, what we personally did when you're trying to maximize growth, is I'm simply looking at my personal finances and how little can I take out of the business. Every single other dollar of profit is going to stay in the company and be used towards buying more trucks, marketing, hiring, and that's just a personal preference. And that was because my goal was to grow really fast. I think if you're going to be more conserved with your growth pattern, it's like, how fast do I need to grow? What, when do I need to buy trucks? Because you can just simply, like the capacity thing we used this morning, if your goal is 100000 a month, okay, great. You're going to need six trucks and you're going to need five, seven, uh, eight, nine employees you're in, in order to get to that goal. So you can just run the math on that. And then it's just a matter of how fast you want to get there and are you willing to sacrifice the profits outside your pocket and into the business. So, and, and honestly, that comes down to the tax thing too. That's why you hire people like her. Donna. Yeah. Uh, so my question is sort of two parts. Um, so it would be right to say that you basically reversed the engineering where you wanted to, where you saw yourself and do it backwards from that. Yeah, like um, I think everyone should do that. They shouldn't listen to someone like me, like, oh, I should grow my business. I think it's a stupid thing to do. And I, I'm afraid of that, honestly, like sharing my stuff publicly online and stuff. Everyone's like, oh, I got to grow a million dollar business. When I honestly believe that probably less than 20% of business owners should do that because it's just, like we talked about this morning, a different level of stress that they should not be tampering with. Um, so for me personally, yeah, I work backwards, right? Like how big of a business am I going to build? How many trucks do I need to have? How many employees does that mean I need to have? And then how much can I afford every year to put towards that? So that's where you can just, you, it, it's like even the battery versus fuel equation. I'm the worst person in the world to ask it because I, I literally will say like flip a coin because it doesn't matter. It's, it's the numbers. Ultimately, the customer needs their grass cut. Right, and um, most customers aren't willing to pay a whole lot more for the little things that we think are a big deal. Um, they just want their grass cut. They want it done right. They want a high level of professionalism, and I can deliver that product. So it's just, I'm much more numbers driven. I'm super unemotional about what type of equipment we use. I have no idea what type of equipment we use at like our shops. I tell our guys like just find a good dealer that's going to service you well, uh, especially if you're stupid like me and can't don't even know what a carburetor is. Like then you need to have someone smarter than you. So. Right, mate. I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> so. Neither do I. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry, the second part of my question, um, I, I just, um, with the population in the US, uh, obviously it's a lot bigger, so you have a lot more employees to, to be and choose from. How do you see that as the difference between Australia, where we don't, and you'll find that it's difficult to put on new employees on the road here, and we are wanting enough business to go to? Yeah, questions about U.S. versus Australia's market. So, first and foremost, we have 600,000 landscapers in the United States. So, per capita, we actually have a less concentration than you all. So, if you think, oh, it's, it's you know, you have more employees and laborers over there, we have a higher concentration of landscapers than compared to here, mostly due to the Hispanic population and the Mexicans that do this for cheap all over the place. So, um, so I wouldn't look at that. competition again is something I do not look at. If, if you're in a market where there's lots of competition, I feel like you're right. It's the best place to be because it means that there's a market for it. And then you just got to figure out differentiation. How do you make yourself different than the other 500 guys in your local market? Uh, in terms of employees, we, our, our average cost of living is lower. 
So there's a slight advantage there, but it's the same thing as here. It's the exact same stuff. Like no one wants to work outside. Young people aren't interested in the trades. Uh, everyone's being pushed towards uh, college and tech and things like that. And so it's a matter of a making it a place where when someone starts, they see a very clear path to grow inside your company. If you're just offering a frontline position, not super attractive if someone's comparing it against Apple or Google, right? But if I can say, hey, look, you're going to start at 15, 20, 25 dollars an hour. Okay, great. Here's the steps. We're going to give you like the three years path. You're going to become a manager, an estimator. You can start your own business. And outside of that, go get something else. Go get another job. Um, and so we really push that hard because we, we, don't, we aren't buying this notion like we're going to keep people for 10 years. It's just not realistic in this industry. How do you guys go about like uh, making sure that you've trained people adequately and covered yourself from a, a legal standpoint in terms of putting people on as employees? I know Jim talked. She might be the out, best for that one. I mean, yeah, Jim talked at the start about um, having a, a registered training office here and running programs and stuff like that. But until that sort of uh, an option for us, how would you guys go about doing that? Questions about training people. I'll, I'll take that. It, it, so if you don't feel confident that you can um, uh, itemize a, work, a, 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 a no, no, the word, word I'm looking for is uh, like a description or training for a specific each task is what I was thinking of. If you don't feel confident you can break that down and then um, mitigate the, the risks involved in that, there are companies out there that will basically um, create a, um, a document for every single task that you have within your business and um, to the point where, yeah, they'll do all your contracts and the documents that you would then take your new employees through to make sure that they understand it, they sign off that they understand that task and which will then cover you. So there is a lot of employment um, companies out there like HR companies that will help you do that. You gotta um, pay for it. I might just add to that a little bit about what I did. Um, so um, I was from McDonald's before I um, before I came here. And at McDonald's we had a uh, performance reviews yearly, but we also had this thing called TMS catch ups, which we did every three months um, to make sure that the performance level of our employees is where it needs to be, and and they're uh, getting trained to the certain standard. Um, and then you know you'd come back three months later and you'd do the review and you'd say, hey, are you at this point yet? This is where we said you would be at. Um, and so in my business, I, I put that in uh, in place. And so we I do TMS catch-ups in my business as well as performance reviews. And so what I'll do is I'll say, all right, right now you're at this point. In three months, you should be an expert to be able to mow a lawn. And then what I'll do is I'll make sure, I'll go actually go out with them and make sure that they can mow a lawn efficiently um, to an expert level uh, and do it obviously safely. Safely, Obviously, I provide all the PPE, uniforms, all the rest of it. Um, and then I'll do that as they progress through the ranks. So. I do, yeah, th every three months uh, I do a catch up with them. And do you document all that? Yeah, it's all written, yeah, and it goes into their file, so I've got a file in the, in the office. Um, yeah. So every, every team has catch up and performance review is, uh, we have exactly a description of what we've talked about and what we've, uh, what we've evalu evaluated them on. Yeah, I saw you mentioned, Dan, you used metrics for KPIs for your people. Can you tell us a bit more about those? Yeah, okay. Um, so, um, so uh, the the question there is, uh, uh, can you tell me a bit a bit more about the metrics of or KPIs and how I um, how I evaluate with KPIs? So again, this is something that I, I brought from McDonald's. Um, so we had something called sales per crew hour. Um, so at McDonald's, uh, sales per crew hour, we wanted to run at 120 sales per per person on the floor. Um, and so it's exactly the same thing. Um, the whole reason this $2 minute thing came about was because I wanted to achieve $120 uh, an hour. Per, per employee the same way that McDonald's did. Um, so I would um, quote for that about for how I could do the job and then see if my staff could do it. And then I got to the point where I was quicker than that and I was able to do regular jobs at $2.50 a minute 
and then my staff should get to the point where they can at least do it at $2 a minute. So that was one of the KPIs that I had there. Another one is I had, uh, you know, when, uh, at, at McDonald's they have reaction times. So you've got to put the bun in the toaster in a certain amount of time. You've got to have, uh, you get the bun out of the trolley and put it into the toaster within five seconds. So what I did is I went, all right, well, you've got to get out of the car and grab the brush cutter from the back of the car within five seconds. So you'd pull up, park, brake, uh, park on, handbrake, keys out, jump out, try and grab the brush cutter. And so you try and do it within five seconds so you're not sitting in the car and the whole point was to alleviate uh people looking at their social media while they're still in the car or still playing their pokemon mm -hmm. so um yeah th those were a few things that i did yeah course makeup is for the RTO for that dog for dog grooming and things exactly. But if there's a course they can tailor from they can actually get registered and buy the shirt and whatever they do, they will do it. That's the plan. Okay. Yeah. Training. Uh, if I could just add about the KPIs real quick for everyone just to have an actual number, like a, a, a quick one. I know we talked about the budget hours versus clocked hours before, but an easier number for everyone, so in case you don't use budget hours, would just be total revenue per, for that employee divided by their clocked hours for that day. That's going to give you an effective hourly rate. And if you track that over time, you'll get the average for your for a, a team member and see who's highest and lowest performing. That's just like the easiest track of, because it includes drive time, includes unload time. It doesn't just include the dollar per minute on the job site. So I've got a question from online. Brad, do you have any advice or information for someone looking into sponsorships, additional costs, and employment responsibilities? Uh, so does it mean sponsorship for overseas employees? I would say that. Yeah, uh, no, not they have changed that. It's a it's a quite a timely process to get through. I've got one client currently going through that and has been doing it so far all this year, and has outlaid probably close to fifteen thousand dollars and still doesn't have that employee here. So it is a very expensive way of doing it, um, and I feel like there's probably better ways in order to get a an employee. Cheap, much cheaper options out there still. Like yourself, John, you went to eight employees, or what was your max? Stan would have been similar, eight. Yeah. You know, why, what stopped you from going further, let's say the 20 or the 15? I've never heard of a mowing franchise that you had, let's say 12 or more. Was it just you didn't want the headaches, or why didn't you go? Okay, we, did, we did go a little bit higher late last year, but we found that the clients that we were attracting probably weren't fitting our brief. They were a bit low and we needed a bit more dollars, so we had to split those customers off and we dropped it back down a bit. We just, yeah, we couldn't find enough commercial or the, the more profitable type job or the bigger job moving to too many houses wasn't for us. So we, had to, we found that we just scaled the business back a bit. That's not to say that now We've developed some other stuff that we may actually increase it a bit again. But I do have a franchise region to look after now, so I might go and grow my business too much more. Yeah. It's only so much I can do. Um, well for me on that, um, so what was stopping me or what was slowing me down? down? Nothing. Nothing. I could have kept going. Uh, well and truly could have kept going with the system that I had where I'd bring on 80 new regular customers. Um, and put another employee on to, to look after those customers. So um, I, I, I decided to stop myself. Um, I was getting to the point where we were um, doing, you know, $24,000 weeks uh, towards the end. Um, I decided to stop myself because I could see that my two daughters had more, uh, had more of a connection with my wife than what they did me. And I wanted to be able to spend more time with my two girls. So, you know, uh, once they grow up, who knows, I might go do it again and, and go even bigger. But there was nothing at all I could have kept going.
and, and like when we when we look at a lot of companies when they grow really quickly, set six to eight thousand, six to eight hundred thousand. I don't know where you guys are in terms of revenue, but like that's a very natural stop, stopping point for growth a lot of times, and a good place to stop because when you start getting above eight ten employees, like if you just look at like the military, etc., they won't have more than eight to ten people reporting to one person. And so when you get that many employees reporting to one person, you you almost or need and start needing an, uh, another admin or non-revenue producing employee to be in the business if you're going to scale past that. So we like encourage our franchisees if you're going to go above 800,000, you almost have to go to like 1.5 to make it worth it. Because if I'm going to go hire someone for let's say $100,000 a year on salary um, because they're a general manager, high level type position. Well, if I'm running a 20% margin business, I need to produce 500,000 in revenue just to cover their wages. So if I'm going to go go up to 800,000 in revenue, managing up myself, but if I'm going to go get beyond that. Typically I need another person and they're going to be a high level general manager. I'm going to pay them hundred grand. Great. You're going to have to grow to 1.3 before you make a single extra dollar in profit. And so um, that's that's something that we see as a natural stopping point for us for one person to be able to manage. Well, so the other question I have is about uh, you said you know our service codes, Mike had a look. Couldn't believe how service codes we so do you think a franchise agent could scale quicker if they just let's say cut back to three or four service codes only? You know, if someone says, Oh, can you do this? They say, No, we can't do it. Or, that's, is that sort of a barrier to scale you see just having all that mess services? Like yeah, like, that. so if you want to scale fast, adding services is the way to do it, right? The more service you offer, the more revenue you can do. And especially in gyms because you all don't do as much of your own marketing. If, I, if you were saying, hey, you're driving all of your marketing and then I would say just focus on one service because all your marketing dollars can go towards that one thing and you can specialize in it. Um, but I would say if you're trying to grow, probably take everything you can get at gyms, but just realize that that's a, an unprofitable way to do it, right? If you're doing everything from pa paver patios to artificial turf to installing new sod and soil, uh, and then you're going to expect the guy to mow a lawn, like it's extremely difficult to find that labor, train that labor, and then make it efficient and not expect the complaints to be rolling in um, at a very high level. If you're doing like when I talk about a lot of stuff I'm talking about, I'm talking about like we try to make two or three new locations that I own and never show up at, I, like it has to run on systems and simplicity, right? So when I talk about that, it's not necessarily what you have to do if you're an independent owner operator there all the time to manage. You talk about taking services out. It's, it's defining what your business is. So if you're doing artificial turf or landscaping or turf laying or things like that, we can't do that. We're a maintenance driven business. So that's what our business is, maintenance. Landscaping, someone else does it because we just can't squeeze in enough time, <coughs> pardon me, to service the customer to that maintenance need. So we have to, we just don't take the work. And another thing, if I could re really quickly add, sorry, I know that the whiteboard has been overused today, but um, one thing that is no, sometimes. Never overused, mate. <laughs> one thing that's important, especially with mowing, but almost all our home improvement industries, is like you kind of have a spring rush. And then things kind of slow down. Like this is kind of like the natural demand curve of what we ha we go through. So this might be like three months out of the year that are really busy. I think for you it's like September, October, November. Is that like your crazy time? Uh, yeah. Spring rush kind of thing. So what we do sp specifically um, is we will only accept mowing customers and recurring maintenance during about this window of time. But then if someone asks for a project-based job, we will say yes. We are booked out five months, and we will book them out during this time of the year. So that's an opportunity as well. Um, just to balance out somewhat more your demand so there's not as much of a crazy spring rush. Sorry. Yeah, a franchise is always called uh, banking the jobs. Yep. Yes, we're in a squirrel. But you've got to be careful if you're banking a job on a brand new customer that you've just quoted because mostly they'll go to someone else. It's got to be your regular customers. You're banking those jobs. So it, look, for us, we, I start thinking about winter. <coughs> Pardon me. <coughs> um, I've been talking all day. I'm starting to lose my voice. Um, we, we start banking jobs, start thinking about winter and how we're going to plan winter in March. So for winter for us, it's, for, it's always been our busiest time. We get massive growth in winter and we're really steady and we're full. And come towards the end of winter, I start to panic that we're not going to get through it. And then I dislike spring because it's just crazy busy 
and you can't control it as much and you're really running around a bit like a headless took sometimes trying to stay on top of everything whereas winter you start planning squirrel i call it squirreling away because that's what the person who taught me about this yeah and winter and we're up 30 percent on last winter this year and it's good gardening profitable work in the business um, I, I don't bank jobs at all. I just thought I'd put that out there. Never once have I ever thought about doing that. I d always do the job straight away as soon as I possibly can. And if I need more work through throughout winter, I will mark it like crazy. I won't stop. So I, I will never bank a job. Yeah, I've lost a few jobs because I banked them. I just paid it off. They weren't regulars. They were after a gardener and they were happy to bank the job, but then they stopped responding, etc. and I lost quote jobs that I could have done because my franchise law had suggested to bank them and just concentrate on the mowing right now. Um, and yeah, so I lost those ones. And so then in hindsight, some of those ones where they're not regular, I'm not seeing them every month in those touch points. I've just gone, you know what, I've got opportunity to do you on the weekend, I'll get that done. And then build and build and build on that customer and condition them that hey, I do have time for you, but it will be at the end of the week or it'll be in next month's calendar, et cetera. But you don't know unless you're really getting that feel point from that customer. You can't do it with new customers. Yeah. <clears throat> it's got to be regulars. But let's say you've had regulars going on for three or four years. Yeah. You're nearly doing winter pruning without them even... They're not even asking. It's because they're so used to you doing it in the winter. Yeah. So, and they come spring... So I never understand why we get this influx in spring. Everyone on the first sunny day starts wanting to get all the garden, they go to Bunnings, they go everywhere. Wouldn't you want to do it in the middle of winter and the first 20 degree day, you're sitting on your deck at about half past three, over in a nice cold, putting a barbie on on a Saturday and enjoying yourself yeah. instead of in the rat race of the world. So, but once you get that customer up and running, it's hard to, you can't bank the new ones, but you just program. It's more not banking, it's programming when the work's being done. So you get this nice smooth amount. Yeah. yeah. I, I did a, a, instead of Christmas and July special, I did a spring and July special for some of my customers and said like 40% off green waste, I don't know what my green waste price is. And so it was already high anyway. And I've got all these jobs, they're like, oh yeah, that's a great idea. Get my spring stuff done now. And I know it's going to go one foot on their preposterous in spring at any rate, so at least I'm getting in early and then I can come back to them with, oh, let's make that nice enough in spring as well. So just getting that extra work out of it. Yeah, if you come to banking jobs too, we will not put a job on the schedule if they don't pay for it. So if they're going to book out four months from now, we'll say, great, we'll put you on the schedule as soon as you pay for it. So even if it's a $10,000 project, we'll yep. make that happen. Full payment. Yep. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. My question on that. Question on mine is, what made you go down the employment path as opposed to splits, and have you done splits? Uh, so for me, um, splits are usually, if you're splitting with territory, you usually split for eight times cut value. Um, well, that's on average, I believe. Um, I would rather go do that property eight times and keep that customer and continue to do them. So that's why I won't do splits. My honest answer, my first employee fell on my lap. A guy with 30 years experience left his job, who was my best mate, and I thought, hello, why would I not do this? This guy's, I don't know nothing, and I've gone, we haven't got enough work, but who cares? This opportunity is never going to arise. And that's how the business just evolved, which is a sheer accident. Yep. Just in the right place at the right time. What motivates you, mate? Because you're 26 years old, you've got 100 franchises already. Obviously, once you retire, you probably could, so I'm going to get out. So, what motivates you, and where are you? What's your vision for yourself and your business in, let's say, 15, let's say, 20 years? What do you hope to be doing with your brand? Do you know what you're going to be doing in 15 or 20 years? <laughs> 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 um, yeah, so, like, our. our, our my ultimate goal for Augusta is we do want to go public eventually. So um, we have a bunch of software, web design, um, tech that we're working on, and then along with the franchising, we would, in 20 years, like 2040, we want to go public. Um, but 
you know, in terms of motivation, like I think it's, there's no right or wrong way to grow your business. I think it's a matter of like work your way backwards. It's so important. Like you cannot come to an event like this and be like, I'm going to build a million dollar business. No, like, do you want a million dollar business? Is it going to serve you well? Is it going to be good for your family? Like that's really important. Like I don't have a girlfriend. I don't do anything on the weekend. I don't spend time with family. I don't do any of that stuff. I work out and I work. That's it. And so if that's not going to serve you well, then you shouldn't do it. And so, um, you know, it's, it's just a matter of, I'm, I'm a big fan of being out of balance. So, um, like if you want to make progress, like if you're trying to run, you're constantly out of balance in order to run. In order to make progress, I feel like you have to have some sort of out of balance. And so some of you might be judged for that, especially at the beginning couple of years of your business. And it's, it's normal because you're trying to grow a business. Like that's not a normal, doesn't fall in your lap. You have to get out of balance for a couple of years to grow a business. And then, you know, in five, 10 years, you might talk to me and I have a family and I'm like, forget work. I'll work 10 hours a week and just spend time with my family and I'll be completely out of balance that direction. Right? So I'm a big believer. If I, if you want to make quick, fast action uh, and progress, you got to get out of balance. And so, um, that's you know, the story of my you life. You have to <clears throat> gotta come out of your comfort zone. It's going to be hard work. You're going to push, you're going to work. Why is it? <clears throat> why is it when people work really hard, people go, you work too hard. If I went down to the, you played golf and he played every day and he got down to scratch, did anyone ever say to you, what are you, stop playing golf, mate, you're going to kill yourself? Unfortunately, so yeah, no some, people, some people did. <laughs> but when you go to work Obviously, and you yeah. push yourself hard, yeah, yeah. they go, you're working too hard. Right. Hang on. Do I have, so if I'm going to the golf course every day, what, that's not work? Right. Or that's not pushing myself to the limit? So we have this, society has this funny way of thinking about what work is. And you talk about what motivates you, success. But what is success? It's not necessarily monetary value, it's building something that you're really proud of. The money's just, that's just something that's the end goal. It's, I, don't, you don't, I don't really think about it. It's, I'm building something that's successful that can carry on for another generation maybe, that my son can take over, he's 23 years of age. So that will be for me success. Okay, so yeah, but don't be afraid. People will, you're going to have to throw yourself out of balance. Huge amounts if you're going to employ people because you're going to have to go and do quotes and all sorts of things outside of hours and work like a lunatic. And people will say to you, you work too hard. And I don't get that because if you are endeavouring in your sport or whatever, they never question that. It's a strange philosophy society. Well, I, I was talking with the media team because they're like the highlight of the show today. And I was talking to um, Greg specifically because he wants to start, you don't mind me saying this, do you? He wants to start his own franchise, and so and, and what he said was like super key, I think. And he said that the reason he what he finds is that he loves video and editing and all the rest of it because he does it as a job. He doesn't no longer enjoy it when he goes home and does it himself. The thing that he used to be passionate about has become a job, and so I think is which is which, which, what's really important is the fact that anything you love right now, you like, you wish you could do all day long, and you would, if you did it all day long, it would become a job. It'd become work. Right, and so I think if you can find a business that you're so passionate about, you want to do it every single day and it doesn't seem like work, you won the game. That is success, right? In my mind, success is contentment. And so if you're content, that's not complacency, but if you're content, you've won the game. I don't care if your business is 100,000, 10,000, 10, uh, know, a million, 10 million, doesn't matter. If you can be content with what you have, you won the game. You're beating 90% of people out there that just, just aren't content. That's it. If you're happy, who cares? That's it. It really is. I really don't think we put enough emphasis on that as human beings. If we're happy, it doesn't matter whether we're driving a Lamborghini or a Hyundai. If we're happy, we're really, we're going places. I would just like to add, not every day I'm motivated. I, uh, like, a lot of times I go into, like, Damn, this. What are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> now, a lot of days I just wake up and I go, oh, God, here we go. Let's get it done. But uh, no, I, uh, I think that I have, uh, I've got myself in a rhythm. I've got a consistent rhythm that I do every day and that's what I do all day, every day. And I, I don't want to put myself out of whack with that. It feels weird if I put myself out of whack with that. So not every day am I going, I'm super motivated to do this. Like some days I'm like, screw this man, like, come on. I just want to go and have a few beers with the boys. Um, but uh, no, I, I think that I, my consistency from my rhythm of doing it every day is what keeps me going nonstop to see, you know, 
but obviously I do have I do have motivations that you know, are the reason why I do it. But not every day am I chirping. I'm like, God, yeah, you know, I can't wait for this. So I just wanted to put that out there. Jesus, Mike, me, he needs to stop drinking Red Bulls. He's up and about every day. <laughs> <laughs> Question online: Up Brad is gone. What was your biggest hurdle with the initial hire of your first employee? Is there anything you wish you had done differently? The very first hire. No, um, um, no, not really, because mine was perfect. It helped me to develop my skills. Um, well, I uh, I hired my younger brother. Um, <laughs> who doesn't talk to you anymore? Yeah, who I don't, who I don't talk to anymore. <laughs> so uh, I, I should have probably hired the other brother. <laughs> <laughs> I was joking around. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't, I don't talk to him all that. It wasn't because of business, though. But no, I, uh, yeah, no, that, was, that was probably a bit of regret there. My first employee actually like is a, actually a bit of an interesting story. So it was a friend of mine, crazy hard worker. He had moved from Idaho, which is like next state over from Washington, right? And out from the bush, he was just like a crazy hard worker. Came to work with me, um, and I offered him at the time seventeen dollars an hour was a lot in our market, right? We're talking years ago, right? Seventeen dollars an hour was a lot. Well. We start growing the first couple of years. We're starting to grow pretty quick. We have maybe three, four, five employees in that second year. And he wants to leave. And at the time, I was in that financial stress part, right? You don't have a lot of money. You're putting every single dollar back into the business. And so he's leaving, and I offered him $25 an hour. And I, I honestly don't even know how I could have afforded it. It was stupid money at the time. But I, I knew I needed him, and he was an incredible employee. Just like, could outwork two of me, no problem. And what was so interesting, the psychology of how an, how an employee thinks is he actually took that as an insult because he's like, you're going to pay me more now. Well, what about the past year and a half that I've been pay paid 17? So is it only because I'm leaving that you're going to offer me more money? I didn't even think about that. And so from then on, that's when like P4P became so important to me because I'm like, he deserved more money. He worked his brains out, but I didn't have a system in place to compensate someone who did, did that compared to the guy who worked right next to him and made two dollars less an hour like he produced twice as much he deserved the money and so from that moment was when i was like if i can just figure out something around performance pay instead of dollars per hour which is so messed up like how is it how is it even fair that someone who works their brains out makes two or three dollars more per hour than the guy that just kicks along for the ride with their phone all day long like that's not fair like, and then we wonder why employees get unhappy or disillusioned or go into their job like yeah i was a I didn't have a system in place. Shame on me. So. Yeah. So thank you, everyone, for your attention today. This replay will will hopefully get it ready by next week, and we'll email it to everyone as well. Um, if you're wondering about Donna's slides especially, please email national at gyms.net. But we'll make sure that we can get those slides and whatever's been presented up here to you as well. Thank you so much for your attention today for the first one of these. Hopefully we can do it again next year and actually have one of you guys or a couple of you guys up here talking as well. Big thanks again to all of our panel, especially Mike as well, who is our um, international guest as well. So thank you very much, guys. <laughs>